We are live momentarily. Sound check two. Sound check two. Planning committee. Sound check two.
Thank you. Thank you. The time is 9.30. It is February 14th, 2023. This is the planning committee. Um, and we are live, so I am calling this meeting of the planning committee to order. Members of the public are advised that our meetings are webcast live by the city of Hamilton. Need my highlighter. And archived on the city's website, and that the presentations, reports considered at this meeting are available on the city's website, and that members of the public can contact the clerk's office to acquire documents in an alternate format. A reminder that all electronic devices are to be switched to a non-audible function during committee meetings. Members of the committee are reminded of the five minute time limit, which will be adhered to during this meeting. Members can submit another request to speak if they require more time to ask questions or make comments. Members of the public have five minutes to address the committee. Also, members of staff who are speaking at today's meeting are asked to state their name and title before speaking for the first time. Today, the planning committee is me being run as a hybrid meeting. Councillors who are attending in person and councillors attending virtually all need to sign into eScribe for access to the agenda for votes to get on the speakers list. So in uh, chambers today, we have Councillor Beattie, Councillor Kassar, Councillor Huang, Councillor Kretsch, Councillor Spatafora, Councillor Tattison, myself, and online, we have joining us virtually, Councillor McMeekin, Councillor Pauls, Councillor Wilson, A. Wilson, and Councillor Francis. Madam Clerk, are there any changes to the agenda today? Yes, Chair Danko, there are changes under discussion items 11.1, .1, Municipal Housing Pledge. We have added written submission from Lou Periano with the Realtors Association of Hamilton Burlington. And under general information, other business, added item, added item 14.1, .1, outstanding business list. There's items requiring new due dates and items to be removed. Thank you. Mover and a seconder to approve the agenda as amended. Moved by Councillor Spadafora, seconded by Councillor Tattison. All in favor or opposed? Just waiting for uh, East Grab to do its yeah, my is just like do its thing. <laughs> Just go ahead and tabulate the vote. That would be great. I now see that the voting is in progress, but that is all I see on my screen. Uh, so, so I'm just going to cancel the vote and restart it. Okay. Getting off to a quick start here at Planning Committee. Uh, <laughs> good, good thing it's a short agenda. You could just revote on accepting the agenda. I see approval from Ted. I'm seeing the same thing that has been on the vote index, and we'll turn it off. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm Councillor Pauls, are you able to re-vote? And Ted was affirmative. Right. Sorry, Councillor McMeekin was affirmative. That is unanimous. Go figure. Thank you. 
At this time, we have exciting news. General Manager Jason Thorne would like to introduce a new staff member. Yes, uh, through the chair. Thank you, Jason Thorne, General Manager of Planning and Economic Development, and actually a couple of new staff members. Uh, I'm going to start by asking Ken Coit, who's the Director of Heritage and Urban Design, to introduce a couple of his new staff. Good morning. Thank you, Jason. Through the chair, uh, I have the honor of inviting to, uh, uh, introducing you to two new staff in the planning division. Firstly, Yana Kelman, uh, an architect, uh, urban designer, and planner sitting right here behind me. She will be uh, leading our new site plan team. Um, so I, I'm sure she looks forward to work with, working with you on various files over the coming years. Um, and secondly, Michael Vertuba, our new um, Senior Project Manager for Heritage and Urban Design. He will be leading our urban designers and natural heritage team, as well as taking on some of our more complicated site plan applications. So I'm looking very much forward to working with them as we build out the new Heritage and Urban Design team over the next couple of months. Thank you. And thanks, Ken. And then uh, Binu Kora, who's our Director of Development Engineering in the Growth Management Division, also has a couple of staff to introduce. Uh, thank you, Jason. Uh, good morning, uh, Mr. Chair and the committee members. Um, I'm very uh, happy to actually introduce two of my staff. Uh, they joined uh, us actually from January uh, 2023. Uh, Mr. Alex Lee, uh, he's actually handling the west side of, of the um, city of Hamilton. And also Munir Munir Saman, uh, manager of development engineering for the west side. We are very happy to uh, be with, uh, with us. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, and uh, just on behalf of all of Planning Committee, I know we're very excited to have you all. Uh, welcome to the city of Hamilton. Uh, it's been an ongoing discussion about uh, how short-staffed our, our, our planning department has been, so we're, we're very uh, happy to have you here and looking forward to working with, uh, with each of you. Okay, on the agenda we have Oh, by the way, you don't have to stay for the whole meeting. It specifically says in my notes, doing so now so they don't have to wait around for the whole meeting. <laughs> uh, may, are there any declarations of interest this morning? Councillor Pauls? This morning at 10.30, there's another meeting with the BIA, and I'm on the board of that, and uh, so I'll, they need quorum, so I'll be leaving shortly uh, around 10.30. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Councillor. No other declarations of interest. Um, so we are approving the minutes of the previous meeting from January 31st, 2023. Mover and a seconder, moved by Councillor Beattie, second by Councillor Wang. That's approved, unanimous, thank you. Item six, delegation requests. We have one delegation, delegation request from Mike Burnett uh, respecting landlord registry. This is for the March 21st meeting, so it's not for today. Uh, I need a mover and a seconder to approve the delegation request. Moved by Councillor Wang, seconded by Councillor Francis. That's okay. That's unanimous, thank you. Item, there's no staff presentations, no delegations, so we are on to item nine, consent items. 9.1 is the active official plan amendment zoning bylaw uh, and plan of subdivisions. 
Uh, I need a mover and a seconder to receive the report, and then I'll open up the floor for any discussion. Moved by Councillor Spadafora, seconded by Councillor Wang. Is there any discussion on 9.1? Seeing none, all in favor or opposed to receive. Yeah. We'll be done by 1030. The e scribe says no. <laughs> That's unanimous, thank you. Moving on to item 10, public, del uh, sorry, public hearings. The public has been advised how to pre-register to be a delegate at the public meetings on today's agenda. Members of the public, in accordance with the provisions of the Planning Act, please be advised that if a person or public body does not make oral submissions at a public meeting or make written submissions to the Council of the City of Hamilton before Council makes de a decision regarding development applications before us today, the person or public body is not entitled to appeal the decision of the Council of the City of Hamilton to the Ontario Land Tribunal, and the person or public body may not be added as a party to the hearing of an appeal before the Ontario Land Tribunal unless in the opinion of the tribunal there are reasonable grounds to do so. So first we have item 10.1, application for zoning bylaw amendment for lands located at 343 Springbrook Avenue in Ancaster in Ward 12. Uh, we do have a staff presentation. Would committee like to see the staff presentation? I'm seeing yes from Councillor Kassar. Uh, so we have um, Devin Morton. Devin's just making his way down to the podium in chambers. Oh, uh, yeah. Okay. okay, good morning everyone. Uh, good morning members of committee, staff and public in attendance. My name is Devin Morton. I am a planner for the development planning branch on the rural team. Uh, today I'm here to discuss the application for zoning bylaw amendment for lands located at 343 Springbrook Avenue. So the subject lands are currently zoned Agricultural A uh, in the Ancaster Zoning Bylaw number 8757. The applicant is requesting to rezone the property to a modified low density R1 836 zone in the City of Hamilton Zoning Bylaw 05200 to facilitate two new residential lots for single detached dwellings and the retention of an existing single detached dwelling. Staff are recommending one modification to prohibit street townhouse dwellings as a permitted use as to ensure conformity with the applicable secondary plan. So the subject lands are a half acre lot <clears throat> located at the southwest corner of Springbrook Avenue and Regan Drive in Ancaster. The aerial photo illustrates the site and adjacent land uses including single detached dwellings that surround the subject lands. As you can see in the concept plan, the proposal contemplates the creation of two new lots for single detached dwellings. A consent to sever application will be required to create the new lots fronting onto Chambers Drive. And this set of slides showcases uh, photos of the subject lands. So first a photo of the subject lands as they exist today. Next we have the existing single detached dwelling that will be retained through the proposal. and a view from the subject lands looking north, a view from the subject lands looking east, a view from the subject lands looking west, 
And finally, some photos of the surrounding neighborhood, including Fair Park, Meadowlands Park, and Holy Name of Mary Elementary School. So to conclude, the city received no correspondence expressing concern with the proposal. The proposed zoning bylaw amendment can be supported as it is consistent with the PPS, conforms to a place to grow, complies with the Urban Hamilton official plan and the Meadowlands secondary plan, and is compatible with and complementary to the existing surrounding neighborhood. This concludes my presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Devin. Are there any questions uh, from committee? Not. Councillor Kassar? Thanks, Chair Danko. Uh, thank you for the presentation. And through the chair, uh, I, I know the neighborhood well. I'm familiar with the application. Don't have any concerns. My one question would be just could you uh, outline the next steps on the application? Because I think this is just one of other steps that will be coming forth. Thank you. That's correct, through you, Chair. Uh, so next steps, if this application is approved, the applicant enters into an appeal period. If no appeals are received, then the applicant would proceed to committee of adjustment with submission of a consent to sever application. Okay, that's all. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. Seeing no further discussion, mover and a seconder to receive the staff presentation, moved by Councillor Kassar, seconded by Councillor Wang. All in favor or opposed? Sorry, I noted to the absent uh, councillors as abstain, so the vote is actually a nine to zero. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Devin. Thanks. We have Diana Morris with T. Johns Consulting. Diana. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, committee, staff, and the public. My name is Diana Morris, Senior Planner at T. Johns Consulting Group, agent on behalf of the owner for lands located at 343 Springbrook Avenue. I also believe that the owner, Mr. Chimino, is in council chambers this morning as well. I have reviewed the staff report and recommendation and are in agreement, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, Diana. Are there any questions from committee? Seeing none, I need a mover and a seconder to receive the delegation from the agent, moved by Councillor Kassar, seconded by Councillor Spatafora. I'm in favor. I, I'm not sure, I, excuse me, I, it doesn't say my name on it. Like. I'm here, but it, it doesn't show. Oh, there it is. Thank you. I vote it. You're here and not a cat. <laughs> <laughs> Councillor McMeekin. So I, I, I don't see all the, the screen if Councillor McMeekin is indicating. Yeah, I'm in favor. Thank you. That's unanimous, thank you. Are there any members of the public here today that wish to speak um, on this application? Asking once, this is for 343 Springbrook Avenue in Ancaster. Are there any members of the public in chambers today that wish to speak on this matter? 
asking twice and one and final time, are there any members of the public that wish to speak to 343 Springbrook Avenue? Seeing none. So there are no members to, uh, to speak on this. So I need a mover and a seconder to close the public meeting. Moved by Councillor Kassar, seconded by Councillor Beatty. All in favor or opposed? Councillor McBeacon is affirmative, thank you. And I, I think this is gonna be the theme of the day, folks, so we'll just have to uh, take it easy and wait for eScribe to do its computing. Sorry, It's Councillor Kassar and Councillor Beatty. We're just waiting for it. I see your thumbs. The vote should be up now. Councillor Pauls, are you a thumbs up? Thank you, that's unanimous. Um, and then finally, I need a mover and a seconder to approve the report recommendations. Moved by Councillor Kassar, seconded by Councillor Beatty. Is there any discussion on approval? Not seeing anybody in the queue, so all in favor or opposed? We are just waiting for it to process. So, like I said, just bear with us this morning. This is gonna be the theme throughout the day. I blame the spy balloons. Sorry, we're just uh, still trying to sort out the technical issues with the voting. spy balloons. They're aliens from another planet. Well, that's the excuse they've been using since the 60s. <laughs> it's a weather balloon.
This is the final approval of 10.1. So we're, we're having problems getting the vote to tally in eScribe. So we may go to... Uh, Did somebody else pick up the phone? Yeah, so, okay. So it's, it's <laughs> Don't pick up the phone! <laughs> okay. I, I know. I'm going to do this. Yeah, that was, that was the student house with like eight people. Okay. Nobody can pick up the phone for the next 45 minutes. I've loaded. Councillor Francis, are you a thumbs up? Thank you. Uh, Councillor Pauls, I do not see you. If you could indicate verbally. Okay. You, you. okay. Councillor Danko, thumbs yes, up. Yes, I approve. Councillor Tadison, thumbs up. Thank Again. you. And McMeekin. Okay. Vote carries 11 to 0. Oh, go figure. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Moving on. 10.2 Application for Zoning Bylaw Amendment for lands located at 306 Parkside Drive in Flamborough, Ward 15. Does the committee wish to see the staff presentation? Yes. I'm seeing yes from the ward councillor. So again, we have Devin Martin. disappears. Oh, and then share via, right. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, good morning again, everyone. <coughs> I can see that, okay, great. So good morning, members of committee, staff, and public in attendance. Again, my name is Devin Morton. I am a planner for the Development Branch Rural Team. Uh, today, I'm here to discuss the application for zoning bylaw amendment for lands located at 306 Parkside Drive in Waterdown. So the subject lands are currently zoned Community Institutional I-2757, pursuant to the City of Hamilton zoning bylaw number 05200. The applicant is requesting to rezone the property to a modified institutional I-2825 zone in the City of Hamilton zoning bylaw number 05200 to permit development of 44 purpose-built rental dwelling units. The applicant is seeking modifications to allow multiple dwellings as a permitted use, deem Parkside Drive the front lot line, permit an increased area for parking between the facade and front lot line, permit 50 parking spaces for the place of worship and day nursery use, and to permit a 2.75 meter and seven meter side yard. 
So it should be noted that at the time of submission, the applicant also submitted for an amendment to the Urban Hamilton official plan. With the recent adoption of the Waterdown Community Node secondary plan by Council, the applicant has since withdrew their request as an amendment is no longer required. In other words, the Waterdown Community Node the secondary plan envisions and permits the proposal. Furthermore, staff note that the proposed development is being funded under the federal government's co-investment fund, which will require 30% of the dwelling units to be affordable as defined by CMHC in addition to increased energy efficiency and accessibility requirements. So the subject property is roughly three acres in size and is located on the south side of Parkside Drive between Mill Street North and Main Street North in Waterdown. The aerial photo illustrates the site and adjacent land uses including single detached dwellings that surround the site and a large water tower located directly behind the subject lands on Kelly Street. Here we have the concept plan. <clears throat> As you can see, 44 purpose-built rental dwelling units are proposed along with the reconfiguration and relocation of the community garden closer to Kelly Street the creation of a green spine that runs through the subject lands from Kelly Street to Parkside Drive and an outdoor play area. Through, rev through review of the applicant's concept plan, six modifications, two of which um, are recommended by staff, have been identified to the community institutional I-2 zone. A table summarizing the proposed modifications is provided in Appendix F to report PED 23032. So this set of slides showcases draft elevations and concept renderings of the proposed purpose-built rental dwelling units. First, we have conceptual elevations of blocks one and two, blocks three and four, and finally, the proposed renderings of the subject lands. So on the next slide here, we have a photo of the subject lands as they exist today. And given the size of the site, I've included some additional photos, including this photo of the existing access and driveway located off of Parkside Drive. And here we have a photo of the pro proposed location for emergency or secondary access. Uh, staff note that the applicant has indicated the installation of permeable pavers in this location. And here we see the Kelly Street access. So this also doubles as the new proposed location for the community garden, thus eliminating vehicular access to Kelly Street. And in this photo, we see existing mature trees that are proposed to be retained and will be further used as a buffer between the existing residential uses and the proposed residential uses. And the existing community garden that will be reconfigured and relocated. Here is a view of the subject lands looking east along Parkside Drive, and a view looking west along Parkside Drive, and north across Parkside Drive. So, in the immediate area, you will find Mary Hopkins Elementary School. and finally Memorial Park. So as part of the planning process, this application was circulated to all property owners within 120 meters of the subject lands. A neighborhood meeting was also held for members of the public to learn more about the proposal and voice their concerns. The city received eight comments regarding the proposal and various petitions expressing concerns related to the proposal. The initial petition noted opposition to the applicant's request for amendment to the UHOP, which as discussed earlier, has since been removed. The other petitions expressed concerns related to eliminating street parking on Kelly Street, which is outside the scope of this application, height and tree removal and retention. So staff note that the Waterdown Community Node Secondary Plan permits a height of three stories, and the applicant, applicant proposes to reestablish the tree canopy through planting of roughly 38 compensation plantings, far more than what the city requires. So in closing, the proposed zoning bylaw amendment can be supported as it is consistent with the PPS, conforms to a place to grow, and complies with the Urban Hamilton official plan and the Waterdown Community Node secondary plan. <clears throat> 
Additionally, the proposal is compatible with and complementary to the existing and planned land uses in the immediate and surrounding area and represents good planning by, among other things, creating a compact and efficient urban form, providing alternative housing typologies and tenure options, making efficient use of existing infrastructure within the urban boundary, managing and preserving built heritage assets, and providing affordable and barrier-free housing options to support the community and surrounding area. This concludes my presentation. I'd be happy to answer any questions there may be. Thank you. Thank you, Devin. Uh, if we could just take down your presentation so I can see everybody. Um, we have one registered delegate, and then I will turn to the gallery for delegations. Right now, we are hearing from questions from committee. Uh, are there any questions from committee? Councillor McMeekin, I believe this is your area. I'll start with you if you have, go ahead. Sorry, Councillor, you're muted. How's that? Yeah. Yes. Um, Thank you. Thanks. That was a, a great presentation, and uh, uh, I'm pleased it was as thorough as it was. Um, just a question. Uh, I think I understand, and I think this is correct. Uh, the relocation of the community garden will preclude uh, egress uh, on, uh, from the uh, uh, proposed site onto Kelly Street. Is that correct? Through your chair, that's correct. Okay, that was one of the major concerns. Um, I think, uh, uh, can you just sit, tell us a little bit more about the, uh, the, the tree, uh, treescape and uh, the plans to uh, uh, both maintain where, where possible and to replant? Sure, so through you, Chair, uh, through the circulation process, members of the public did express concerns with tree removal and retention. Uh, there were some mature trees located towards the rear of the site that were, that were identified for removal. The applicant has since revised their proposal to retain those trees through their landscape plan. Um, and in addition to that, they've, um, they've really demonstrated a commitment to reestablishing the tree canopy through their planting regime. So as I mentioned, in the presentation, they're currently proposing to replant about 38 compensation plantings, which far exceeds uh, what the city requires. I believe currently there are about seven trees that are um, slated for removal. So the current compensation ratio is one for one. So quick math, you can um, deduce that uh, they are providing, you know, uh, a sufficient amount of, of compensation plantings. Okay, a final, uh, final supplemental question. Uh, uh, it uh, obviously meets all of the uh, pro forma planning requirements, uh, including uh, the height, uh, height uh, variations. Um, I was uh, interested uh, in the uh, federal government uh, um, linkage uh, to the project. Can you tell us more about uh, how many housing units will be uh, uh, social social housing units there did did you say 30 percent yeah thank you through you chair that's correct um through the cmhc's program uh 30 percent of the units must be affordable okay thanks so much those are all my questions uh mr chairman thank you councillor uh on our speakers list councillor kassar Thanks, Chair Danko. Just one clarification on the access to Kelly Street. What I understood was automotive traffic would not be able to access it, but pedestrians would be, noting that uh, Memorial Park uh, is very nearby and will be yep. able to be accessed. Yes? Through your Chair, that's correct. Um, yes, I should clarify that vehicular access would be prohibited through the relocation of the community garden, uh, but pedestrian access will be maintained. Thank you, Councillor. We have no further speakers. I already got them. <laughs> so I need a mover and a seconder to receive the staff presentation, moved by Councillor McMeekin, seconded by Councillor Wang.
uglier than words. I can express. You put the hooks of water down one more time. This is an observation. Thank you. Consistent. You ought to be ashamed of something. It's not planning. That's unanimous. Thank you. Uh, we have Andrew Hannafort with MHBC Planning and the owner, Carly Forrester, in attendance today. Andrew, I'll go to you first. Uh, thank you and, and good morning, Chair, Councillors and staff. My name is Andrew Hannaford. I'm an associate with MHBC Planning and I'm here on behalf of the applicant, Kindred Works. Um, as was mentioned, I'm joined by Carly Forrester uh, with Kindred Works. We have reviewed the staff recommendation report and are in agreement. And I'd also like to thank staff for the significant amount of collaboration uh, that has occurred since the initial FC meeting back in August of 2021. Um, as was mentioned, this is a zoning bylaw amendment application for 44 multiple dwelling units. Um, surrounding the existing place of worship site, of the 44 units, 14 are townhouse units, 30 are walk-up apartment form. Um, all of the units are proposed to be rental housing with 30% targeted to be affordable rental housing, as was mentioned. Um, in addition to the affordable rental housing, this development includes retention of the existing place of worship, creation of that new community garden and pedestrian and cycling connection to Kelly Street, um, as well as planting of new trees around the site periphery and enhanced landscaping to improve the relationship of the site and existing place of worship to the surrounding community. Um, with that, I'll thank this committee for your time and, and make Carly and myself available should there be any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Are there any questions for the agent or owner? Seeing none from committee. Councillor Wang, I believe you're second vice chair. Can you take the chair for a minute? Just have uh, two quick questions from me. Please go ahead. Uh, first, you mentioned a minimum of 30% uh, being affordable housing. Do you have a a definition of, of affordable? Uh, Mr. Hannaford? Um, or Ms. Forster? Yes, yeah, sorry, I'll, I'll take that one. Um, we're working with um, housing services to define, like we're, we're currently underwriting at 80% of the median market rent for the water down area. Um, and we're just working with CMHC in the city to further define what that means um, as funding programs change and evolve, just to make sure that we're keeping those units um, affordable, but also um, working with the city to further subsidize where possible. Okay, thank you. And I note that these are, are townhomes, so am I, this is not part of the planning process, but just sort of kind of uh, for information um, that these are two, three bedroom family oriented uh, purpose built rentals? Uh, through the chair, yeah, that, that would be correct. Um, 10 of the units are slated to be one bedroom, but larger one bedrooms because they're um, at grade and fully accessible. So they'd be um, just larger bedrooms and larger kitchens, that kind of thing. And then the rest of the units would be a mixture of two bedroom and three bedroom units. Okay, thank you. And my last question is you mentioned, um, or it was mentioned earlier that uh, as part of the CMHC funding that there's uh, some high efficiency uh -huh. building code standards. Do you, again, this is not strictly part of the planning process, but you know, just kind of for information, do you have an idea of what standard you're, you'll be building to or what is the goal? Um, yeah, through the, through the chair. So we're, our goal is to be, as a, co as a company, to be um, uh, carbon neutral by 2030. Um, so all of our projects are looking at that, that as well. So we are looking at um, sustainable projects um, Passive house ready, maybe not certified, but to that level of, of sustainability. Okay, thank you. Those are all the questions I had. Okay, I'll take back the chair to you. back. If there's no further discussion, uh, we need a mover and a seconder to receive the delegation from the agent, moved by Councillor McMeekin, seconded by Councillor Kassar. That's unanimous, thank you. We do have one registered delegation from today and then I will go to the gallery and see if there's any additional uh, speakers. So first is Mark Schroeder, I believe. Mark, if you're here. Okay, thank you. Mark is just making his way down to the podium. Thank 
you. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Mark Schrader. I'm a resident of uh, Kelly Street in Waterdown. Uh, I want to thank uh, the committee and councillors for uh, the opportunity to address a group this morning regarding the uh, development proposed at 306 Parkside Drive. You know, we're a community of homeowners. We've um, coexisted with the United Church for many years, and in our case, in our family, 25, 26 years. So we have a long-standing relationship with the church as its parishioners observe their faith. Um, our group submitted four uh, petitions um, as a neighborhood. Um, I think we got about 50% of the neighbors did, uh, did sign various petitions. And I want to address those. Uh, there may be questions as to uh, why we did it. Um, our concern was we originally expected and hoped that the development would be two stories maximum, not three in some cases. And so we didn't understand the process and the decision-making criteria to move from totally two-story to two-story with some three-story. So that's why it's likely on record that we did submit a petition for that. The second one was mature trees, and we did submit a, um, a video that I didn't feel we needed to all look at today, but the video just shows the amount of trees and the coverage and foliage in the area uh, surrounding the various streets as well as the church property. And our concern there has been uh, the trees have formed a natural barrier from visual and noise uh, protection for years. And um, when we looked at the plans, um, you know, 54 trees were designated that there could be some injury through construction or other activity. So out of the 73 that are still remaining, we were quite concerned. And that's why we submitted a petition on that, just to say, you know, thank you for respecting the, the, the trees and the effort, but we certainly want to make sure that if any trees have to be replaced, that they're replaced with significant trees. And I believe we asked for 20 millimeters more than what the proposal is if there were replacements. Um, the third aspect that we, we spoke to in our petition had to do with the laneway. It's been spoken to, I think, a number of times, including Councillor McMeekin, regarding the access from the development to Kelly Street. We appreciate the fact that there will not be any vehicular traffic in that area. Uh, it's a very narrow laneway, and it really would uh, destroy Kelly Street in terms of a viable place to live. So that's why we submitted that one. And then the, the fourth one, really is Kelly Street parking. And I know it's been commented that it's not part of this, this planning effort. What our concern is, Kelly Street is already a narrow enough street. There are only about five parking spots on the north side of the street that, that the public uses today. The rest is all listed as no parking. And our concern is that there will be overflow from this development directly onto Kelly Street. And, and that will really mess up any of us trying to get out of our, drives, our driveways and uh, allow us to function properly. So that's, that's where the petitions came from, and those were our concerns. Um, we are pleased that um, you know, there, there is a significant effort to save as many trees as possible and replant where necessary. Uh, we think that helps us out. But um, you know, that's why we submitted petitions. That's why a number of us in the neighborhood are here today. Um, the only other question, and I don't know if this is the time to ask it, is we do submit a number of questions. The neighbors that are both here and online have submitted a number of questions. Not all can be answered by the planning group. Devin and I think we know each other through various discussions, but there are some questions that have not been answered, and I think they have to be answered by the development team. So at some point, we hope for answers with that as well. So thank you for your time. Um, really appreciate it. Okay, thank, thank you. you. I'm gonna open up the floor to questions. I'm not sure if there's any questions from committee. I'm not seeing any. Uh, the questions that you mentioned specifically, um, did you want to raise those now and then we can follow up with staff or, or does, are staff aware? Um, I think in most cases staff are aware. I think a number of us have sent in questions. Um, you know, people want to know who to submit questions to as the development right. evolves, if they have concerns, who do they go to? Um, is there a fence going to be put around 
the, the whole property. Um, yeah, I think that's another question that's come up. Um, and I think the, the big concern beyond that is as things happen, who do we contact? Mm -hmm. How do we solve the potential problems that we know will exist on Kelly Street once this development moves forward? So I think okay. those are the types of questions. I think for the most part, we can work with staff to get those, as long as we're on record saying, hey, let's work together to, uh, to get answers. Okay, excellent, thank Great. you. Thank you. So now I'm going to go to the, uh, the public. If there's anyone here or in online uh, that would like to speak to this delegation. Yep, okay, I got someone in the gallery. Yep, please come down. <coughs> Again, this is for 306 Parkside Drive in Flamborough. So when you get to the podium, please just, uh, what do we need for the record, Elsie Kelsey? They'll be required to fill in their name, address, and phone number for my records. Thank you. So once you've done that, um, can I have some more? Yeah, yeah. Great, thanks. Oh, okay. Great. So just before you get started, just state your name, um, yep. and then you'll have five minutes, and okay. the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you everyone for the opportunity for me to speak uh, today. Uh, my name is uh, Annie McLaren. Um, I'm a resident of Mill Street North in Waterdown. I'm also the president, uh, or president, the um, uh, chair of the Waterdown Mill Street Heritage Committee. It's a local committee that uh, started in uh, 2011. We had five members back then, we have 49 now, just local residents. Our main uh, objective is to try to preserve the old core of Waterdown. Um, I'd like to just speak briefly on um, the Waterdown Node secondary plan and how it's important to the um, community. Um, it's a process that started back in uh, 2018, uh, beginning of 2019. It was going to be 18 month process, but COVID, it was about three years. Um, the community was very involved, um, uh, including our, our committee. We had three members on a focus group that was uh, set up through uh, Councillor Partridge's uh, office. And uh, they did um, a tremendous amount of uh, community involvement with uh, um, meeting uh, um, with uh, residents and what have you and getting their input. Um, so anyone that's familiar with uh, Waterdown, um, there's a construction explosion. Uh, every corner of Waterdown is just booming and there's more construction happening every day, more planned in the future. So now the construction is coming in town. Um, so we're trying to um, mitigate it as much as we can. Um, we realize construction is all part of uh, community's growth, um, but we're trying to uh, um, protect the old core um, of Waterdown being anything south of, of Parkside, north of Union, Grindstone Creek to Hamilton Street, sort of that area, which was the Waterdown node um, secondary plan uh, air study area. Um, so getting to the proposed proposal that went through, there's a number of things that uh, um, our committee is very happy about. One of them is uh, that the church is going to be saved. Um, we're all about heritage and protecting heritage, and that's a heritage building, uh, although it's not designated, but it's, uh, it's certainly an old building, and it's great that it is going to be saved. And the other thing which I, I heard today um, was the tree canopy. Um, I did look at the Arborist report um, that was sent. Uh, Devin, thank you for that. Um, and uh, it's quite uh, detailed. And by the looks of it, it looks like five trees were coming down at the front and the side for parking and what have you. But the tree um, uh, canopy at the back was going to be saved, which, uh, um, which is great. The uh, one, um, one part of the project, which was a little surprising, was was the height of the buildings. Uh, now, um, th through Devon, they say they've got the criteria to meet that. Um, through the whole process, and I was involved with the whole process right through, I was told repeatedly that two-story would be the max um, for that. 
Um, now the three story is being allowed and I'm assuming that the criteria is there to allow it to happen um, is just the mediation uh, uh, to, or try to uh, meet a, a buffer zone between the existing properties, um, which I think um, it seems to be um, it seems to be there. So uh, my main reason for, for um, speaking today was uh, to say how important the secondary node plan is to um, water down community to try to uh, mitigate, not, not eliminate, but mitigate the, the construction boom that's happening everywhere else uh, around Waterdown, um, but the core to try to preserve it. But um, this uh, um, proposal um, has, other than the three story, I think I think it has followed much much of the. Uh, um, so, I would ask actually like to just ask the question if I can to, uh, through through, um, through the chair. Um, what is the criteria that allows a three story opposed to the two? Because I had several through the whole process, I had had several you know from city staff indicating it was a two story limit, and now it seems to be okay for a three. So I was just curious if there's. Um, through the chair, if, so, if somebody could answer that question so for me. I, I've taken a note of the question, and once we receive all the delegations, I will ask staff for a comment on that. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. Uh, that's all I have. So okay. thank you very much for allowing me to speak today. Thank you, are there any oh, questions? Sorry. Not seeing any, thank you for your delegation. Okay, thank you. And just make sure you fill in your, your name and address. Uh, okay, so again, on 306 Parkside Drive, are there any other members of the community that wish to address committee today? Seeing none. There's, oh, sorry, yes, please come down. So again, yeah, just uh, state your name and then uh, you'll have five minutes and you have the floor. And before you leave, just make sure you fill out your, your name and address for us. Thank you. Uh, thank you, my name is uh, Lex Varghese. I am a resident on uh, Parkside uh, that backs, one of the two properties that backs on the, I guess, north side of the church property. Um, just a couple of responses from uh, myself uh, on behalf of a few residents on uh, that street as well as on uh, Mill Street. Uh, a lot of us have constructed fences and paid for them directly on our own. Um, those fences were obviously in poor regard and there's fences along the Mill Street side that are non-existent at this point. So that would be one of my questions. Uh, we, we purchased that property because of the privacy and that it was backing on the church and now we are afraid that this uh, three-story unit is going to be staring directly into my backyard. Um, so that was one of the uh, issues. I also live on Parkside, I work from home uh, a majority of the time, so I see the traffic flow in and out of there. Um, there has been comments that once the, the bypass is complete that this will alleviate that, but uh, the that's a bypass that's been in production for decades and we're, no, we're no, not guaranteed when that will be completed. Um, 44 units plus the traffic to the church uh, as well as any guests of people that are living up there uh, are going to create a, a, a ton of issues uh, coming out of that, uh, I guess, parkside access that and laneway access around the church. So. Those are some concerns of ours. Um, again, we bought a property in a very nice uh, post-World War II uh, community. We love the core, we love uh, the accessibility to the church, to the park, um, and we do find that some of this is going to inhibit, it, or inhibit our enjoyment of the property as well as uh, potentially affect the values of our property as well. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Are there any questions from committee? Seeing none, thank you for your delegations, appreciate it. Um, okay, I'm gonna go back to the gallery and online, are there any other members of the public that wish to speak to 306 Parkside Drive? Yes? Oh, sorry, we have two. Hang on, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go to uh, this side first and then I'm gonna come back to this side, so. 
Thank you. Sorry about that. <laughs> And just uh, go ahead. So you, you, you get the, uh, the process now. So just please state your name, and then you have five minutes. OK. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm uh, Margaret Woolley. And Sorry, I'm just going to pause you for a moment. We have a bit of a disturbance in the uh, foyer. Thank you. Sorry about that. Hi. Um, my name's Margaret Woolley. I didn't intend any of, you know, getting up and speaking. Wasn't prepared, have nothing in hand. We moved into this house on Kelly Street eight months ago. When we purchased, we knew nothing at all about any of what's going on. We are one of the properties that is actually going to be sitting right in front of one of those three-story buildings. Our property is exactly the same as our neighbor's property, and it is said to be that it is a two-story property, which it isn't. It's a bungalow, and our property has been sort of brought to the attention of others that it's a two-story for whatever reason. Um, these buildings are going up, and as far as I'm concerned, it's gonna be terrifying for children trying to walk in and out, go to school, live their lives, and they're as big as they are, or small, they do what they do. They run out in the street, and it's going to be terrible. We also didn't really get any replies back from Carly regarding the, um, how much the rents are going to be, and you know, the facilities that are going to be around there, who is going to be looking after them, who do we contact? And we need, for our own feelings, we've been there eight months, knew nothing about this, paid a premium and went through hell to get that place because we wanted so much. The people who are there are absolutely fabulous families. And we are now put with this in front of us, which is, as far as I'm concerned, we, we have not been told, warned, given the option, except for this moment now. But as far as I'm concerned, everything is in order to go ahead and wipe us off our feet. That building is going to be at the back of my home, and we bought it to live our days out there. And this is what we're going to be living with. Please, please, please try and talk and discuss and give as much as we are giving because we have no option by the looks of it. It would take us a long way together to live together because it makes for a better community. So please just touch base with us so that we can have maybe some say, or at least talk things over. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your thoughts. Uh, okay, I believe we had another speaker over here. Please come down. Sorry, we, we need you to fill in your name and uh, address. Sorry about that. Hi, my name's Jeff. I live on Parkside Drive. Uh, 
one of the reasons uh, that I, I just don't understand is everybody's brought up today, we were, we were to stay at a two-story, and all of a sudden it was moved to a three-story, and it's just put in front of us. I understand if that's where, you know, the, the municipality makes a decision on that, but when we talk about the heritage in the community, you know, you went around and put houses on a registry for heritage. People had no say. It was taken, it was put on the registry. So why are you putting houses on a registry when you want to build three-story? Uh, th there's nothing higher than three stories in Waterdown. You're in a community that you're trying to keep it looking roughly the same. And all of a sudden, you've jumped all over and, and gone forward. Ted McMeekin's on here today. Ted was in council when they were going to put the bypass in. Still isn't finished. There's traffic on that road. You can't even get out of your driveway. Somebody's going to get killed. There's no doubt something's going to happen. I don't know when they're going to finish the road because my understanding, the road's never going to get done. It's held up with a different builder that's decided he's not letting you move forward. So you're going to build more housing on a road that you can't fix. That Ted Mimikin said 13 years ago, it will be done in a couple of years. Sorry, Ted, but that's where we are today. The next thing is, you have a church. How many people go to the church? Has anybody gone to the church in this room here? I walk my dog every Sunday. The church gets 20 people into that building. How do you pay for that building with 20 people? Okay, the church down the street beside the public school, they wanted to put townhouses behind there. That got, no, couldn't happen. They're not gonna let it happen. All of a sudden, we're gonna go because you need low income housing in Waterdown? You're gonna push through? Uh, I just lost for words because if there's a fire, secondly, oh, I'd like to stay on the church. So the church is gonna close up. What is, what's gonna happen to the church? You're gonna build, are we gonna build more townhouses where the church is? Because I know three developers looked at it and I talked to all three of them. They told me they wouldn't touch the area because of the church. Because the cost of tearing down the church or doing something with the church, they'd never, it would be a lost cause. So to me, the church is gonna eventually go empty in the next five years. Because the younger generation's not going to church. And <laughs> go by and look at how many cars are there. I went over to church one day, walked in, I counted. 14 people on a Sunday. So you're gonna pay for that building. So that building's gonna go be, probably in five years, gonna be boarded up. I don't know. I don't know what they're gonna do. So if you're gonna sell something, to me, I don't think we're going the right road here. If the church wants to sell the property, put it up and sell it to a developer that's gonna develop it properly. You're band-aiding around a building that you wanna try and keep that nobody goes to. So, and the secondly, if we have a fire, how are they gonna get into this place? Nobody's told me how they're gonna get in. If they have a fire out front and there's cars parked, how are you gonna get fire trucks into this building? It's the way I see it, you got one road in, one road out. Okay, so I, I don't know. I don't know where a secondary, if they put in for a secondary road or whatever, nobody's talked about how the road's gonna work here because I'll tell you, if there's a fire, you burn half the town down the time if, if you get a roadblock, the time you pull cars and, and what have you, because there's, it's, to me, I just don't know how that got passed. You know, so to me, that's it. I mean, I, I just think the biggest thing here is I don't know why you're going three stories high when you talk about the village, trying to keep the village the way it is. Traffic, we haven't dealt with the traffic here for 13 years, so we're going to build more on a road that can't stand what it's got right now because it can't get a bypass through. So I, I just think there's so many issues around this, why we're moving forward with it. Personally, I understand you need low housing income, but that's the reason you're going here, because you got nowhere else in Waterdown to go, and you found an alternative to put it somewhere. It doesn't make sense, I'm sorry. It doesn't make sense for the, the area and putting it in the village where we are today. So that's all I have to say, thank you. Thank you, don't forget to... Thank you, Jeff. Uh, again, are there any further members from the public that wish to speak to 306 Parkside Drive? Going once, please.
Nobody in this discussion has mentioned the fact that there's a long-term care facility within this core we're talking about. There are 126 residents there who use Parkside to get to and from stores, grocery stores, walks, whatever. As it stands now, the pedestrian traffic is, is immense. So too, as Jeff says, is the traffic. The traffic to get in and out of our property, I live on Parkside Drive, to get in and outside of our driveway is virtually impossible between business hours. I was with my grandson a couple weeks ago and was just about hit by a car who couldn't wait for the light. So my big concern is the, the amount of traffic, both pedestrian and uh, vehicular. It's, it's, it's a nightmare. And this is only going to add to it. Thank you. Thank you. And just for the record, your name? My if name is Murray with... Sylvester. I live at 303 Parkside Drive. Thank you, Bernie. And just make sure you fill out that form. Thank you. Any questions? Seeing none, okay, once more, are there any further members of the public that wish to speak to 306 Parkside Drive? Going once. Any other members of the public that wish to speak to 306 Parkside Drive? Going twice. And finally, any other members of the public that wish to speak to this development application? Seeing none, thank you. So I need a mover and a seconder to close the public meeting. Moved by Councillor McMeekin, seconded by Councillor Kretsch. Sorry, just to clarify that it's a combined motion that will be receiving the written and all well, the public submissions and closing the public meeting. Thank you. That, that the public submissions regarding this matter were received and considered by the committee and that the public meeting is closed. Is Councillor McMeekin and Councillor Kretsch. Thank you, that's unanimous. On to the staff and report recommendations. Mover and seconder to put it on the floor. Moved by Councillor McMeekin. Seconded by Councillor Kassar. Is there any discussion on the staff recommendations? There was a, Councillor McMeekin. Thank, thanks, uh, uh, Chair Danko. Um, there were some questions raised uh, by the uh, presenters uh, uh, around um, the uh, explanation of the three-story. Uh, I think that that uh, should be handled. Uh, the fencing came up again, and of course the traffic, which uh, is a concern to uh, to all kinds of people in um, in Waterdown. The, the bypass has its own history and is tied up now, as we all all know uh, with environmental uh, um, uh, review as well as uh, uh, provincially ordered indigenous consultation. Anyhow, I, I won't, won't go there, um, but I, I think the questions that were asked uh, uh, should be uh, uh, responded to. And uh, just before that happens, I, I wanna compliment the citizens for coming out and expressing uh, their concerns uh, um, changes have been difficult uh, for uh, large swaths of uh, the Waterdown community. It's the fastest growing area, I believe, in all of Hamilton. And uh, it's uh, um, a long stretch, uh, uh, some have said to me, from the old Victorian village that was not that long ago uh, uh, omnipresent. Uh, so uh, uh, to uh, Andy and Lex and Mark and Margaret and Jeff and Bernie, uh, thank you for for raising those concerns. I'm, I hope that the uh, United Church Partnership, uh, my, my experience uh, to date has been uh, at least a willingness to engage, uh, will engage uh, with some of these things, particularly around the fencing and the mature trees uh, uh, that might be planted. I look forward to the answers uh, 
from staff and uh, would just footnote uh, before we go there, um, Andy's comment about the secondary node uh, and the heritage district, uh, which I appreciate. It's uh, the uh, heritage district there in Waterdown is the largest heritage district in, uh, in Hamilton. And uh, there is a, a concern, uh, and Andy and I have talked about this many times, uh, um, that uh, the secondary node uh, appears to protect that uh, heritage area. Um, the only potential caveat to that is some changes that might uh, relate to Bill 23, and uh, we're, as a council, we're certainly on top of that. So with that, I'll stop. I, I want to thank the staff uh, um, as well for uh, for their willingness to engage and uh, and of course uh, the citizens uh, whose uh, concerns I'm hoping the uh, proponent and the fullness of time can uh, can mitigate. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, so I will turn turn to staff on um, a couple of the questions that were raised. So first was two story versus three story. And then there was the question about, I think, the, the fences and, and um, how close the new, new construction is. And then uh, I don't know if there's any update on the water down bypass, but we can also ask that question. Thank you, Chair. So through you, um, I'll address the question as it relates to the maximum permitted height. So. On page 11 of the uh, Waterdown Community Node Secondary Plan, <clears throat> uh, it does state that the maximum height for residential uses is two stories. However, it can be increased to three stories subject to uh, a few following requirements. The first requirement being the approval of a zoning bylaw amendment and or a minor variance application. So obviously we're here today to discuss the, the rezoning of the property. Uh, the applicant also has to demonstrate that the cultural heritage value of the subject lands is retained and not negatively impacted. Um, so to that point, the applicant did submit a cultural heritage impact assessment. And through that assessment, it was demonstrated that there would be no negative impact to the existing uh, heritage asset. And finally, the last provision, um, there has to be an appropriate transition between the three-story residential uses and adjacent existing residential uses. So in that regard, that's why there's such an emphasis on retaining that tree buffer that's located towards the rear of the property. Um, in addition, the applicant is um, proposing varying roof lines, so between two and three stories. And they've also, um, <clears throat> They've also included a seven meter rear yard uh, to provide sufficient distance between the existing residential uses and the, the new residential uses. Okay, thank you. Um, anybody want to question a, when the water down bypass will be completed? And what was the value, just as a reminder, how much, how much is, uh, are we investing in that? You no, know, through the chair, I'm not going to be able to recall a dollar value. And if it's if it's okay, we, we'll follow up with our public works colleagues who are delivering sort of the, the component east of centre is being delivered through the public works uh, department. So we can follow up with them and, and provide a response back to the ward councillor, if that's all right. Thank you. Councillor McMeekin, I think that covers every... Oh, the last thing was who to contact. Um, so obviously you can contact well, the councillor's uh, office. So, and, and the other thing was the, uh, the questions about the fencing. I thought that was covered with the uh, the transition, but if there's anything else that... Yeah, thank you, through you, Chair. Um, so as it relates to the fencing, as I understand right now, the proposal doesn't contemplate fencing the entire uh, limit of the subject lands. However, that is a discussion we can have with the applicant through the site plan control process. Okay, thank you. And then finally, just who to contact as as it goes through site plan and... Thank you, through you, Chair. So from what I understand, the site plan application will actually stay with me, so I can, um, I can you know, be that kind of bridge. Um, once construction is complete, then, um, you know, ongoing maintenance <coughs> issues and, and whatnot would be through the church. Okay, thank you. Uh, any further discussion, Councillor Kassar? Thanks, Chair Danko. I just wanted to see if staff would be able to address one other question I heard there from one of the delegates around access to or for fire services or emergency services into the development. Um, so the question to staff through you, Chair, would be, is, has that been considered and is there any concerns about access for emergency services into the development? Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you through you, Chair. So <clears throat> um, I will just note that through the circulation process, we do circulate the fire department um, on every application. And this proposal does contemplate an emergency or secondary access located to the east of the existing place of worship. Councillor? Thank you. Councillor Wang? Thank you, through you, Chair. Um, we heard from the delegates that there were petitions that were written. Where did those petitions end up on our team? Good question. Um, Thank you, Chair, through you. So I do have digital copies of the petitions that I'm uh, happy to share with you. I believe members of the public did bring hard copies as well to this meeting. So then through you, Chair, to uh, Mr. Morton. Um, what was the consensus from those petitions? I heard, we heard from the delegation that it was 50% of the residents in that neighborhood. What was the, uh, what was the content within those petitions? Thank you, Chair, through you. So the original petition that I received, um, it had probably close to 60 signatures on it. Um, I will say that that petition that was received at that time was in regards to the applicant submitting for an amendment to the UHOP, the Urban Hamilton Official Plan. Um, like I explained in the, the presentation, that has since been removed. So that essentially addressed that petition. The more recent petitions that I received over the weekend, they relate to tree removal, which I believe we've addressed through this meeting. Um, I believe the other concern was traffic, and the last concern was related to the three-story height. Chair, I'd like to dig a little bit deeper on the three-story height um, area. So perhaps through you to Mr. Morton, what was the consensus, like, could you just give me a summary as to the last petition around the three-story height? Thank you, Chair, through you. So my understanding is that the concerns were, um, yeah, related to the height being 10.5 meters. Um, the existing residential uh, landowners felt that that was too high for, for the area. And because we are here today to, uh, um, because of the zoning change for that from a two-story to a three-story height, um, through you, Chair, to our planner team, is this, I know that you had said previously that this was for, our recommend, for your recommendation to approve that zoning height, but do you have any additional comments as to why that approval is that? What is the recommend like what like what's the background behind that recommendation? Uh, th through the chair to the councillor Steve Robichaud, Chief Planner, City of Hamilton. Just by way of context, in 2022, we adopted a new secondary plan for the water down node. As part of the deliberations and discussions and community engagement in the development of that secondary plan, uh, there was a site specific policy developed for this property to allow two stories and with conditional permissions to go to three stories if they met the criteria identified in the special policy area in the 2022 secondary plan. Based on an evaluation of the application against those criteria, staff are satisfied that they are meeting the tests and therefore that is why we are recommending approval of the rezoning to allow up to three stories on this site. As Ms. Fayback indicated, the applicant has um, met all of the, those criteria and those elements within the secondary plan and that is the reason for the positive staff recommendation on this application. Uh, staff did work with the applicant in terms of ensuring that it was meeting the tests identified in that site specific policy area and that is the reason why staff are recommending this application. It, what is important is it is providing for the retention and preservation of a, his, you know, a culturally significant resource, being the existing church, with the additional benefit of providing more additional housing and especially affordable housing. So for, that was the basis for looking at developing those criteria and those policies in the secondary plan. And today's zoning application is in effect implementing the vision articulated in that secondary plan. Thank you very much. Thank you. That was exactly the type of information I was looking for. I think I heard it from lots of different areas, but I thank uh, Chief Planner Robichaud for that very fulsome description. That's all. Thank you, Councillor. There's no further discussion. I'm going to just pass the chair quickly to Councillor Wang. I have a couple comments. Please go ahead. 
Thank you. I'm um, actually really excited to see this on our agenda today. I think this is kind of a trend that we're going to be seeing in the future uh, for a lot of church properties throughout the city. Uh, it's really exciting to see new purpose-built, family-friendly, affordable housing, especially in an area of the city that uh, historically hasn't seen that kind of investment. Uh, so I think it's fantastic. Uh, this specific development is a very responsible, high-quality build. Um, you can tell the owner is, is genuinely interested in the community and what they are proposing for the property, uh, especially it being a high efficiency construction. Um, again, it is the uh, affordable housing providers that are leading the way on building a new uh, green infrastructure. And I'm not sure what it is, the, why the for-profit developers can't seem to um, you know, follow suit when, when you have a, a church property that is building to passive house standard, but uh, for profit, uh, very, very profitable developers um, are still building to minimum code. Um, and then finally, as I said, you know, the adaptive re reuse is a church property. It, it was raised that this church is, has a very small congregation, is, is likely struggling financially. So uh, this is exactly the purpose of redeveloping and reusing their property in order to, uh, to maintain the congregation, to maintain their building, and also, I think, do some good for the community by providing that much needed affordable rental housing and infill uh, development. So um, I'm fully in favor and with that I will take the chair back and I will call the vote. Sir? Oh, I, I've inspired Councillor Kretsch. Sorry, I'm just being clumsy with these crap. I meant to do it and then, it, anyway, the internet. So um, yeah, I just wanted to say that I hear what the delegates are saying in terms of some things that are a huge theme in Ward 2 um, uh, downtown, in the downtown core. Um, we're talking about some pretty common stuff, right? Density and what that means for safe pedestrian access, what it means for volume of traffic in areas which may be underserved by transit so that um, there aren't other options and opportunities. I just want to say that I get that. I think this is the struggle we're having across the city right now is as the neighborhoods densify, ensuring that the shape of the neighborhood also keeps up with the amount of people that are going to be in it. Um, I did a little bit of Google Maps um, activity on this. Don't know the area very well otherwise. Um, but saw, yeah, um, there aren't necessarily, uh, there isn't necessarily the infrastructure um, to, in the long term, support a ton of density. Same thing's happening in Ward 2 in maybe a, maybe a bigger way. Corktown neighborhood's looking to have, you know, a few thousand more residents in the next five years. Um, what's that going to mean for all the old arterial roads? I just want to say this is going to continue to be a conversation to have is how we grow. There's a ton of pressure on us um, at the provincial level and always in an economic growth model that we have that grow, 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 grow. Um, and how quickly we do that, how we manage that growth um, determines the quality of the communities we have. So saying I hear that, it's going to continue to be a conversation we have. Um, and so thanks for bringing it up. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, so on the vote, all in favor or opposed? And just a fun fact, I believe we, the City of Hamilton has invested more than $70 million to date in the Waterdown Bypass. That is unanimous, thank you. Item 10.3. Applications to the to amend the Urban Hamilton Official Plan and the City of Stony Creek Zoning Bylaw 3692-92 and the approval of a draft plan of subdivision for lands located at 238 Barton Street in Stony Creek in Ward 10. Does the committee wish to see the presentation? Councillor Beatty, yes. Tim Vrooman. We'll just give a minute uh, for Chambers to change over and Tim will make his way to the podium.
Tim, when you're ready, you have the floor. Thank you and good morning, Chair, members of the committee and staff and public in attendance. My name is Tim Vroman, Area Planning Manager with the Development Planning Suburban Team, and I'll be discussing the official plan and zoning bylaw amendment and draft plan of subdivision applications for lands located at 238 Barton Street in Stony Creek. Proposed development is for 11 block townhouse dwellings with two parking spaces each and six visitor parking spaces. The official plan amendment application is to redesignate the southern portion of the subject lands from low density residential 2B to low density residential 3C within the Western Development Area Secondary Plan to be consistent with the current designation of the northern portion of the lands. The zoning bylaw amendment application is to change the zoning from the neighborhood development ND zone to a modified multiple residential RM3 zone. Site-specific modifications to the RM3 zone are proposed to reflect the size of the existing lot and for modified setbacks and development standards to accommodate the proposed private condominium road development. Okay. Sorry, we're just gonna... <laughs> just pausing for a second for those of you that are uh, online. Thank you. Sorry, Tim. No, no worries. Thank you. So, uh, so carrying on. So the proposed draft plan subdivision consists of one block to facilitate the creation of parcels of tied land, the proposed to townhouse dwellings tied to condominium element condominium roadway, and one block for a road right of way widening. Future site plan control and draft plan of condominium applications will be required to implement the proposal. The surrounding land uses include employment and commercial uses to the north and west and townhouse dwellings and single detached dwellings to the east and south. We see here is the concept plan which shows the proposed layout of the site which orients the townhouse dwellings to, to the private condominium road uh, which is directly accessed off of Barton Street. And we see here these are the elevation drawings for the proposed buildings. So moving on to the photos of the site. So this is a view of the subject lands from across Barton Street. Uh, the adjacent townhouse dwellings to the east. The adjacent commercial property located to the west. And uh, continue to look west to the, the uh, commercial employment uses that are located along Barton Street to the west, as well as directly across the street uh, to the north, and then looking to the east you know, to the employment lands uh, as well. Upon receipt of the applications, notice was sent to 179 property owners within 120 meters of the subject lands on January 16th of 2019, and notice of public meeting was provided on January 27th of 2023. No comments from the public have been received to date. Based on the foregoing, the proposed official plan and zoning bylaw amendment and draft plan associated applications have merit and can be supported as the proposal is consistent with the provincial policy statement, conforms to the growth plan for the Greater Golden Horseshoe, complies with the Urban Hamilton official plan and will comply with, with and implement the policies of the Western Development Area secondary plan upon approval of the proposed official plan amendment. The proposed development of 11 block townhouse dwellings is supportable as they provide a built form that is compatible with the existing development in the area and enhances the character of the neighborhood through intensification. The subject site has adequate transportation systems available and existing services with sufficient capacity to support the proposed development. And this concludes my presentation. I would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Tim. Any questions? Councillor Beatty? Thank you, Tim, or uh, Planning Manager Vrooman. Um, thank you for the presentation. Is this, uh, through you, Chair, the, um, the most appropriate time? I just asked uh, generalized questions about the proposal. Is not, uh, I'm just trying to make sure that I get my process correctly. Yeah, you can ask uh, questions just on the proposal that Tim uh, can answer. If, if you have more comments and discussion about the, uh, the application, then you can hold that until we get sure. to the report, but it's up to you. Okay, um, then with regards to question, I think you answered the first two questions I was gonna ask, uh, Tim. Uh, the three property owners to the south and the commercial property to the west would have been notified as part of this process as they are obviously within the 120 meter radius. Uh, I'm wondering if any uh, feedback was re received from those property owners through that process. 
Through the chair, yes, that is correct. Uh, adjacent property owners would immediately butting the site would have been notified as they would be within the 120 meter notification radius. And to date, no comments were received from any uh, uh, interested parties. Thank you, and through you, Chair. So the initial process, I think you said, was uh, undertaken in 2016, and then something else happened in 2023. I'm wondering if you could just highlight, uh, in terms of uh, public notification or any interactions with the surrounding property owners, um, those two pieces on the timeline, what, what again, those were? Through the Chair, uh, correct, so to clarify, so the applications were received in 2019, and the notice of the complete application and the preliminary circulation was issued uh, at that time. Uh, to all the adjacent property owners. And again, the notice of the public meeting being held today uh, was sent out uh, um, a couple weeks ago. Thank you. And through you, Chair, I, I got my sixes and nines mixed up. Sorry, I guess it was upside down in my head. <laughs> um, the, uh, if, if, um, if my colleagues are following along, and, and most of us do, we sit here and we pull up a quick street view just so that we know what we're talking about. Do make note of a number of mature trees on the property. Um, is there uh, a plan within there for um, what happens when those trees may or may not continue to exist on the property uh, moving forward? Through the chair, so that is correct. So the trees have been identified on the property. Uh, tree protection plan was prepared, identified uh, 19 uh, trees, um, including one that's within the municipal right-of-way. Due to the requirements for grading um, and conflicts with proposed development, 16 of the trees are subject for removal. Um, so the developer would be responsible for providing compensation at a one-to-one -one ratio for any trees that are removed as a result of the development. Thank you, Tim. And through you, Chair, my final question. Um, when we're doing uh, parking calculations, I, I believe you made note of two parking units per, sorry, two parking stalls per unit plus six visitor spots. Um, the uh, parking units per unit, parking stalls per unit, sorry, one of them I understand is considered to be the garage. Is that correct? Sure, that is correct. Okay, so one on street, one garage, and then, sorry, one driveway, one garage, and then six visitor stalls. That is correct. Okay, thank you, Chair. Thank you. Are there any further questions on the presentation? Tim, if you could just take your presentation down um, so I can see everybody. Thank you. I'm not seeing any, so mover and a seconder to receive the presentation, moved by Councillor Beatty. Second by Councillor Spadafora. I was just going to say, it seems like eScribe woke up, <laughs> not unilaterally. Thank you, that's unanimous. We have Ryan Ferrari with AJ Clark and Associates. He's actually the person. Ryan is here. Thank it's you. Related and things I'm not sure what's happening. Ah. Hybrid meetings. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Chair, committee members. Um, I don't have any uh, comments to make at this time. Certainly happy to answer any questions that, if there are any, of any of the members of the committee here. Um, but certainly, we've read the staff report. Uh, we're in full support of uh, staff's presentation and staff's uh, recommendation of approval for this development. Um, and yeah, with that, I'm happy to answer any questions if this committee has any. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions from committee? Councillor Beatty? Real quick, and thank you uh, for being here today as part of the, the uh, conversation. It's actually a, a question that I should have asked Tim, but I'm, I'm sure that you would have uh, equal knowledge of the file. Um, the terminology, and it's just really for my own benefit, uh, short-term bicycle racks. That's pertaining to their intended usage as short-term. People have their bikes there for a short period of time, as opposed to the racks themselves are not intended to be permanent. I'm wondering if you could just clarify that. Yeah, certainly. I can quickly clarify that um, through you, Chair. So uh, 
there's two different terms for bike racks. Short term is what we would consider to be sort of these outdoor, the idea where you park your bikes on a temporary basis. Um, the whole intent of that at this site is more for visitors. Um, whereas long-term bike racks would be indoors in a secure place for people to keep their bikes. So like, like in a garage, for instance. Thank you. Just wanted to clarify that we do have a plan for having bike racks on the property for uh, uh, the duration in a permanent style. Okay, that's chair, all. Thank yeah. you, Chair. Thank you. Seeing no further questions from committee. So mover and a seconder to receive the delegation from the agent, moved by Councillor Beatty, seconded by Councillor Spadafora. All in favor or opposed? Councillor McNeekin. Oh, I did totally jinx it. <laughs> Computer says no. Sorry, who was the it was Councillor Spadafora. <laughs> I see uh, approval from Councillor Wilson and Councillor Francis. Apologies for committee for. I do see your thumb up, Councillor Wilson. So you should have the vote there. That's unanimous. Thank you. Are there any members of the public that wish to speak to this? This is, um, sorry, I'm gonna flip back a page. This is uh, Stony Creek for land at 238 Barton Street in Stony Creek. Any members of the public? Not seeing any. Second time, any members of the public wish to speak to 238 Barton Street in Stony Creek? Seeing none. Third and final time. Seeing none, so uh, moved by Councillor Beatty, seconded by Councillor Spadafora to close the public meeting. And there are no public submissions received regarding this matter. If e scribe will let us close the public meeting. You should have the vote before you. Councillor Francis, were you able to vote or indicate? That's unanimous, thank you. And then finally, mover and seconder to approve the report recommendations, moved by Councillor Beatty, seconded by Councillor Spadafora. Any discussion on the report, Councillor Beatty? Thank you, Chair, and um, just real quick, um, I would make note to my council colleagues, uh, this is a uh, infill development that is adjacent to, um, I would say, a complementary 
uh, development to the east. Uh, the Vulcan Court development has been there a good period of time, and this is going to abut that, uh, that particular development. Um, I'm satisfied and, and hopeful that the, uh, the property owners adjacent have received and, and have been participating. Um, and I would make note that uh, that'll be something that I'd be very keen to, to watch for in the future to make sure that even though we say we're uh, reaching out to adjacent property owners, that uh, we're actually reaching them and that they're actually aware of what's going on. So my office will keep, keep tabs on that. Uh, this is on a major arterial route. Martin Street, of course, has um, a lot of capacity for vehicular traffic. It's on a transit route, uh, which I like. Uh, the ability for people to have uh, alternative modes of transportation should a vehicle not be in their um, inventory. It's also uh, within walkable distance to Eastdale Elementary School. And um, uh, the, the plan to mitigate the loss of some of the mature trees um, I'm, I'm pleased to, to see that, uh, of course, included, uh, as, of course, it would be. The one comment that I'd make is uh, kind of an overarching theme, and uh, I'll, I'll just throw it out there, that when we talk about a uh, number of parking stalls per unit and we consider the garage to be a parking stall, uh, we know full well that it usually isn't. And, and uh, perhaps that's a conversation that we may end up having in the future uh, to be realistic in those uh, conversations that we have. Um, should people be using their garage for parking? Yes. Do they? Largely no. Um, and for us to include that as a, a viable parking spot in, in this day and age, with the reality that we're in, um, I think that there could be some further conversation off into the future, uh, but other than that, I'm uh, generally supportive of this uh, proposal. Thank you, Councillor Beatty. Uh, Councillor Kassar? Thanks, Chair Danko. Just following up on Councillor Beatty's comment on the mature trees and the replacement plan, which was also noted in the presentation and the report, uh, it just prompted the question for me on over time, what is the accountability and follow-up we have as a city to make sure that those trees um, do continue to exist? Because there are several mature trees on this property now. It will, the removal will take away from the character of that part of the neighborhood. But 5, 10, 15, 20 years down the road, um, is there any insurance, assurance that we have that those trees will be maintained, replaced, and so on? Thank you. Thank you. To the chair, to the councillor, Anita Fabak, Director of Development Planning. So this uh, proposal will be required to go through a site plan process. And so through that site plan process is how we would uh, review and approve the compensation. So they're required, if they're going to remove trees, they need to replant those trees. That would be done through a landscape plan, which would be approved by staff. And so the, the property owner would be required to be in compliance with that landscape plan and that site plan. Um, so if trees do die, um, they will be required to be replaced. Um, the, the city does not proactively monitor that, but the requirement would be and the onus would be on the property owner, um, or the, in this case it may be a, a condo. It'll be a condo corporation, so through that condo corporation, that's how the, the trees would be uh, properly maintained and replaced. Thank you. Councillor? Uh, sorry, if I can just follow up. Um, we do, rec under our City of Hamilton Property Standards Bylaw, it does reference back to the site approved site plans. So that, although we, do, as Ms. Fabeck said, we don't uh, you know, proactively look for violations of site plans. If there is a complaint received about the property being out of conformity with the approved site plan, we do have the authority under the Property Standards Bylaw to go back in and look and if they have to do some replantings, we will pro work with the property owners to bring the property back into conformity with the site plan control bylaw. And I just wanted, based on two earlier comments that have been made, we are currently in the process of updating or bringing forward the finalization to the urban forestry strategy. And one of the things we are looking at is, is the current council approved compensation methodology of one tree for one tree appropriate? Or should we move more to a canopy model or look at something else for large trees? You know, if you 
take, cutting down a big old oak tree and you only have to put up a twig, is that the proper compensation? So that's part of the work in terms of the urban forestry strategy, providing, looking at future direction to update those uh, tree compensation guidelines. And planning and transportation planning staff are also currently working on an update to our parking standard, residential parking standards for zoning by level 5200. Uh, Mr. Hollingworth can provide more in terms of the time frame for bringing forward some draft recommendations. But it's my understanding we're hoping to get something in front of committee probably Q2 of this year for public consultation, looking at what is an appropriate standard in an urban context, what's an appropriate standard in a rural context, and what's an appropriate standard sort of in a changing community that's urbanizing or has rapid transit or other considerations, as opposed to the current one size fits all, save and except for the downtown, because we are finding that in some areas where transit is not in the nearest or medium term, we may need a higher standard, where there's other areas of the city uh, trying to achieve some of our climate change goals and um, mobility objectives, maybe no parking should be required, but at least put that, bring it forward to committee for consideration, go out and have public engagement, and then report back with the necessary modifications to the zoning bylaw, or recommended modifications to the zoning bylaw, based on what we hear from stakeholders in the community around this issue of parking. Uh, it's both the size of parking stalls and the number of parking to be provided, and ensuring that we're not over providing parking in some areas, and in other areas, we, we end up having a deficiency because there is no plan B if you can't use a vehicle. So that's the thing that's on the work plan to bring forward Q2 of 2023. Sorry, interrupting. Thank you very much. Thank you, Director. Councillor? Thank you for the answer uh, to both of you. Just one supplemental then. You mentioned the, supply plan, uh, the site plan gives some tool mechanism to be able to come back to the owner. So with Bill 23 not requiring site plans for 10 units and under, does that mean we lose leverage in those situations? Mm -hmm. On a, through you, Mr. Chairman, on a go forward basis, you are correct. In that case, we would look through the condominium approvals or the subdivision agreement requiring that they provide the vegetation and maintain it. And in some cases, we don't deregister parts of the condominium approvals or the subdivision agreements. We leave them on title. Um, for legacy properties, those, those site plan agreements will continue to stay in force and effect indefinitely until such time there's an agreement to remove that. So we are looking at that issue and how we deal with it. Um, and then the other, as part of the urban forest strategy, we're also looking at what are the other municipal act tools sort of to address this shortfall, i.e. Uh, like Ancaster has a private tree bylaw, Stony Creek has a private tree bylaw for the Niagara escarpment lands. Um, should we have consideration for, you know, expanding the scope of that sort of those tree protections, recognizing that some trees do die naturally, but what is the place, the replacement process where a tree dies um, just because of natural disease or other considerations, how we deal with that? We, we had that discussion about 10 years ago, and the decision was not to proceed with a private tree bylaw, but given what's going on with Bill 23 and some of the other changes, um, we we're actually taking a look at, you know, at least having a public consultation around that one particular piece, because we have had, some people assume there is a private tree bylaw, when it really only relates to boulevard trees, so that will be part of one thing that we may want to consider um, in this term of council, revisiting the previous decisions around private tree bylaws and how we deal with it. It's, it can be very resource intensive and can be very controversial because a lot of people on both sides of the issue, but it may be something for consideration. That's part of the, what we've been hearing through the urban forest strategy. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. That's all, Chair. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, there's no further discussion. I'll call the question. Moved by Councillor Beatty, seconded by Councillor Spatafora. All in favor or opposed to approve the report recommendations before you. It even includes six visitor parking spots. That is a bonus. That is approved unanimously. Thank you. On to item 10.4, application for a zoning bylaw amendment for lands located at 198 Lovers Lane in Ancaster, appropriate date for today. Does the committee wish to see the staff presentation? Yes, thank you. So we have uh, Mark Michnek, city planner.
Just what we're getting setting up, set up here, committee. It's uh, 11.30 now. We have one, two, three more zoning bylaw amendments oh, on the agenda. So I'm thinking we'll finish those three and then break. Good morning, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, staff, and public in attendance. My name is Mark Mishniak, and I'm a planner with the Development Planning Division. I'm here to speak to zoning bylaw amendment application for lands located at 198 Lovers Lane in Ancaster. The site is square with an area of approximately 0.47 hectares and 69 meters of frontage onto Lovers Lane. The purpose of the zoning bylaw amendment is to rezone the site from deferred development D zone in the town of Ancaster zoning bylaw 8757 to the low density residential R1 zone in the city of Hamilton zoning bylaw 05200. Staff recommend approval of the zoning bylaw amendment application. Subject lands are located west of Lovers Lane and south of Lindman Avenue. The site currently contains a single detached dwelling and the surrounding land uses are single detached dwellings in all directions. The applicants are proposing development of a single detached dwelling and to retain the existing single detached dwelling. A consent application to create the new lot for the single detached dwelling is required and has been submitted. The application is scheduled to go to this committee of adjustment on March 9th. We will now take a quick photo tour of the site and the surrounding lands. The next few slides will show the subject property and the existing dwelling at 198 Lovers Lane. You will also notice the street frontage condition along Lovers Lane. Here's the view from the subject property looking south down Lovers Lane. And this is the view looking north down Lover's Lane. Here we see single detached dwellings on the opposite side of Lover's Lane. And here we see single detached dwellings looking north onto Lover's Lane. As part of, this, as part of the planning process, this application was circulated to properties located 120 meters from the subject lands and a, site, and a sign was installed on the subject property. In response to the circulation, staff received feedback raising concerns, raising concerns with the sidewalk along Lover's Lane. A zoning bylaw amendment application is not the appropriate mechanism for obtaining land dedication. However, through the consent application, a condition can be placed on the approval to require the owner to pay their share for concrete sidewalks along the entire frontage of Lover's Lane. In closing, the proposed zoning bylaw amendment can be supported. It is consistent with the provincial policy statement. It conforms to a place to grow growth plan for the Greater Golden Horseshoe and the Niagara Escarpment Plan. And it complies with the Urban Hamilton official plan. The subject lands will also provide similar zoning as adjacent lands. This will ensure compatibility in terms of built form, massing, height, setbacks from the street and building separation. Thank you. This concludes my presentation, and I would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Kassar. Thank you very much, Chair Danko, and thank you for the presentation. Uh, a couple of questions. Uh, similar to what I asked in the other presentation in Ancaster, um, just for clarity for the public, this is one step in the application process. Just wanted to know if you could confirm uh, where we're at in the process and what steps will follow. Thank you. Through you, Mr. Chair. Uh, following this, uh, the bylaw will go to council for approval, and after which there would be a, an appeal period. Uh, once the bylaw is in place, 
Uh, as I mentioned also, the applicants have submitted uh, an application for consent to split these lands, uh, which is scheduled to Committee of Adjustment on March 9th. Thank you, Chair. And just can you elaborate on the step with uh, the Committee of Adjustment? Uh, just to help me understand why that step is there and why it's necessary. Thank you. The uh, Committee of Adjustment step uh, is, is an application for consent to sever. Um, that is the, the planning, uh, through the Planning Act, the mechanism, one mechanism through the Planning Act for creating a, a new parcel. Uh, so until there is a second parcel created, uh, another dwelling would not be allowed on the property. Okay, just to follow up on that, Chair, I'm just trying to understand the, that, the requirement for that step versus approval from Council. If you could just elaborate, please. I'm sorry, I don't understand the question. Uh, so it's just, I guess, Chair, a matter of getting approvals uh, for the zoning. And I'm just trying to understand the role of committee adjustment versus the role of council in approving that step. Thank uh, you. So through you, Mr. Chair, uh, the current zoning, the deferred uh, development D zone, uh, only permits uh, dwellings that currently existed at the time the bylaw was plat uh, passed. Um, so uh, in order to uh, develop that second dwelling or any other dwelling on the property, uh, a rezoning is required. Yeah, thanks, Chair. And I understand the rezoning is required. It's just more, and maybe this isn't the right time uh, to ask, We can, but uh, try to understand why the role of the Committee of Adjustment is required here rather than just Council making that decision. Sorry, Director. Through you, Mr. Chairman, to the Councillor. The Committee of Adjustment, through their consent granting authority, can either can, has to usually imposes a condition that any new lot to be created and any lot to be retained complies with the zoning. Applicants have a choice of either applying for the zoning change in advance of going to the Committee of Adjustment for that severance, or they can apply for the severance and normally based on the review of staff, staff will recommend to the committee that if the application should be approved, it would require either a minor variance or a rezoning to ensure zoning conformity. So we're, through the zoning change, we are dealing with the principle of land use and the performance standards associated with it. The Committee of Adjustment, through their consent granting authority, deals with the principle of creating lots and what conditions should be attached to it. So they're a little bit different in that sense. So zoning regulates the land use and the Committee of Adjustment then becomes, in to some degree, an implementing body in lot creation related matters and what would be the appropriate conditions to attach to any severance. And that's why like, we have three applications today where essentially there's conditions, either the applicant's trying to get in front of the Committee of Adjustment by coming for the rezoning first or alternatively, they go to the Committee of Adjustment on the understanding that they will need to apply for and successfully obtain a rezoning, and if they're unsuccessful, then the severance would lapse because an individual has two years from the date of Committee of Adjustment approving a lot creation application to fulfill all of their conditions. And one of those conditions, which you see as a standard condition, whether it's across the city, is either that they obtain a minor variance, if it's a minor matter, or in this case, since it's, as it indicated, it's in a deferred development zone, and that would show that's why they're in for a rezoning application to change the zone to match the zoning of the adjacent properties. So I hope I answered your question. Thank you. Uh, yes, you did, Chief Planner Robichaud. Thank you very much. I will probably follow up in more detail, and I won't need to take time of this committee here today. So thank you very much, Chair. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Kretsch? Well, I'm going to take some time on this point, so thank you. <laughs> Anyways, um, I understood what you said, um, Chief Planner Robichaud. My question to follow up on what Councillor Kassar has said is, look, but couldn't we just do it here? Meaning, like, that's an extra bureaucratic step. I understand that people have the right to apply. I get all these things, but I guess I want to understand the authority of the planning committee and council to be able to say, okay, there's um, there's this thing that obviously logically follows from from this next step. Could we just wrap this stuff up? Another motion, another whatever. Like a mechanism doesn't matter to me personally, but doesn't this body have the authority to just tie these things up so we're not creating another layer of bureaucracy for the committee of adjustment to then intervene and have the citizen committee weigh in when staff's already going to make a recommendation in support of it? This seems to me to be like duplicative. Uh, through you, Mr. Chairman, uh, to the Councillor. And the short answer is no, because there's no consent application 
before you for consideration. Uh, we did, um, in the fall, brought forward a report, I believe it was the fall or the summer last year, on changes to the consent authority, at which time council uh, delegated the concern, limited consent granting authority to the chief planner, primarily around the creation of easements and rights of way and other matters. But there, it was felt that it was important to give the community an opposition or an opportunity to hear about the consent application and what conditions were being attached to it. And that is why um, we decided not to ask council for the authority to the chief planner to approve a consent application and not having it go to the committee of adjustment. It would, they would make the application, we would circulate it and I could, the chief planner could approve it. Um, but that's sort of the process that's being put in place. Council would have to put in place a process where consent applications would come to this body for approval as opposed to the Committee of Adjustment, and that's sort of under the delegated authority bylaws and structures put in place. They're seen as two separate applications, and that's why they're going to two different bodies. Uh, we still have to give, make sure that people are given notice on each individual application type and when they where they could come if they were to learn either to speak for or against it, and because no the notice doesn't, there is no consent notice being sent out saying that it would be dealt with today. We would not be able to say that the legal obligations under the Planning Act in terms of public notice, et cetera, et cetera, have been met and therefore could be dealt with today in one consolidated hearing. It would have to be a change to some of our procedural bylaws and the mechanisms that we give notice. And that's why normally consent applications go to the Committee of Adjustment, the committee imposes the condition that they rezone it and then you know, we see the rezoning application fall in a couple of months later coming in, we circulate it and present our recommendations to planning committee. It's simply the way the two processes have been structured and operating uh, to date. So it would change some of the delegated authority bylaws and what this committee would want to deal with versus delegated authority or leaving it as the status quo. Um, I can forward to the members of the committee if there's or wish a copy of that most recent report that was dealt with by the previous council, I think it was August, September or August last year, just for your information about what's been delegated to the Director of Planning and when then what continues to go to the Committee of Adjustment under its basis. Thank you very much. Thank you. Councillor? So I'm not talking specifically about this application. I, I'm referring to it because the issue is raised within respect, with, within context. But what you're saying is that we do have the authority here, if we wished, under some other changes, we could make, we could make changes to have the authority to deal with these things here. Uh, through Mr. Chairman to the council, that is correct. We would Great. council would have to change, yeah, the current practices in order to have consent applications come to this body. Um, it would eliminate that function from the current committee of adjustment, who is the consent granting authority in the city of Hamilton. Thank you. I trust I answered your question. Thank you. Yes, all, all I'm trying to understand is the authority question. So thank you for answering that question. I think I understand. I'd love to put a motion forward at some point for a report back on how we could do this. So I think it's important to have that conversation. So whenever that's appropriate to do, not inside of this particular little um, triangle we're in, but when we leave the triangle later, mm -hmm. um, whenever the clerks think it's fine, I'd like to put a motion forward to get a report back about exactly how that would happen and what we could do to expedite those processes for applications that are already before us. Thank you. I'll send you an email. All right. I'm, I would recommend it be brought up under general business uh, information, other business. Thank you. Uh, so on this um, application, uh, if there's no further questions uh, to Mr. Michniak, we need a mover and seconder to receive the staff presentation. Moved by Councillor Kassar, seconded by Councillor Spatafora. That's unanimous, thank you. So we have James Thomas with AJ Clark and Associates in attendance today. James?
Good morning, everyone, council, committee, planning staff. My name is James Thomas from AJ Clark and Associates, speaking as agent on behalf of Franz Kalkbacher and the applicant. Uh, we have read the staff report and recommendation for approval. We are uh, supportive of the recommendation, and I'm here if there are any further questions that were not already answered. Thank you, James. Are there any questions? Seeing none, so mover and a seconder to receive the agent's presentation. Moved by Councillor Kassar, seconded by Councillor Wang. All in favor or opposed? I see Councillor McMeekin is uh, in support. Uh, it's unanimous, thank you. Are there any members of the public that wish to speak to this item for 198 Lovers Lane in Ancaster? Second time, are there any members of the public that wish to speak to this item? And a third and final time for 198 Lovers Lane, are there any members of the public that wish to speak to this item? Seeing none, I need a mover and a seconder that the public submissions regarding this matter were received and considered by the committee and that the public meeting is closed. Moved by Councillor Kassar, seconded by Councillor Spadafora. It's like an auction, Councillor. Can't move. Thank you, that's unanimous. And then finally, on the report and recommendations, moved by Councillor Kassar, seconded by Councillor Spadafora. Is there any discussion on the approval and recommendations? Seeing none, all in favor or opposed? That is unanimous, thank you. Moving on to item 10.5. Applications for Urban Hamilton Official Plan Amendment and Zoning Bylaw Amendment for 2782 Barton Street East in Ward 5. Does committee wish to see the staff presentation? I see no from Councillor Francis. Not seeing anybody else indicating. So then I need a mover and a seconder to waive the staff presentation. Moved by Councillor Francis, seconded by Councillor Tattison. Since we are not going to see the staff presentation, this is uh, a proposal to permit a 17-story multiple dwelling with 313 residential units, 354 parking spaces, and increasing the residential density to 552 units per hectare.
We'll do a manual vote. So just to uh, waive the staff presentation, everybody in chambers is in support. Anybody opposed? None? I didn't see it on, uh, online, but I'll let you uh, seeing support, support. Yep. Thank you. That's unanimous. Okay, uh, we have Ryan Ferrari with AJ Clark and Associates. Hey, uh, good morning again, committee members, uh, staff, members of the public. Uh, again, Ryan Ferrari, I'm a registered professional planner with AJ Clark and Associates. Um, at this time, uh, certainly read the staff report, happy with the staff recommendations. Um, I'm here to answer any questions as well. I have uh, Mr. Meehan uh, and AJ from LGM Developments in case there are any additional questions of this committee. Um, again, thank you staff for expediting uh, these applications for 17 story building. Um, and yeah, I think I'll leave it there for now and I'm happy to answer any questions, if there are any. Thank you, are there any questions from committee? Not seeing any from Councillor Francis, not seeing any from the rest, okay. Thank you, so I need a mover and a seconder to receive the delegation, moved by Councillor Francis, seconded by Councillor Tattison. Councillor Francis and Councillor McMeekin, are you able to vote and or indicate? Thank you, that's unanimous. Are there any members of the public that wish to speak at this meeting to the application for 2782 Barton Street East? Asking a second time, any members of the public that wish to speak to this item? And a third and final time, any, any members of the public that wish to speak to 2782 Barton Street East? I am seeing none. So then I need a mover and a seconder that there were no public submissions received regarding this matter. Moved by Councillor Francis, seconded by Councillor Tattison, and the public meeting will be closed. Thank you, it's unanimous. There we go. And then finally on the report recommendations, Councillor Francis, did you wish to move this and or speak to it? Yeah, I'm supportive, so wish to move this, thank you. Okay, so moved by Councillor Francis, seconder, Councillor Beatty, thank you. Is there any discussion on the recommendations before you? Seeing none, all in favor or opposed? Thank you, that's unanimous. On to item 10.6. Application for zoning bylaw amendment for lands located at 91 and 95 Strathern Place in Glambrook, Ward 11. 
Does the committee wish to see the staff presentation? Yes, Councillor Tadison is indicating. So, uh, Mark, you're welcome back to the podium. Good morning again, Mr. Chair, members of committee, staff, and uh, public in attendance. Uh, again, my name is Mark Mishniak. I am a planner with the Development uh, Planning Division, and I will be discussing zoning bylaw amendment application for lands located at 91 and 95 Strathern Place in Glanbrook. The site is almost rectangular, has an area of 0.22 hectares, and it has approximately 40 meters of frontage onto Strathern Place. The purpose of the zoning bylaw amendment is to rezone the site from existing residential ER zone and residential holding R3 zone modified in the Township of Glanbrook zoning bylaw 464 to the low density residential R1 zone in City of Hamilton zoning bylaw 05200. A site specific modification to the low density residential zone to remove permission for street townhouses is required because this use is not permitted by the Mount Hope Secondary Plan. Staff recommend support of the zoning bylaw amendment. The lands are located on the south side of Strathern Place. The site currently contains a single detached dwelling and the surrounding lands contain single detached dwellings as well. The applicants are proposing development of a single detached dwelling and to retain the existing single detached dwelling. A consent application to create a new lot for the, for the single detached dwelling was considered by Committee of Adjustment on June 23rd, 2022 and approved with conditions. This decision requires approval of this zoning bylaw amendment among other conditions in order for the consent to be finalized. We will now take a quick photo tour of the subject site and the surrounding lands. Here you see the subject property and the existing dwelling at 91 Strathern Place. This is a view of, this, of Strathern Place looking east from the subject property. And this is the view looking to the west. Here you see a single detached dwelling on the neighboring property to the west. And the next two photos are single detached dwellings on, located on the opposite side of Strathern Place. As part of the planning process, this application was circulated to property owners within 120 meters of the subject property and a sign was installed on the property. In response to the circulation, staff received feedback raising concerns with site rating and stormwater management. The owner would be required to address lot grading and drainage as part of conditions for the consent approval. In closing, staff the proposed zoning bylaw amendment can be supported. It is consistent with the provincial policy statement, conforms to a place to grow growth plan for the Greater Golden Horseshoe, and it complies with the Urban Hamilton official plan and the Mount Hope secondary plan. The proposed development is compatible with and complementary to the existing surrounding neighborhood. Thank you, and this concludes my presentation. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Michniak. Are there any questions from committee? Councillor Tadison. So there was a letter of concern from an existing resident whose property backs on to the empty lot. Um, my question would be, what responsibility does the applicant have to ensure that the water runoff 
currently runs to the catchment base or to, to the catchment drain. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, um, as part of the consent process, the applicant will be required to provide grading and drainage plans um, to be reviewed and uh, approved by our staff, um, which, which needs to be uh, approved prior to the consent taking place. So that lot uh, will not be created until uh, we are satisfied that those conditions have been achieved. Okay, thanks. It's in my, it's through the chair. It's uh, my understanding that some law, lot alterations have already happened according to this letter. So is the city aware of that, those alterations? Because those alterations have already changed the course of the water flow and it's flooding out the back neighbors. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, I was not uh, alerted by any of the neighbors of any changes. Just going to pause for a second and gather gather my thoughts. So, so is the city aware that um, several large trees were removed from the lot already? Um, as part of this, uh, sorry, through you, Mr. Chair, mm -hmm. uh, as part of this submission, uh, the applicants did pr prepare a tree preservation report. Um, in total, three trees were inventory, and the decision to retain trees uh, is based on vigor, condition, and species, and it's the intent to, uh, pr to retain all of those trees that were inventories. Thank you for your time. No more questions at this point. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, if you don't mind, uh, Mr. Michignac, just take down your presentation. Just want to make sure there's no uh, further indications to speak. Not seeing any. Sorry, Councillor Kassar. Yeah, just thank you, Chair. Through you, following up on the question Councillor Tadison asked about uh, if the city was aware of other trees that had been removed on the property that weren't city owned, I'm just looking at a image of the property now um, there's certainly more than three trees on the property so um, I just ask the same question again if we had any knowledge on removal of trees uh, prior to today thank you uh, again through you mr. chair uh, the report submitted by the applicants indicated that there were three trees on the site and that they were uh, retaining those three trees Okay, no. Uh, through Mr. Chairman to both councillors and comments. Uh, we will follow up uh, in terms with the applicant if trees have in fact been removed, which is sort of contrary to the intent of the tree preservation plan. Mm -hmm. And with respect to the grading issue, uh, we will follow up uh, growth management staff. We'll follow up or send inspectors out or whatever necessary courses of action are to see if the property is doing site alteration in contravention of the site alteration bylaw. Generally, when they do start moving earthworks around on a property, it makes it very difficult to finalize the grading plan. If they make a mess of things, I don't want to speak for my engineering colleagues. But on both matters, those are very serious concerns. Um, very often these things can, there's no, like I said earlier, there's no private tree bylaw in the city of Hamilton. We rely on the goodwill of the applicant not to remove any trees until such time as all the planning approvals are in place. But on both of these matters, I just confirmed my uh, growth management colleagues, we will be following up and taking the necessary actions as required um, to deal with this. Uh, regardless of the committee's decision on the zoning application, whether to approve it, defer it, or deny the application. Um, I, we do take these are serious uh, concerns and we want to make sure that uh, what is happening on site is not going to be causing other problems for your adjacent neighbours or in contravention of what the intent is of the application. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you and I will note that we do have the uh, property owner's agent on that perhaps that would be a question for them as well. Thank you Mark. There's no further questions. Uh, do we have a mover and a seconder to receive the staff? Moved by Councillor Tattison. Second by Councillor Wang to receive the staff presentation.
That is unanimous, thank you. Uh, we have Jake, Jacob Dickey with Urban in Mind. Jacob? Yep, good, uh, I was gonna say good morning, but now good afternoon uh, to Mr. Chair and the committee members. Um, we are in support of staff's comments as well as their recommendation of approval for the rezoning. Uh, I have prepared a presentation, uh, but Mark covered mostly everything. Um, so I'm, I'll skip over that and I'll directly answer uh, the committee's questions um, relating to the letter um, that was sent to the city uh, regarding the property owner uh, behind the subject lands. So after reviewing that letter, uh, I followed up with the owner and what they told me is that when they purchased the land about three years ago, um, they removed some of the trees and shrubs in the front yard. And in doing so, um, they did reach out to the city to confirm that it was okay. And the city said that they didn't have any issues with it. And of course there wasn't uh, a private tree bylaw at the time. So they did remove those trees. Um, there has been no uh, regrading at all in the rear yard. Um, and from what the owner has told me is that um, there's some erosion around the catch basin uh, that's located in the property to the rear. So um, the owner hasn't necessarily done anything wrong. Um, they removed the trees uh, a few years ago as they were allowed to do so. Uh, they checked in with the city to ask for permission. Um, there was no private tree bylaw at the time. And of course, um, as a condition of approval for the consent application, uh, a post-construction uh, grading plan will be provided, uh, which will meet the city's standards and ensure that there won't be any uh, spillover onto those lands. So I hope that answers uh, your questions. Thank you, Jacob. And open up the floor to questions from committee. Councillor Tadison. In the letter that, that I'm reading here, it says uh, there was a catch basin culvert installed, but the water, the water runoff from the property in question doesn't flow towards the culvert. Basically, it says that when the property owners took possession, they also changed the grading of the property when they first took ownership. This has caused great flooding on my property in both spring and fall and total ice in the winter. So we have a disconnect between what you're telling me and what my resident is telling me and for me. And I think if um, this is always a concern basically when we have new construction adjacent to 40 and 50 year old established homes. Um, it's fraught with issues, and I think that we need to ensure that the existing residents in the area are taken care of. So you reached out to the property owner, but did you reach out to the um, neighbor who has the concerns? Uh, no, I haven't spoken to that neighbor. Sorry, Councillor, they would have been circulated, though, with notice of the, uh, the application. Okay, okay, thank you for that. Duly noted, Chair. What responsibility does the city have to go through to ensure compliance by builders so that um, something like this stops happening pre-construction, during construction, and finally in the final grading point? I heard that we do have a, at the end we have the the landscape plan that has to be met and so forth, but what about in the meantime? I think that's a question for our staff. Uh, so we can receive the, uh, the, uh, the owner's agent and then you can ask that question. Okay. Is there any further questions to Mr. Dickey? Seeing none. So we'll move on to seconder to receive the delegation from the agent. Moved by Councillor Tadison. thank you. Second by Councillor Beatty. Thank you, Jacob. Thank you. All in favor or opposed? Uh, 
that carries nine to nothing. Thank you. Are there any members of the public that wish to speak uh, to this application for 91 and 95 Strathern Place in Glanbrook? Well, once, second time, any members of the public that wish to speak to this item? Seeing none, and a third and final time, any members of the public that wish to speak to 91, 95 Strathern Place in Glanbrook? Seeing none, so I need a mover and a seconder that the public submissions regarding this matter were received and considered by the committee and the, the public meeting be closed. Moved by Councillor Tattison, thank you, and seconded by Councillor Beattie. It's taken me this long to realize that we've consolidated the written and delegated. Saving a vote. All in favor or opposed? Today, every vote counts. That carries nine to nothing, thank you. And then finally, on the report and recommendations, I uh, need a mover and seconder to put this on the floor, and then we'll open up to questions. Moved by Councillor Tattison, seconded by Councillor Wang. Councillor Tattison, go ahead. I know Chief Planner, you already semi-answered this about in the end, but what about during the process? What, what protections are there for um, existing residents that, you know, when, when they, you know, if they pile dirt and it carries over in the water runoff flows into their backyards, what, what protection do they have, do the existing residents have, um, again, before construction and during construction? Ashraf Hanna, uh, Director of Growth Management and uh, Chief Development Engineer, through the Chair, to the Councillor. Um, uh, as part of the, the subsequent uh, application, consent application, the, the applicant will be required to uh, comply with stormwater management requirements and, and grading. And uh, part of that is uh, ensuring that there's no adverse impact on adjacent uh, properties. In the interim, if there has been uh, uh, grading on the site uh, that would qualify as site alteration, we'll, we'll also, we can also check uh, on that, as uh, uh, Steve mentioned. Um, so we, we'll, we'll do um, uh, a quick inspection on the, on the property to ensure that there's no site alteration that would uh, be violating the site alteration bylaw in the interim, and then as part of the subsequent application, we'll ensure that there is uh, uh, stormwater management in place uh, to ensure there's no adverse impact on adjacent properties, including the, uh, the complainant. Councillor? Thank you, no more questions. I'll take some stuff offline with you. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. If there's no further discussion on this item, is moved by Councillor Tattison, seconded by Councillor Wang. All in favor to approve the report recommendations or opposed? We are just waiting for, again. So while we're waiting for this to this vote to uh, tally, um, it's almost quarter after 12. We have two further um, Consent, I, sorry, no, they're not consent items. Public hearings. 
we could finish those and then take a break before discussion items or we can take a break now. Uh, one is Bill 23, that could take some time. So I maybe suggest that we take a break now and return at uh, 12.45. As, as soon as uh, eScribe lets us No, it's Bell. We are on Bell. Yeah, <laughs> if only. So we're going to do a, a manual vote just on the recommendations at 10.6, just because the vote is, is not tallying. So my apologies. Um, I see everyone in favor in chambers. Everyone in favor online. Te Councillor McMeekin, Councillor Wilson, Councillor Francis. Thank you. And any opposed? Seeing no opposed. That is unanimous. Yes. Okay. okay. As moved by Councillor Kretsch, seconded by Councillor Tattison, that we recess until 12.45, quarter to one. Opposed? No opposed. Right. Unanimous, thank you. We'll see you back in half an hour.
Okay, thank you. Uh, we're returning from recess. We have quorum. There's seven councillors present, eight. Uh, so we are going to continue. We are on item 10.7. Implementation of changes to section 41 of the Planning Act, site plan approval in response to Bill 23, More Homes Built Faster Act. Uh, we do have a staff presentation from Ken Coit. Does committee wish to see the staff presentation? Yes, yes, okay. You're not Ken Coit. We're just getting the presentation set up and then we are going to proceed. Through the chair. Yes. Ken Coit, Manager, uh, Director, Heritage and Durban Design. I just point out that Alana Fulford has worked on this report and uh, We've worked closely on it together and she's going to give the presentation. Excellent. Um, Okay, so good afternoon, uh, members of planning committee. Uh, my name is Alana Fulford. I'm a senior planner uh, with the zoning bylaw reform team. And today I'm going to be presenting on implementation of changes to section 41 of the planning act and that pertains to site plan approval. And this is in response to the province's bill 23, the More Homes Built Faster Act. So this report addresses changes to section 41. These are technical changes required to the city site plan control bylaw to bring it into conformity with the planning act. So Bill 23, uh, as you are aware, made amendments to nine different statutes, including the Planning Act. And in November of last year, staff brought forward a report to Planning Committee, which described the proposed legislative changes and staff's position uh, on those uh, proposed changes. These comments were formally submitted to the province on November 24th and subsequently adopted by council on November 30th. Bill 23 received royal assent on November 28th and is being proclaimed into law in phases. So through this report and subsequent reports to follow, uh, one of which will immediately follow uh, this presentation, uh, staff are addressing the policy and process changes resulting from this legislation. So to briefly review, site plan approval is a legislative process under the Planning Act required for many types of development, which implements a coordinated review process to address matters of site design, including site layout, site access and parking, grading and drainage, landscaping and building design. The entire city of Hamilton is designated as a site plan control area with the site plan control bylaw regulating the type of development that is subject to site plan approval and the requirements of the approval process. 
So before the changes to the Planning Act, site plan control uh, exempted single detached duplex and semi-detached dwellings, street townhouse dwellings within a registered plan of subdivision for which the subdivision agreement is in full force and effect, and agricultural buildings or structures. However, the city site plan control bylaw establishes a number of exceptions to these exemptions where site plan control applies to development that is typically exempt. Um, and this is mainly area or featured based requirements for site plan approval. So this, the example would be Beach Boulevard, uh, the Ancaster ER zone, and development adjacent to or within a core natural area. So as a result of the changes to uh, the Planning Act and the site plan uh, control uh, regulations, site plan control no longer applies to residential development of 10 units or less on a lot. And matters related to exterior design, including character, scale, appearance, and design features of a building. Now, Bill 23 was amended before final reading to allow municipalities to implement green standards at site plan, provided the standards are not more restrictive than the Ontario Building Code. So, in terms of uh, the impl implications and changes required to the city's site plan control bylaw, uh, the first key change is to the submission requirements for the plans and the drawings that are submitted as part of that site plan control application. So what was removed was the wording around matters related to exterior design, including character, scale, appearance, and design features of a building. And this was replaced by matters related to the appearance of elements, facilities, and works on the land to the extent that the appearance impacts matters of health, safety, accessibility, sustainable design, or the protection of adjoining lands. So in terms of what this wording change means, now the evaluation as part of um, site plan control applications is limited to matters of sustainable design as it relates to environmental standards and corresponding building code requirements. So for example, green roofs or other standards established in the building code. And these green standards cannot be more restrictive than the Ontario building code. So thus, uh, the evaluation of plans and drawings submitted with site, a site plan application is limited to considering things like sustainable building materials, uh, window placement and climate considerations, and other sustainable design matters. The other key change to the city site plan control bylaw is in the application of the area and feature-based requirements that are in the site plan control bylaw currently. They've been modified to remove residential development of 10 units or less on a lot, since that is, is, is now a, uh, an across-the-board exemption that does not apply to site plan control. So these changes have impacted um, a number of, of areas of the bylaw. The Beach Boulevard, where site plan control was in place for single detached, semi uh, and duplex dwellings, and this was to address grading and drainage due to flooding potential, as well as the Ancaster ER zone, where as well site plan control was in place for single detached, duplex and semi detached dwellings. This was in place to address grading, drainage and tree protection. So because of these changes, both areas have been removed from site plan control bylaw and are therefore no longer subject to site plan control for that type of development. Now in response, uh, new development will be subject to permit requirements before or at building permit application stage and this will be discussed in detail in the presentation uh, that's going to follow on the next uh, agenda item. The other change is with respect to um, the site plan control trigger uh, for development that is adjacent to or within a core area. A core area is a key natural heritage feature or key hydrological feature uh, or local natural area. The requirements for site plan control as it applies to residential development of 10 units or less on a lot has been removed. 
Now, it is important to note in this regard, uh, the majority of the city, uh, including core areas, are regulated by zoning bylaw 05200. This, uh, that bylaw has established a special setback requirement uh, from the zoned limits of a core area. And in addition, residential uses are not permitted in those zones, um, in those areas that are zoned a core area. So protection has been established uh, through the zoning bylaw. As well, uh, conservation authority uh, permit requirements are still applicable and apply. So in terms of uh, the impact of in-process applications, there were 30 in-process site plan control applications for single detached dwellings uh, that were canceled, and those are um, the vast majority in the Ancaster ER zone and Beach Boulevard. 10 in-process site plan control applications for multi-unit developments with between three and 10 units have been canceled. And these uh, applications um, could go right to a building permit at this stage. So to conclude, uh, the technical changes to the site plan control bylaw as described in this presentation will bring it into conformity with section 41 of the Planning Act. And as well, process changes are being enacted in response to the legislative changes uh, to, the site, to site plan control. And this is to address items no longer subject to site plan control for that residential development of 10 units or less on a lot. Staff have identified uh, the most important matters to address through process changes. Uh, they are listed here, so servicing connections for water and wastewater, site grading and stormwater management, extensions or upgrades to existing city infrastructure, tree protection, excavation, trees, road cuts, and driveway locations in the road right-of-way, and road right-of-way dedications. So the presentation to follow is going to discuss these items in more detail and discuss the new mechanisms proposed to ensure requirements are met. So that is all for this presentation, and I'd be happy to take any questions you may have at this time. Thank, <clears throat> thank you, Alana. And just a reminder for committee, there are two uh, items on this. This is uh, kind of the overview of Section 41 of Bill 23, and then the next item is, I think, the how we are going to address um, the requirements that have been placed on us. So in your questions or discussion, um, try to focus on this presentation, and then we'll get into the how in a, in a following presentation. So uh, with that, I'll open up the floor to questions, and maybe, Alana, just so that we're all on the same page, just a brief um, definition of what a, what a site plan is and uh, how, it's, how it's used. Through the chair to the councillors, yeah, it's a one of a, the applications, uh, Planning Act applications, um, and it is typically uh, for uh, development that would be um, greater than um, you know a single semi duplex um, and sort of multi-unit development, non-residential development, um, and it's an opportunity to provide sort of a, a coordinated um, review process, um, commenting process to deal with. Uh, site design, site layout, um, and all those matters that all you know various departments would have input into, and so it does provide um, the applicant with that coordinated process of getting comments back and and dealing with the matters, um, th various matters uh, through that approval process. Okay, thank you. So I'll open up the floor for discussion. I saw Councillor Beatty first. Go ahead. Thank you, and through your chair. Um, Thank you for the presentation. Um, well, I have a question pertaining, and I th I, I'll throw this out here because I'm uh, relatively new to a lot of uh, planning practices in general. Um, the ability to have control over some of the exterior design components has been removed, unless it pertains to health and safety. Do I have that encapsulated correctly through you, Chair? Through the chair to the councillor, 
the language has been has been changed, and it has sort of reduced the scope of that uh, review. So it is predominantly related to sustainable design and some other matters related to health and safety. Um, and so I think I would say that staff are sort of in that process of establishing sort of exactly what that's going to look like when it's played out. But yes, so it's or it's reduced. Um, the ability and the uh, the matters that can be reviewed. Okay, um, so uh, supplement to that, um, and I'm wondering if maybe we can juxtapose, juxtaposition the two um, current practice and future practice. Um, would we, under the current practice, prior to these changes, have the ability for staff to comment on some of the aesthetics or the exterior appearance of some development that would take place. And I guess I'm, I'm leading this if we had an existing neighborhood that has a certain aesthetic, maybe some historical characteristics, um, would we have under the current practice the ability to ensure that new development still resembled uh, and took on some of the characteristics of that existing neighborhood or community or area? Through the chair to the councillor, well, there's there's a separate process of of going through, you know, the uh, buildings that are are captured through um, historic designations. Um, it wouldn't be. It depends on the area. There are obviously secondary official plan policies, secondary plan policies, and urban design um, related policies that one has to look at. So it's it's it. It, it would differ area to area, but um, certainly those those considerations could be in play, provided, remember, it did not, site plan control did not apply to um, sort of low density residential development previously as well. Um, so those were matters that were, that could be reviewed. Under the current process through the chair, not the future process. The future, that's correct, the future process has removed, uh, the language is exterior design, appearance, character has been removed. Through the chair, then I'll just refine the question down a little further and try to be a little more specific. So let's say we had uh, an existing neighborhood where um, you know the homes just resemble a certain thing, maybe they're period homes, the Victorian, uh, maybe there's no designation, maybe there is, but under the current process, there would be some ability for staff to ensure that if somebody was undertaking an infill project, that the new new component, the new build, could resemble or take on some of the characteristics of the surrounding neighborhood. That would be an availability through the current process. Through the chair to the council, I'll start with, uh, with my response and, and let Ken Coit uh, pick up on this. Um, that infill development um, would not be subject to site plan control unless it had been identified as a specific area that was subject to site plan control. So typically, a single detached infill development is not subject to site plan control. Um, and so there are no um, specific requirements that it must take on a particular appearance of a neighborhood. Um, unless there has been um, some uh, like secondary plan policies and so forth that have indicated um, specific direction in that regard. Director Coit, do you have anything to add? Yeah, through the chair, uh, Ken Coit, Director of Heritage and Urban Design. Um, yes, Councillor, most of those things would be mainly controlled by zoning in terms of landscape area, character. We don't really have a lot in terms of site plan control. Uh, going forward in those neighborhoods, we would be looking to do more work around heritage conservation districts and using the Heritage Act to, de to define these areas that are important. There'll be a report coming forward to the Heritage Committee and coming on the Planning Committee to speak to that work going through to respond to Bill 23. Okay, so then um, I'm just trying to ascertain then through you, Chair, if uh, we have lost our ability to control some of the aesthetics on new builds as it pertains to particularly to infill and ensuring that uh, some new builds would retain the aesthetic, retain the, uh, the look and feel of some of the existing neighborhoods areas. Um, and it's sounding like we still have the ability to do that. We haven't lost it, but I'm, I'm wondering uh, just if we could be kind of specific what we're still able to do as a result. 
So th through the chair, we did not have a lot of, uh, at the neighborhood single family house level, unless there's some very special policies in place, we did not have a lot of uh, ability to control that material discussion as is, unless there's a heritage conservation district. Um, in terms of larger buildings that would have been subject to site plan, we have lost a little bit of that ability to talk about materials um, for larger scale buildings that would typically go through site plan. Okay, so just through your chair, just to put a pin in it, we have lost the ability to maintain some of the aesthetics and some of our uh, historic neighborhoods as it pertains to larger buildings, et cetera. Um, we, we don't have the ability moving forward what we currently have. Correct. Fifth chair, that's correct without us doing extra work in terms of studies and heritage conservation districts. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Kassar. Thanks, Chair Danko. And very similar to um, Councillor Beatty, but just with respect to the Ancaster Wilson Street secondary plan, where there were very specifics on aesthetics. So what I took away from the presentation is that the control from that secondary plan has also been removed. So I just, I know it's a very similar question. Just wanted to confirm that as well, please. So <clears> through the chair to the councillor, as it pertains to um, the development that is now subject to site plan control, um, that is, is correct in terms of when it goes through that process. Um, yes, the language has changed in terms of what the city can review as part of a site plan control application. Okay, thank you for clarifying. And Chair, just one more question, <clears throat> and I apologize, I just caught, caught a sound bite as I was taking notes, so I didn't get the context of what you were saying. Um, but you, there was a statement you made about residential units not permitted within core areas. And I just wanted to, if you go back to that point and elaborate on that, did I hear that correctly? So residential uses, uh, through the Chair to the Councillor, yes. sorry, residential uses are not permitted within core areas. And, um, and as per the zoning that is applied to core areas. Sorry, and, and my apologies, could you back up? What was the context that that was, comment was made? Right, so uh, through the chair to the councillor, so uh, one of the uh, site plan control bylaw requirements was that uh, any development adjacent to or within a core area, should that zoning not be in place, I suppose, but it would be subject to site plan control. Um, and the change is, of course, that we have to remove uh, residential uh, units uh, of 10 or less on a lot. And what I was saying with that removal is that um, we do have protection established through the zoning bylaw. So the majority of the core areas across the city have a zoning that is specific to the protection of that core area and does not permit residential uses. Okay, thank you for clarifying, that's all. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Kretsch. Thanks, and thanks for your presentation. Um, Councillor Kassar asked one of the questions I had, so I think I understand that well enough now. My other question is specifically about um, understanding the design review panel in the context of, of your comments, and I, I searched the report next and didn't see the words design review panel in there, so I hope it's fair to ask them now. but. As, as currently part of the process, site control plan, the site plan process in general, we have a formal consultation, there's a site plan process, and then at some point for significant developments, there's a design review panel. What, what does that mean removing them from that? Like, what are the contexts um, for the design review panel based on the, these changes? They seem to impact that panel the most, the way I read it. Through the chair to the councillor, I'm going to <clears throat> defer to Ken Coyne on that response. Thank you, Alana. Uh, through the chair, um, design review panel is continuing. The language in Bill 23 is not completely clear, uh, and we still have to test some of these ideas. Uh, there we are still able to speak to massing. Uh, we are still able to provide advice to, uh, to applicants about different ideas. There's sustainability related to different materials, percentage window openings. We expect that there will be um, upcoming changes to our terms of reference and standards to address Bill 23. So we still see the design review panel as an important part. 
as well, um, maybe not as much as part of site plan, but often for uh, OPAs and rezonings to inform things like massing, sun shadow, uh, general layout of the site and the building. So there's a lot of things for them still to comment on that aren't specifically related to the materials of the exterior or the detailed design of the exterior of the building that we would not be able to enforce as part of site plan. Thank you, the answer is that question. My second question is about uh, so-called character studies. And so I know that um, they have been done, <laughs> in short. Um, and I know that the city is paid to participate in some of these character studies. What's the status of a character study in the context of the, of the wording that I saw here today? Through the chair to the councillor, I'm also gonna defer that one to Ken. Through the chair. Um, so this has to do with the Heritage Act more than with site plan. Um, the register has been changed. Uh, the requirements for the register, it can now only be two years. So a lot of that character study work, I believe you're referring to the work that Alyssa Golden and others have done um, looking at heritage character across the city and, and things for the register and through Mr. Chairman to the Councillor. In respect to the work that was done, for example, in Durand, it was really to inform the zoning bylaw project in terms of that character study as it related to setbacks, massing, whether it's flat roofs are permitted or whether they should be uh, 612 pitch roofs, et cetera, et cetera. So in those opportunities, as we're working on updating the zoning bylaw, there are some, in some of those areas, there will be an opportunity to look at establishing specific zoning regulations to certain neighborhoods to reflect the built form and the character. For example, uh, the water down node, that area has specific zoning in that, that relates to the guides and informs the development of low dense single detached dwellings in terms of whether they have flat roofs or pitched roofs, the location of the garage, the garage door, et cetera, et cetera. So it's very design prescriptive in the water down node. Um, so, and through the zoning bylaw reform team, they recognize there are certain areas of the city that similar treatment may be appropriate as it relates to that, which through the zoning bylaw, which would essentially establish the the box in which you can develop, and what, the, but then the specifics of it, that's where we can't get into dealing with some of the more finer architectural elements. One of the opportunities, you know, we do have to differentiate, like you were asking about the DRP. They can provide advice to staff because they are not an approval authority on any of the matters that they see before them, especially if an applicant is seeking a rezoning application. We do have the opportunity, like we've done in some of the uh, suburban subdivisions, I'm thinking the Ropa 9 in particular, and some work in Waterdown, Waterdown Bay. Whereas a condition of draft plan approval, uh, block 16, pier seven and eight, I mean, it has the same condition where this applicant has to retain a control architect to ensure that the urban design guide, urban design guidelines that have been developed for that specific neighborhood, that, at, that when they're coming in for a building permit and their site plan, that the, at the applicant's expense, they need a control architect to say that the plans and drawings are consistent or comply with the urban design guidelines. And it can get even and get to, you know, you can't have two townhouse blocks side by side that are both blue. They will say, no, one has to be blue and one has to use red, and that's what the control architect requires, and that's a subdivision condition. I think the change here is where we have as of right zoning, and we used to rely on, like in Nancaster, the site plan process to implement the urban design guidelines. Where there's as of right zoning for a residential development, 100% residential development containing 10 or fewer units, we no longer have the ability to apply site plan to that development. If they're coming in for a rezoning or some other planning approval, even a minor variance, there is an opportunity to attach conditions to that. So a minor variance, you can attach a condition or through a rezoning, we could put it in a holding provision such that they would have to then extend, you know, a control architect, an urban design brief, et cetera, et cetera, as a condition of those planning approvals on a go forward basis and there'd have to, or sub, a subdivision. We would have to look at what's currently before us and whether or not we need to attach a holding provision to address those elements. The con as it's the other issues though, if somebody is somewhere like in Ang Wilson Street, they wanna do a nine unit multiple dwelling, then they're going straight to building permits, save and except for what's being recommended in the next report in terms of how we address some of those elements. So there will be, it's going to look very inconsistent in terms of the treatment and there will be some projects that'll go straight to a building permit and we have really li limited say because of following the zoning. There will be other projects where they need a planning approval from the municipality 
and we have a, uh, the opportunity to then impose certain conditions or requirements. So if they've negotiated something with the neighbors in terms of the roof design or the building design and they need a minor, as a condition, working through a minor variance issue, there's no reason to attack, not to attach those elevations to the variance. And if they deviate from that, those elevations, then they would lose those planning approvals. So that's one of the things that we're gonna have to go, look, uh, pay attention to on a go forward basis. For the purposes of today's presentation, it's really saying, what about those developments that are residential only, 10 units or less? How is the city going to deal with the necessary issues and concerns? So a lot of them were really we're putting in safeguards, whether environmental safeguards or engineering considerations. If we can't use a site plan process to respond to those issues, then we will have to put out a new process in place to respond to those issues on a go forward basis. So that's a lot of information I know, but we're, and in all municipalities in Ontario, they're all learning from each other and we are all trying to figure this out in terms of the best practice approach going forward. So I anticipate, you know, as, as we do a sort of a quality control, quality assurance and as on these measures, we may be back in front of committee with other suggestions or changes as to how we refine the process if we find out there's gaps there. Um, I think what Ms. for a lot of the case of the applicants, they're not happy because they feel lost in the process that site plan helped being that project management organizational tool, getting them through all the permitting. So they knew everything they had to do and they had one central point of contact. Now the applicant is essentially gonna be on their own trying to wade through this process. And I think we're gonna start getting a lot more calls and complaints because people will suddenly realize that they need six permits, but they don't know how to get those permits or how to resolve a conflict if you know, transportation planning wants the driveway on the left-hand side, but we need to put the driveway on the right-hand side from a stormwater management perspective. How do we deal with those conflicts? The applicant will then have to try to resolve that on their own, where previously the planner serves as that project manager would bring everyone together and say, okay, guys, what are we doing here? How are we gonna resolve this issue? So that's gonna be one of the other big changes. Sorry for a long-winded answer, but I was just trying to provide that clarification. And Ken was right, we still have that other level of protection for designated properties or the heritage districts that in some cases like, uh, the beach neighborhood or Durand or some of the other neighborhoods have districts which have another special layer of protection to deal with heritage related design issues. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Chief Planner. Councillor? My question still remains about character. So I guess the question I'd like to understand more, more, more in a, it's not a philosophical way, but like, that word being in the context of this conversation is going to cause a lot of, um, I would say, um, the opposite of clarity, but confusion, <laughs> which clearly I am right now, confused. So it's gonna create some confusion. And I think that um, in the specific context of that word, I guess I wanna know just like what, what I know it's unclear, because we talked about the fact that Bill 23 is not very clear and Ken made that point, which is very helpful. Um, you know, it's not super clear. That's already the problem we have. <laughs> but in the context of what clarity we do have, I just want to understand, does that mean, um, I'll give a ex concrete example so we can just tighten this up briefly. Uh, there's a lot, the lot can fit nine units on it. Um, the lot, it's in an, an area where, where people may be concerned about the character of the area, broadly. Um, site control process won't allow for considerations around character because it's 10 units or less. Is that, I, like, that basic understanding follow or is there some piece I'm missing? Through the chair, that's correct, Councillor Grosch. We wouldn't have the ability to control materials on that, except as Director Robichaud's noted, through zoning, so just the box that the building's in, or if there was a special heritage um, character zone there that would allow us to speak to those kind of things through a heritage permit process. And, and through the chair, if I, if I could add, maybe just an illustrative example would help. So um, situation in, in the lower city, six unit infill project, through the zoning aspects of character, such as consistent setback from the street as its neighbors, a height that's generally consistent with its neighbors, but that's part of character. Those are zoning elements. Um, but when we've dealt with these projects in the past, we might also look at materiality. We might look at, you know, peak versus flat roofs. These types of things become more problematic to address without the site plan process. So I realize this conversation about character is difficult, but it's because character is such a 
broad term in terms of what it means. Um, I guess if I could try to sort of distill it down to sort of a um, sort of a simple differentiation, when we talk about the massing of a building, where it's located on the lot, how tall, how deep, how far back, those parts of character, that's more of a zoning matter. So there's still tools to control those aspects. It's when you get into the finer grade details of, of materials and architectural details and those sorts of things become much more difficult to address uh, without site plan. Noting, of course, Ken's very good point that th these new words in the Planning Act are untested in terms of what exactly is within their purview and not. Through Chair Danko, it just, I guess you, you've answered my point. So in terms of the very plannerish type ways we think about characters, you talked about setbacks and other kinds of things, cool. But for the ones that the people most materially will care about or understand the word character to actually mean, that's where we're gonna have some more difficulty. Through the chair, yes, yeah, sort of those aesthetic qualities of character um, without site plan control become a much more difficult, um, uh, or, or frankly, it's a conversation that just doesn't get had in the planning process at this point. Thanks, I just really wanted to highlight that for anyone listening that that's the distinction here. Um, so they understood that the different layers of the word character, because I know that I will receive um, chats about this, which is fine, I'm happy to have those chats, but I just want to make sure I understood it and that everybody else understood, hey, this is the landscape for what character means in this context. Appreciate the responses, thank you. Thank you, Councillor. I think Niagara-on-the-Lake may be getting a big, fugly McDonald's. <laughs> <laughs> Councillor Wang. Thank you. Through you, Chair. Um, thank you, um, Planner Fulford. I would, wanted to ask about commercial properties and how does this potentially may or may not fit in with commercial properties? And as a supplement to that, I think about Ward 4. Ward 4 has a lot of commercial properties on the first floor and then residential units above. <clears throat> and if I look at this, the way I read it is that those types of properties with the commercial aspect of it, those are absolutely properties that are 10 units or less. Um, and there's a mix between those two. So I'd just like to understand that a little bit better. Through the chair to the councillor, yes, the commercial component and commercial is subject to the site plan control. Um, my response would be that, um, you know, the, the full building would be subject to that review and obviously um, the discussion around the exterior design is specific to any uh, type of built form. Um, is there something further that Ken you would like to add in terms of the multi-use? Through, through the chair, um, our anticipation is that mixed use would still be subject to site plan. Okay. That answers my question, thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Spadafora. Thank you, Chair Danko. Um, just looking for some clarity on the site plan. So prior to Bill 23, if you were building a house in Ward 14, if you bought a house and tore some down, if there was an infill, was there site plan control in Ward 14 or Ward 6 or Ward 9? Through you, Chair. Through the chair to the councillor, uh, like a single detached, a duplex, a semi-detached would not be subject to site plan control unless there was a core area adjacency to that. Um, otherwise, there were the two area-based uh, requirements uh, for that type of uh, development. Okay, thank you for that answer and through you, Chair. So the only place we're losing site plan control. Is Ancaster and Beach Boulevard? On those specific items you just talked about, a single family, a semi, a duplex, those were not under site control even previous to Bill 23, correct? Through the chair to the councillor prior to Bill 23, unless there was a special exemption that required it, um, and those are the area-based ones or the feature-based ones that I've discussed, that type of development was not subject to site plan control. Unless, through you, Chair, it was Ancaster or the beach area. Through the chair to the councillor, Ancaster, the beach area adjacent to a core area. Perfect, thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, any further discussion from committee? Uh, I'm gonna add myself to the speaker's list, so Councillor Wang, if you just take the chair. Go ahead. 
Uh, just a question on the green standards and then a question on Beach Boulevard. So on green standards, I believe that we currently don't have green standards, but we were perhaps working towards some green standards through the Climate Change Action Plan. Am I remembering that correctly? So uh, so through the chair, I, I would say we, we do have green standards today in place in the form of various policies of our official plan and secondary plan, um, but we did commit to doing updated site plan guidelines that would incorporate green standards through the site plan <coughs> control process. Um, so that's work that, uh, that Ken and his team will bring forward uh, uh, later this year. Okay, thank you. Sure. And then on, on the green standards, I, I'm not sure I understand the provisions of the actual bill that the green standards cannot be more restrictive than the building code because the building code is a minimum standard. So anything that's in addition to the building code would be in excess of the building code because the building code is the absolute minimum that you can build to. So I guess I'm confused at what kind of wiggle room we would actually have there for anything meaningful. So through the chair, it's a very good question. Um, and I'm not gonna give you a definitive answer because I think this is a bit of an area of uncertainty in terms of what those new parameters of site plan control mean. Um, my sense is what was probably being thought of by the province and putting that in there is that cities would not put in place in effect their own building code uh, in terms of all of the matters that, that the code deals with. Um, but there are potentially areas where through, through design elements of a project, you could contribute to environmental performance, that is areas outside the code. Um, those may be areas that we can continue to look at through site plan control. But, but I say all that with the caveat that it is unclear. Um, and um, it, you know, it, it, it's not just Hamilton that's kind of wrestling to try to understand what these authorities mean and what they, and what they don't mean. Okay, thank you. And then there is work continuing on that currently. Thank you. Um, and then just on, on, on the Beach Boulevard portion, I see that Councillor Francis is, is now on the beach. Um, if I recall, the, the purpose of the site plan that was on Beach Boulevard specifically was in response to overland flooding. And there was a portion there where we were pumping water and, and there was, you know, when the lake levels were higher. Um, so I, I might be venturing into the next report of, of how we're gonna actually you know, maintain some of those controls, but it, it seems like that in particular is one area where it was very important to have site plan control where we're now losing it, and there is very good reasons that have a direct um, impact on quality of life and, and, and property in that area. Yes, and, and uh, to the chair, that is uh, one of the items that is addressed in the next report. Okay. Uh, because yes, we have to find a process to uh, replace what has been lost through site plan control. Okay, thank you. So I'll take the chair back. Uh, if there's no further questions, we need a mover and a seconder to receive the, uh, the staff presentation. Moved by Councillor Spadafora, seconded by Councillor Wang. All in favor? Oh, who left and came back? Uh, Councillor Kassar can second. The vote came up. We're doing of the thing.
And that's carried unanimous, thank you. Uh, as this is a, uh, a public meeting, are there any members of, um, this is correct? Yeah. I'm going through this, yeah. yeah. Are there any mem members of the public that wish to speak to the uh, changes to the Planning Act due to removal of site plan control? Seeing none, that's once. Any members of the public, twice. And anyone that wants to speak to this, third time. So I need a mover in a sector that there were no public submissions received regarding this matter and that the public meeting is closed. Moved by Councillor Crutch, seconded by Councillor Spadafora. Thank you. Not your fault, clerk, and we appreciate uh, trying to work through it the best we can. Manual vote. Okay, so this is on uh, closing the public meeting that there is no public. So Councilor McMeekin, Councilor Wilson, Councilor Francis are in favor. Everyone in the room, Councillor Beattie, Councillor Kassar, Councillor Wayne, Councillor Kretsch, Councillor Spadafora, Councillor Tattison, and myself. Unanimous. And then, mover and a seconder to approve the report recommendations. Moved by Councillor Spadafora, seconded by Councillor Francis. Manual vote. I see everyone in the room is in favor, and Councillor McMeekin, Councillor Wilson, and Councillor Francis on the screen are also in favor, so that is unanimous. Thank you. Okay, on to 10.8 City Review of Residential Developments Exempted from Site Plan Control by Bill 23. Uh, we do have a staff presentation from Binu Cora. I'm just gonna assume that we, we all like to see the staff presentation, yes. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and members of council, staff and public who are viewing this presentation. I am Binu Koira, Director of Development Engineering, Growth Management. Thank you for allowing the staff to present the report, PED 23045. Mr. Chair, the committee had discussed the previous report, PED 23043, with regards to the implementation changes uh, to Selection 4.1 of the Planning Act 
and site plan approval in response to Provincial Bill 23, More Homes Built Faster Act. As such, I am not uh, be discussing the Bill 23 in detail. Rather, I will be concentrating on new process uh, to support the city services and reduce impact to the surrounding residents. As Ms. Uh, Alena Fulford explained previously, development of 10 or less residential units on a lot is no longer subject to site plan control process. Site plan control process provided an efficient and coordinated review process and ensured good planning practices in accordance with the Planning Act and the city standards. It allowed consultation with the city divisions and external agencies and was helpful in coordinating multiple permits and approvals. As a result of Bill 23, several matters that would typically be addressed through site plan control can no longer be applied due to the exemption. Staff reviewed the current process and identify matters that should be taken into consideration to determine the process modifications required to reduce any risk to the city due to exemptions. It can be categorized into four. The matters that still require city approvals or permits, notwithstanding the exemption, that is example, the service connections, Matters, if not addressed, could create risk to the city, to neighbors, to adjacent development, or to the community. So examples such as grading and stormwater management. The matters that can be addressed through the building permit application process. And number four, the matters that are not subject to applicable law under the building code and remain enforceable under applicable city bylaws. Having identified the matters that needs to be dealt with the staff, looked into the application process and any modifications that are required to mitigate the risk. Now I want to explain the process, how city is planning to accept the application for developments within one to 10 units if committee consider the staff recommendations. Four applications within one to two units, the existing building permit process will follow. There are no changes proposed in the current process. The proposal for one to two units within the existing residential ER zone in Ancaster and on Beach Boulevard in Hamilton are now exempt from the site plan process and they could go directly to building division to submit the building permit application. For applications with the three to 10 units, the applicant will be required to submit a zoning compliance review application to the planning division in accordance with the zoning bylaw 05200. Further, the applicant also must obtain water and sewer permit from growth management as per applicable city bylaws prior to submitting the building permit application. Now I would like to discuss the water and sewer permit engineering review process. For water and sewer permit process, the applications are reviewed under the city zoning bylaw 05200 and other zoning bylaw pursuant to bylaw 09-297, which are applicable law under the building code. These require that all buildings must have adequate services in place, including connections to municipal water sewer services or approved alternative solutions. The Planning Act explicitly permits municipal zoning bylaw to restrict development unless municipal services are available. The city's waterworks bylaw R84-026 as amended, and sewers and drain bylaw 06026 as amended, regulate the installation, connection, and use of 
municipal water and sewer services within the city of Hamilton and require that all type of development must obtain water and sewer permit and excavation permit from the city to connecting uh, to the municipal system. As such, nothing will stand the site plan exemption for 10 units or less consistent with the city's zoning bylaws, building permits may not be issued until the applicant has obtained a water and sewer permit and excavation per permit from growth management. I just wanted to take you through some scenarios on how we are actually going to deal with the water and sewer permit process and requirement to help the applicant. For three to 10 units, staff is recommending that the applicant submit a functional servicing report. The functional servicing report has to demonstrate how they will be servicing the site that includes water, storm, sanitary, grading details, impact to the surrounding properties, and condition, uh, as a condition assessment of the right-of-way in front of the subject property. The applicant also has to submit the servicing drawings to illustrate the details. Staff also proposing an engineering fees to complete this review. As part of the engineering review, it is important actually for the city to make sure that the proposed development is not negatively impacting the surrounding lands, such as causing flooding, driveway locations, and the right-of-way impacts, including street trees, utilities, fire hydrants, bus pads, and shelters. At this time, I would like to bring committee's attention on three different type of ap applications we may receive in this regard. You may have to assume a scenario that 10 townhouse units are fronting onto an arterial road or city local street that requires 10 driveways, three service connection per unit, uh, that, uh, uh, per unit, that is total of about 30 service connections has to be built, utility company has to bring all the utilities through the boulevard to service the site. So if you look at uh, scenario one, if there is enough capacity within the city existing infrastructure and there are no impacts with the utilities within the right of way, we could proceed with issuing the water and sewer permit and excavation permit in accordance with the city bylaws. So once we issued the zoning compliance review and also the water and sewer permit, the scenario one could proceed to the building permit application. In the second scenario, there is sufficient capacity within the existing infrastructure to support the development, but there, are, there may be impacts to the utilities. In this case, the applicant has to connect with the utility companies and enter into an agreement with the, with the utility companies. The utility company has to obtain a permit from Public Works in accordance with the Municipal Access Agreement to complete the relocation works. Once the applicant submit all the necessary documents, the growth management will proceed to issuing the water and sewer permit and excavation permit in accordance with the city bylaws. However, if there is, there is an impact to the city assets, such as street trees, street lights, fire hydrant, or bus pads, staff is actually proposing that the applicant enter into a development agreement with the city to relocate the affected uh, street furniture. Once city execute the agreement and obtain the securities from the applicant, growth management can issue the water and sewer permit in accordance with the applicable bylaws, and the applicant can submit the building permit application to building department. The third scenario, the third scenario says, for example, there is no capacity in the system or no services are available. The applicant has an option to enter into a development agreement with the city to complete the work at their cost. Once the agreements are in place, growth management could issue the water and sewer permit and applicant can submit the building permit applications. And we have a couple of project, uh, project like this uh, at the moment. 
So I would like to bring it to the committee's attention some of the site servicing challenges due to Bill 23. Staff has reviewed this list and city may not be able to request the applicant to address these concerns as part of the building permit process. Some of these are trees within the private property, we just talked about that, sidewalk extension, noise wall, waste collections, security to protect municipal road damages, urban design and landscaping. Under the Planning Act, the city can require that uh, right-of-way dedication be dedicated to the municipality as a condition of site plan, consent or subdivision. However, for these developments which are now exempt from the site plan control as a result of Bill 23, there is no clear means to compel and protect right-of-way dedication requirements. As a result, the protection of corridor for future streets, streetscaping, transportation, and utilities needs may be at risk as the right-of-way dedication cannot be obtained through the building permit application process. Landscaping issues would only be considered through a zoning review in terms of planning strips or screening elements. The properties in Heritage uh, Conservation District will require a heritage permit that may have requirements for the urban design and landscaping. Staff is also proposing to amend bylaw 15-091 or any other applicable bylaws to include a municipal road damage deposit, which is a written and financial commitment from a property owner to submit a deposit with the city as a guarantee against the damage to the curbs, sidewalks, road, boulevard, and other city services located in the municipal road elements, as well as the cleanup of the adjoining streets. So in order for staff to process the water and sewer permit process, for the three to 10 units, staff uh, recommended uh, for the committees to cons uh, com committee's consideration an engineering fees uh, of 6,975 for first two submissions and an additional fee of 1,500 for each subsequent submission. Staff is also recommend, uh, recommending that the user fees be waived for charitable and not pro for profit organizations, proposing affordable housing consistent with the similar plan planning application fees exemptions granted for the same form of development. The, applicant, uh, the application process to qual qualify for the fee exemption will be administered in accordance with the criteria set out in the council adopted staff report uh, 16098. The notice of proposed uh, charges to the tariff of fees bylaws was ad uh, advertised in the Hamilton Spectator on January 26, 2023. So through you, Mr. Chair, there are four recommendations in, fr in front of the committee for your consideration. At this time, thank you for listening uh, to the presentation. I would like to thank the co-authors uh, co of this report as well. The directors from various divisions were involved in preparing this report, and we are happy to answer any questions you may have on this matter. Thank you. Thank you, Binu. Um, open the floor for questions from committee? I'm not seeing any, so if there are no questions, I'll put myself on the speaker's list. I, I do have a couple of questions. Thank you, Councillor Wang. Uh, so there's, there's a couple things that stand out here to me of being fairly significant future issues. The first one is ensuring that the capacity of the existing infrastructure uh, is sufficiently upgraded when that's necessary. And that the only, if I'm understanding right, the only time where we will have an opportunity to catch that is once it gets to the building permit stage. So are, are there, I, I guess help me to understand to make sure that we're, we're gonna be 
sufficiently, you know, um, keeping keeping uh, development paying for growth, paying for growth, that we're going to, you know, when there are upgrades required, that they're going to actually be responsible and have to pay for that. Director Cora. Through you, uh, Madam Chair, uh, to the Councillor. Uh, in, so, the, the, uh, you know, as per my presentation, the, uh, the first, uh, the applicant actually has to approach the, uh, they have to complete the zoning compliance review, and also they have to uh, get the water and sewer permit. That's the first step in the process. So as part of the process, the applicant actually has to demonstrate, is there any capacity constraints? If there is any capacity constraints, we have to go through the analysis, and if you find any constraints, uh, the applicant actually has to upgrade the system to the satisfaction of the city. Okay, so notwithstanding that it's no longer part of the site plan process, there's still a control in place as a permitting control. Okay. Correct. Um, the second thing that really stood out is the right of way dedication that we're at risk of losing control over the right of way on smaller developments, uh, especially for some of our evolving corridors that uh, are identified, for example, on the, on the blast rapid transit network, or if I, you know, are undergoing you know, environmental assessments right now, uh, the, which would require an upgrade to our current complete streets design guide. So if we're at risk of losing control over right-of-way dedications, that can have really significant long-term impacts on our future plans for those corridors. So uh, there is some discussion in the presentation. I'm not sure if, if staff are able to elaborate on that. Our Director Cora first, or anybody? Director so, Hollingwood? Or? Uh, so through the Chair, um, <laughs> yes, and that's frankly why, why, why we flighted on that list of, of issues that without the uh, ability to do that through site plan control, that is a risk. Uh, and just to clarify, I know we always call it road right of way. Um, sometimes it is for roadway, but this is also for, you know, um, winding sidewalks, landscape strips, so so it's really about sort of the public realm. Uh, it may not be for actual sort of vehicle lanes, which I know right. is what people think about when they hear the word road right of way. Um, I will say we, we're, and I'll, I'll maybe let Brian elaborate on this, we are kind of looking at what some of the strategies might be around that, where we have um, corridors where we, knew, where we know we do want to sort of um, have some sort of dedication or setbacks or something like that in order to accommodate some of these. Through the chair, uh, Brian Hollyworth, Director of Transportation Planning and Parking. Um, we, we, we do fully recognize this issue, and as you mentioned, there are some possibilities where we uh, need the right of way for various purposes, particularly on the blast corridors, and may lose those opportunities. Having said that, uh, these, are, these are really three to ten units, and if you take like a Rymel Road, a lot of them would have access off. Off, uh, off the side streets, which is good. We looked at a simple method, um, just a minimum setback from the center line of the road to make sure we at least protect for the typical right-of-ways for an arterial collector. Um, it becomes pretty problematic when you look at streets like Lock Street, Ottawa Street. Setting a minimum setback just doesn't make sense, so a one-size-fits-all solution could not be found at this time. I would note that this, um, through previously approved budgets, uh, our group transportation planning and parking is currently uh, well into a road right-of-way and classification study, building on the complete streets process, where we envision to have a map and schedule of the right-of-ways for every street in the city of Hamilton. That will then could form a really good basis for bolstering up our, our position on this issue. Thank you. Thank you. and and. Presuming that there, if there is an issue with right-of-way dedication that's flagged, uh, which, uh, sounding from the response, there, there is mapping and, and ways to do that, um, how is then that controlled? Like, what, what authority then do we still have to ensure that those dedications are actually implemented? Uh, through the chair, the, the current um, thinking on the approach is it would be similar to the official plan where it has Schedule C2, which lists a lot of the, the right-of-ways for the city street. It's not a complete listing, but it would emulate that process, but through the zoning bylaw. 
Okay. So, you know, the, just to comment on that, Councillor Wang, I mean, the, the specific example I'm thinking of some of the minor arterials like Rymel or Stone Church that have large estate lots that are being redeveloped, a lot of them would be 10 units or less. And the risk is if, if we're not diligent or if we miss a couple and, you know, 10 years from now when we decide we want to actually implement the, the BLAST network, then we end up having to expropriate some development that was you know, mistakenly approved without a right of way dedication in this brief period of time while Bill 23 is in effect. Um, maybe I'm being optimistic. So just, just one, one final comment, um, Chair Wang. My overall impression, you know, through the presentation that we had and, and the previous presentation is that you know, the whole intent of Bill 23 was to simplify the development application process, you know, the cut red tape. But it seems in reality that, that f how this is going to function is the exact opposite to what the province seems to be intending. Because from what I'm seeing is, is the processes by necessity now are somewhat more complex, less defined, and are put a lot more onus on the applicant to, you know, kind of figure it out themselves without the guidance and the assistance that they would have had previously. Which, in the end, seems like it, this is the exact opposite of cutting red tape. So I guess we'll we'll figure that out <laughs> because we have no choice. Uh, but just in general, I mean, we can't just you know, forget a, the site plans don't exist, that these requirements don't exist. These are very important for us as a city to make sure that we grow responsibly. Um, and it's just, you know, again, I guess, uh, I think it was Director Coit said there's a lack of clarity. <laughs> anyway, I'll take the chair back. And uh, we do have a speaker's list. Councillor Spatafora. Thank you, Chair. Um, and just a question. I believe it was on slide five. I just want confirmation. So the second part of your um, presentation talks to units from up from three to 10. So the units from one to two, do they still fall through the same process? From what I can understand, I just want to confirm one to two units do not go through the same process as three to 10. Three, Mr. Chair, yes. So they would go directly to a building permit process or do they still need zoning verification and the uh, wastewater verification or review? I think through the chair, um, Alan Shaw, director of building, CBO. Um, the requirement or the standard is still the same for one or two units. Uh, how we get there is gonna be a little different because we're obviously adjusting for the ER zones. Um, the requirement for applicable law, the requirement for zoning compliance, and the requirement for servicing uh, permits would still apply. Yes. Is your microphone on? I'm not sure. Okay. There you go. Good catch. Uh, thank you for that. So, and what I'm trying to get to is uh, before we had, um, I guess, two parts of the city that kind of operate in their own world that needed site plan. This current process through this report will bring us to pretty much a standardized um, approach across the city, is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. Perfect, and last question on fees. Do the fees, are the fees um, high enough to make sure that, I know for uh, talking to GM Thorne, it's, uh, you know, we're, we recover all the costs we put out from a staffing perspective, and I just want to make sure that, uh, you know, we're doing that. And, you know, I don't know that we, what I'm trying to say or without saying, I don't want to be on the lower end as opposed to the higher end, as it sounds like this becomes more work and more departments. Um, and I think we saved some work previously. So I just want to make sure we're catching everything in that review. Thanks. Through you, Mr. Chair, to the councillor. We did a, a quick analysis and understand actually the proposed fees should be sufficient at this time, but we are not sure how many applications actually may going to receive. And if uh, we need additional fees, actually we'll be coming back 
to the end of the year and, and asking for additional fees. Thank you. Councillor? So, good. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Beatty. Thank you, Chair. There's a, a common theme that seems to be coming through here. More questions than answers and uh, more work, not less, seems to be my takeaway so far. So thank you, BNU, for uh, this uh, presentation and, and all the work to planning staff have put into this. BNU, on, on page nine of your presentation, um, there were some concern, areas of concern that uh, were highlighted. I pulled out four. Uh, that I just wanted to drill down on a little further, if you wouldn't mind. Um, and I think two are pretty easy to uh, to get some understanding. Number one, road damage. I'm guessing this pertains to road cuts in existing uh, street streets. Um, if we're undertaking um, an infill development or something like that, is that is that accurate? When we're talking about road damage and curb damage, that's the road cuts to change some of the underground infrastructure. Through Mr. Chair to the councillor, yes, that's correct. The second one, um, uh, you you listed uh, waste collection there, and I'm wondering, is this pertaining to site cleanup after the fact, or was this a different level of waste collection that was noted? Through Mr. Chair to the councillor, this is the waste collection um, done by our waste management group. So they cannot actually go and collect the waste. Normally, if it is going through a site plan process, in the site plan process, it will be identified a particular uh, space actually for the waste collection. But through the building permit process, we cannot actually ask uh, that service. Uh, so I believe actually maybe uh, Director of yeah, so, so through the chair, and, and this is one that, that the waste group is actively looking at. So as Binu said, through the site plan process, waste is one of the groups that gets circulated, and they look and make sure that the vehicles can back up and move around and do what they need to do to collect the waste. And if they cannot, it, the project would not be eligible for public waste collection. Um, so without the ability to do that through site plan, um, not sure yet that what the process will be if you're looking to ensure that you qualify for public waste collection. Um, without site plan, we don't really have a mechanism for circulating waste for their review and comment. So that's why BNU flagged that as one of the question marks in terms of how we address one of those things that was kind of as a, frankly, as, a, as an efficiency dealt with through the site plan process. We now don't have a mechanism for doing that for these smaller projects. Councillor? Thank you. And through you, Chair, then it's foreseeable or possible under this new regulatory framework that um, future development could be negatively impacted in terms of basic, basic things like waste collection. There may be no way for them to participate in, in public waste collection as a result of this through the lack of site plan uh, approvals. Uh, through the chair, uh, yes, because there's no mechanism for them to circulate to waste, for waste to review it and make sure that they're comfortable with the design and layout uh, for waste collection. So, so to your question, yes. Okay. Thank you. Through you, Chair. Um, the uh, issue that was highlighted there, uh, sidewalk extension, Binu, um, I'm guessing that that is, sorry, I shouldn't guess. I'll maybe ask for a further explanation as to uh, what the concern is specifically around sidewalk extensions. Through Mr. Chair to the councillor. So as part of the site plan process, we have the ability to ask for the sidewalk, uh, sidewalk extension. Um, previously, if there is no sidewalk actually in front of their property, uh, the applicant actually has to extend the sidewalk or we could actually take a cash in lieu uh, for the sidewalk. But in accordance with the Bill 23, now it's directly going to uh, building department. City won't be able to actually ask that service. Sorry. Through you, Chair. Um, I, I just want to verify what I think the answer was, and thank you for the answer. It's very straightforward. But I'm, I'm cycling this back through uh, my own reality, the own lived reality in my ward. We have a problem with lack of connectivity between sidewalks already. We have sidewalks that begin and end and go nowhere and don't connect anything to anyone. It's all throughout Ward 10, through Stony Creek, Fruitland, and Winona. And currently, we do have a process where we could try to address this, but these changes are going to make it more difficult to address the connectivity issues within our existing uh, neighborhoods. Is that an accurate statement? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, yes, that's correct. 
wow. Um, my last question being new through you, Chair Danko, uh, noise walls. Uh, my assumption would be we're talking about something, again, that has a direct impact on my community. Uh, we've got the QEW that basically cuts through the heart of Ward 10. We have uh, noise walls, noise barriers on either side of the QEW that uh, try to minimize the impact. Is this what we're talking about, something similar to this in terms of noise walls? Through you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chair, to the Councillor. Uh, you know, same thing actually as part of the site plan process, we were able to actually ask for the noise wall, but however, as part of the Bill 23, uh, it's directly going into the um, into the uh, uh, building department. We won't be able to actually ask for that uh, a noise wall. I think uh, Mr. Jason Thorne actually wanted to. Yes, and through the chair, I should maybe just add both to the noise wall issue and the sidewalk issue and some of these other ones, where there was an upstream approval. So if it was already going through a plan of subdivision process, for example, so um, you know, so many of the applications you would refer to have gone through a plan of subdivision. Some of these things we can address through conditions at draft plan stage, um, if they are going through a draft plan uh, of subdivision. So um, just want to sort of leave that glimmer of hope maybe uh, with, with planning committee that where there are other planning approvals and planning instruments required, there may be opportunities to secure some of these things that we're talking about, right of way dedications, noise walls, et cetera. Um, the, probably the more problematic ones will be the ones that are more in an infill context, straight to site plan. Uh, there was no plan of subdivision for the project. Um, those will be the ones that will be probably most difficult to secure some of these things that we're talking about. Final question through you, Chair Danko. Um, recommendation A uh, in your report, Binu, um, makes reference to, I think that this is kind of a remedial response in order for the city to try to regain some of its control uh, as it pertains to damage to curb, sidewalk, road, boulevard. Um, have I got that correct, that recommendation A is something that is being proposed so that we're able to address some of these risks or concerns? Through you, Chair. Three, Mr. Chair, that's correct, Councillor. My final question to my final question then, um, I don't see anything that addresses some of the other issues pertaining to waste collection, sidewalk extension, noise wall, for example. Uh, are they highlighted somewhere else in any of the other recommendations? Did I miss it or are they uh, kind of remaining unaddressed? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair. I know those ones, the, the ones actually listed as an issue, we cannot actually uh, deal with that this time. Um, I believe as um, Brian Hollyworth actually explained, the uh, road right, uh, sorry, the road right away dedications and other components are actually under review by uh, planning and transportation planning. So we will be bringing back, I believe there is another report to deal with those issues. I think, General Manager? Yeah, so through you, Mr. Chair, this, the, you, you may think of this as probably the first report. We're continuing to look at some of these issues. We don't necessarily have specific strategies in mind yet to deal with some of these issues. Recommendation A was flagging that one particular one where we think there may be an opportunity through amendments in the future to that bylaw to address. Um, I know Ken spoke earlier about um, tree preservation and through the urban forest strategy, are we going to look at a bylaw for protection of trees on private property as a possible way of, of um, uh, filling a bit of gap that's been created here? So we are going to continue to look at what some of the issues might be fully within the spirit of trying to make sure that we are being very efficient and streamlined and supportive of these smaller scale residential projects happening and happening quickly. Um, we don't want to lose sight of that. Um, but we do have some further work to do around some of these other potential gaps um, that either create potential risk for the city or frankly potential risk for the applicants. Um, you know, an applicant doesn't want to get deep down the path of doing a development project and then find out they aren't eligible for waste collection. Um, so we want to make sure that we're kind of putting in place whatever processes we can to, to, to do that. That'll conclude my questions, but I will have a comment at the appropriate time. I've got no further speakers, so if you have a comment, so this is the appropriate time. I, I highlight these four issues, the waste collection, road cuts, noise walls, sidewalk extensions. These are some of the top issues right now that my, my office is fielding calls and concerns from residents on. And uh, as we 
as a new council are, are constantly trying to find ways to improve our, our delivery and, and uh, address the issues in our community. I see this highlighting that we're theoretically heading in the wrong direction when it comes to these particular issues. And I'm trying not to make this all about Ward 10, but I look at these four issues and these have major implications for the, the Stony Creek, Winona, Fruitland communities. And um, I'm going to be uh, watching this very closely and I'm thankful for the report and look forward to future reports coming back and trying to find creative solutions for these. Uh, this is not heading in the right direction. Thank you, Councillor. And uh, Ward 10, Provincial Representative in the Governing Party, Mr. Neil Lumsden, MPP Lumsden. Perhaps your constituents, you could just forward the emails to them. Thank, Thank you, you Binu. So I do need a mover and a seconder to receive the staff presentation, moved by Councillor Beatty, seconded by Councillor Tattison. All in favor or opposed, if we have the grace of <laughs> the scribe. has come up for me. Councillor McMeekin, are you able to indicate? That is unanimous. Thank you. Uh, again, as this is a public meeting, I need to go to members of the public that may wish to speak to this. This is uh, site plan control issues with Bill 23. Are there any members of the public present that wish to speak to this? Seeing none. Uh, second time, any members of the public? Nope. And a third and final time, any members of the public that wish to speak to item 10.8? Seeing none. So I need a mover and a seconder that there were no public submissions received regarding this matter and that the public meeting is closed. Moved by Councillor Beatty, seconded by Councillor Tattison. Great success. Uh, carries, thank you, that's unanimous. And then finally, move and a seconder to approve the report recommendations. Moved by Councillor Beatty, seconded by Councillor Tattison. All in favor or opposed? <laughs> Councillor McMeekin, thank you. That is approved unanimous, thank you. On to item 11, discussion items. Item 11.1, .1, the municipal housing pledge. Does the committee wish to see the staff presentation? I would. <laughs> thank you, Christine. <coughs>
Okay, thank you. Uh, good morning, or good afternoon, Chair, members of committee, and uh, any staff, mem or staff members and, and public who are on WebEx. Uh, my name is Christine Newbold. I'm the manager of sustainable communities section in the planning division, and I'm going to provide you with a short presentation on the municipal housing pledge report. Uh, but I do want to mention one thing uh, quickly. Uh, today we received a letter from the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing extending the deadline for receiving the housing pledge, uh, extending it to March 22nd. However, we're going to proceed today um, with, with uh, this report as the um, planning committee and council schedule wouldn't allow us to um, may do a March 22nd deadline if we did choose to delay. So a bit of background, um, uh, last October the province launched More Homes Built Faster, Ontario's Housing Supply Action Plan to 2022. Uh, the More Homes Built Faster is the province's plan to facilitate construction of 1.5 million homes over the next 10 years. To implement the province's plan, Bill 23 was passed, amending several pieces of provincial legislation and associated regulations to remove barriers to building housing in Ontario. Concurrent with those postings, uh, the province issued a bulletin, the 2031 Municipal Housing Targets Bulletin, which assigned near-term housing targets to specific municipalities in Ontario. 29, 29 lower and single-tier municipalities in southern Ontario, including Hamilton, were assigned targets for the 2021 to 2031 time period. Housing targets were based on current population and 2011 to 2021 housing trends in the largest and fastest growing census areas of Ontario for those municipalities with a population of 100,000 or greater. The target for the city of Hamilton is 47,000 new housing units by 2031. The Municipal Housing Targets Bulletin and the accompanying letter from the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing, which you have attached uh, to the staff report, asks the City of Hamilton to demonstrate its commitment to accelerating housing supply by developing a Municipal Housing Pledge and taking necessary steps to facilitate construction of 47,000 uh, units, homes. And that pledge is due at the province um, now on March 22nd. A bit about the pledge and planning for housing. So the growth plan for the Greater Golden Horseshoe identifies population forecasts to 2051, and those forecasts are used by municipalities for planning and managing growth. For population and forecasts for the 2021-31 time period, uh, for Hamilton, we have 62,000 persons and 36,000 households projected. Uh, those forecasts are included in both the urban and rural Hamilton official plans and were established through the ministry's approved OPA 167, uh, Hamilton's Municipal Comprehensive Review Official Plan Amendment. Land use policies within the Urban Hamilton Official Plan establish the distribution of growth and land use permissions required to achieve the forecasted growth, and the zoning bylaws implement the policies by establishing a more detailed permission and requirements for development and must comply with the policies of the Official Plan. So the pledge target does not replace the growth plan targets, uh, nor do the targets in the Official Plan. Um, and is a non, it's a non-statutory and non-binding target that's been presented to us. So planning decisions will continue to be evaluated and reviewed through our existing and in effect official plans and zoning bylaws. Oops. Oh dear. So Hamilton is asked to achieve 40,000 units by 2031, and that's 11,400 more than the target within our official plans. So meeting this target requires moving from a, a yearly average of, of 3,500 to 4,700 units per year to 2031. Achieving uh, this additional housing will be a challenge. However, the city has been diligently planning for intensification, streamlining development approvals and reducing barriers to achieving development through intensification. And it's expected that the additional 11,400 units can be achieved within the former urban boundary and in accordance with our existing intensification policies in the official plan. 
Since amalgamation, Hamilton has been continually planning for intensification through the original grid growth strategy and the identification of a nodes and corridor structure as a framework for intensification, uh, continuing on with policy development for the urban Hamilton official plan and secondary planning work and pre-zoning of lands for intensification. We know the capacity for intensification in Hamilton is vast. Uh, 2021 analysis on the residential intensification supply was completed part of the GRIDS 2 Municipal Comprehensive Review uh, project and indicated a potential near-term supply within the existing built-up area of the city of 26,000 units. So that analysis looked at the conditions in key areas that would indicate a likelihood of uh, a property intensifying, vacant lot supply, existing policy and pre-zoning conditions, and development approvals at various stages were reviewed. There are, however, many more air sites and areas that could intensify and were not part of that analysis. And recent zoning initiatives in the city's residential areas have expanded that potential supply and are providing opportunities for intensification. Oh my goodness. So the city has prioritized intensification through several comprehensive zoning projects by pre-zoning lands to facilitate intensification. Our downtown zones, our transit-oriented corridor zones and commercial and mixed-use zones, all pre-zoned lands to facilitate greater heights and densities in nodes and corridors. Recent zoning initiatives in the city's neighborhood areas were undertaken to support higher rates of infill and intensification and are implementing OPA 167. Uh, the 2022 zoning uh, um, amendments removed exclusionary zoning in low density residential areas and are allowing a full range of low density built forms uh, to, be, to be built and also allowing conversions up to four units on a property. The enabling policies and these recent zoning changes have removed barriers to intensifying within existing residential areas. Additional work is being completed to allow for further permissions for purpose-built multiplexes, and through a citywide parking study, parking reductions are also being considered. Additional policy and planning initiatives to facilitate housing development are also being undertaken. Major transit station area planning is underway. Uh, MTSAs, as, as they're shortened to, are their areas designed to accommodate increased density over time and to support the LRT along the B line and changes to official plan designations and policies as well as zoning changes along the corridor may be implemented to permit those higher densities. The project will also identify protected major transit station areas, PMTSAs, where an inclusionary zone, zoning framework could apply, contributing to affordable housing in the community. The Family Friendly Housing Initiative is establishing policy and zoning to ensure housing suitable for larger households and households with children are, are provided in developments. And the Rental Housing Protection Policy Review is addressing conversions of primary rental housing to condominium tenure and demolitions of primary, uh, primary rental housing. These last two policy projects will establish greater clarity on expectations for future development and address important elements of housing need in the community, uh, that of appropriate unit sizes and the supply of rental housing. All the initiatives I've just discussed are listed on this slide, which is included in your staff report as Appendix C. These are planning division initiatives, uh, but there are other initiatives happening um, in, in other departments uh, to facilitate housing development too. I'll just go, uh, go over a few of those now for you. Hamilton is developing a housing sustainable sustainability and investment roadmap to respond to new and growing pressures along the housing continuum. The roadmap focuses on policies and procedures of, of the city that impact maintaining current supply, new development of, and acquisition of affordable housing, as well as supports to keep people housed. The key objective is to remove barriers, improve responsiveness and timelines within city divisions related to affordable housing construction, acquisition, and retention. 
The city also continues to review its own properties to identify opportunities that could facilitate a variety of needs on the housing continuum. A number of city-owned sites have been or are in the process of being disposed of for new affordable housing projects and in conjunction with master planning exercises and initiatives through the Municipal Land Development Office, sites are being examined for potential intensification for housing. And through various community improvement plan programs, the city continues to provide incentives for residential development. The city is also reviewing future opportunities for housing along the Beeline LRT corridor and using funding from federal and provincial partners to accelerate the development of housing. Programs that are being used include the Provincial Streamlining Development Approvals Fund, Ontario Priorities Housing Initiative, Canada Ontario Community Housing Initiative and the Rapid Housing Initiative. And a monitor program is also being established to track and progress, achieving, progress on achieving growth targets, affordability and housing goals and will include progress towards meeting this municipal housing pledge. Initiatives to reduce barriers to development have also been undertaken. Organizational changes, process improvements, and delegated authorities have been put in place to reduce timelines for reviewing applications and provide clear expectations for development application submissions um, so faster decisions on applications could be made. Policy and zoning revisions discussed on previous slides are providing clear expectations for development applications and as of right permissions, reducing the need for many zoning or official plan amendments. Initiatives and funding for upgraded infrastructure to support intensification are also enabling housing construction. While reducing barriers to help facilitate the achievement of the housing pledge, there, does, there do remain challenges. Responsibility for achieving the housing pledge target does not rest completely with the city. While the city has put in supportive policies and processes in place to support achievement of the 2031 housing target, ultimately it's the market that must build the housing. Market fluctuations and the state of the overall economy will have impacts on a developer's business case and influence both the type and scale of housing projects being proposed and the rate to which projects advance from approvals to construction. The supply of skilled labour in the construction industry will also impact the rate at which housing is constructed. But city building elements also play a role in creating a city where people want to live and contribute to the demand for housing. City building is a collaborative effort between city, residents, industries, businesses, institutions and government agencies to create elements that we all want in our city. Healthy natural built environments, parks, schools, community facilities, connected and vibrant neighbourhoods, supportive infrastructure, including transportation and transit, social development networks and economic opportunities. While city building itself can be challenging, it will be important to have continued success in the community on these elements. Finally, going forward, meeting the challenge put forth by the province to build 47,000 units by 2031 will require continuous improvement, collaboration with all stakeholders and creativity and innovation in our approaches, processes and policies. To end, I just want to recap the staff recommendation. Staff are recommending that the draft housing pledge attached as, as attachment B to the staff report be endorsed as Hamilton's housing pledge, that the mayor be authorized to sign the pledge, and that the signed pledge be forwarded to the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Thank you. Thank you, Christine. Uh, we do, do have a speaker's list. Uh, we'll go to Councillor Kretsch first. Councillor? Thanks, and thanks for your presentation. And um, I read the materials that were attached to this, and I'd like to read from the materials attached to this, and I have a question for you. Let's see if I can find, the, find them fast enough. <coughs> short, sure, I'll keep talking until I find it. Um, oh, here it is. I highlighted it and everything. I was very prepared, and then now look at me here. Um, for the word requirement, so I'll just search for it. There we go. So, on the letter from Minister Clark to the City of Hamilton, it says two conflicting things. It says, as far as I understand it, and this clarity might 
This is where I'm going to be looking for clarity. It says, to achieve the goal of building 1.5 million homes, large and fast growing municipalities, including yours, are being assigned a municipal housing target. Okay. Later in the paragraph, it says, our government requires a commitment from our municipal partners to do their part in providing housing for future population growth. Hmm. But then later, later it says, I request that you do this. So I looked at the law and searched hard and looked at the internet and searched harder and didn't see anywhere that there was a requirement in law for us to sign on to a municipal housing pledge. Is there, is there a requirement in law for us to be signing on to a municipal housing pledge? Through the chair to the councillor, to my knowledge, no. Um, if there's a, a, um, a legal opinion on that, I'm not sure if legal has considered that. Um, Patrick McDonald, Legal Services. So um, it's not something I can give an opinion on, but I can say factually that there is no mention of housing targets within Bill 23. Great, so why are we doing this? My question. That's a rhetorical question. So <laughs> I, I think that's a question that we as a, as a committee need to answer. Fair enough. I have the same question. Well, it's a recommendation mm -hmm. before us. That's why I'm asking, I guess. So I'm, I'm saying maybe you could speak to perhaps um, the work you've done with other municipalities around this and speak to um, what's bringing, like, I mean, why this is coming forward now, I suppose. Like, in knowing that it's not a requirement, why we're, why we're kind of going ahead with it. I'll rephrase. And knowing it's not a requirement, um, why we're responding to a request from the minister? Yeah. So, oh. so through the chair, it, it's a fair question. I would, and I agree with what Patrick said in terms of we haven't sort of seen sort of a statutory requirement to do so, nor do we, nor is there any indication that there's sort of a statutory implication of doing so. Um, and I guess ultimately it's for a committee to decide. Um, I think in terms of the report that you have in front of you. Um, it is, a, it, it is a pledge to do what I think would be considered very good planning. Um, I think that we have already as a city indicated that it's our intent to um, build the housing we need as a city. So I don't think it is stepping outside of what the city has already been intending to do in terms of accommodating growth and doing good planning and focusing our growth through intensification, all of those good things. Um, what we don't know is whether or not any sort of housing pledge will be tied to any other future decisions of government. We, we, we simply don't know. Um, is, it, is it tied to future infrastructure investment priorities of the province? We don't know. Um, at this point in time, as, as, as was noted, there's not, a, there's not a statutory requirement to do so. Um, this is uh, it, it, it's a somewhat unusual thing. I don't think in my time in, in planning I've, I've, I've seen sort of this notion of a pledge. Um, but that, that's the best answer I can give in terms of, of, of why it's in front of you. I don't think there's, in fact, I, I know there's nothing in the, in the pledge in front of you that sort of is um, offside with some of the good planning work that we've been doing. In fact, it's actually not a bad opportunity to draw attention to the good planning work that we're doing in the city and the, uh, and, and the plans for growth that we do have. Sure, and so we could just have a communication item that says, look at us, we're doing our job. Um, I guess my, my reticence or concern about all this is just that, uh, you know, this is not a legal thing. It's just somebody saying, well, I'd like you to do this thing for us um, so that I can use it as a political talking point, I guess. And it, it's, that seems to be our job. Like, great that you'd like to have this piece of paper from us, um, but we are already assured under the laws of the province that we have to do certain things. We're controlled by the province in terms of the acts that they put in legislation they put in force, including Bill 23. And so I just think this is a lot of political theater and don't think we should do it. Um, that's where I stand on the subject and think that I appreciate the work you've done. I have nothing against the pledge. Like what you've said there seems like, well, again, all pretty much like, yeah, it's very much breakfast cereal, very easy stuff, right? Like, you know, no big deal. But um, I don't like the idea. I think it's coercive. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Wang? Ditto to what Councillor Crutch was asking. So. I just wanted to understand why we, what was the legal ramifications of us not signing this pledge considering we're already essentially hand tied to doing it anyway. So I'm not sure why we need to be signing this pledge. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, anybody else on the speakers list? If not, yep. I'm going to add myself. Uh, I'm on the list. Okay, thank you. Is that Councillor McMeekin? It is. Voice from God. All right. 
Um, I think it's gimmicky. Um, I, it could be one of a couple of things. It could be uh, a way of uh, the provincial government saying um, uh, by spinning it, uh, see, the municipalities are agreeing with us. They, 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 uh, they appreciate the fact that, uh, that we're setting these uh, ambitious targets. In fact, they're, they're so keen about it, they're even prepared to sign a pledge. Um, the other side of the coin could be the opposite of that. It could be uh, if for whatever reason or combination of reasons, uh, collectively across the province of uh, Ontario, these uh, uh, allegedly ambitious targets uh, uh, aren't met. It's uh, it's all the municipalities' fault because they broke their pledge. Mm -hmm. I I think we have an obligation to uh, to be responsible in terms of declaring what it is we're trying to do, um, uh, noting uh, specifically the significant milestones, touchstones that indicate uh, we're doing that well, uh, reinforcing the fact that. Uh, that good city building is about good planning. It's not about our arbitrary notions inflicted uh, uh, one level of government on another. Um, and it's in that context uh, fundamentally uh, uh, inappropriate to, uh, I think, even 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 consider this. Uh, I I don't know how how you you buy into it and and, uh, and in any celebratory kind of way. Uh, or maybe I'm wrong, uh, what creative uh, things we can do to highlight uh, what responsible planning, uh, all the responsible planning that's going on. I think the fact that the target was uh, X number of units and we're just in terms of what's been approved already at or about 60% of that uh, speaks volumes. And uh, I'm I'm reluctant to sign on to a, to a pledge. It's uh, it's a flaky kind of thing to do on the fact uh, on the backs of a government that I think is beginning to understand that some of the things that they're doing just fundamentally don't make sense. And they're trying as hard as they can to uh, force feed a uh, belief that they do make sense. And I, I don't want to be part of it. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Alex Wilson. Apologies, uh, my question was asked and I removed my name from speakers. Sorry, Councillor, we're having trouble hearing you. Sorry, my question was asked and I removed my name from the speakers list. Oh, okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Kassar. Thank you, Chair. Uh, just listening to the dialogue and what Cameron Kretsch, Councillor Kretsch, excuse me, sorry. Um, suggested. Uh, it's got me thinking. And I'm looking through the report, uh, page two, paragraph one, two, three, four, five. If I can just read it out briefly. Within the, and it was mentioned in the presentation. Within the existing built up area, there are substantial opportunities for intensification. It is expected that Hamilton's 2031 municipal housing target will be achieved through intensification, redevelopment, and greenfield development based on the pre OPA 167 urban boundary. So the way I interpret that is our urban boundary, as we were calling it a couple weeks ago, versus the one that's been imposed on us. So is that a correct interpretation? Uh, through yes. Mr. Right. Chairman, I just want to point out, yes, and we incorporated that into the first paragraph of the pledge and the appendix, right. saying that the 47,000 units can be accommodated through intensification, through intensification. We wanted to be very explicit that this was not to be used to um, as a basis for right. growth in the urban boundary areas or intensification of sites that are exceeding what we sort of the city's vision is as articulated in the official plan. That the council's growth management vision can be, will, is sufficient to achieve those 47,000 units without over intensification or without expanding into those des OPA 167 greenfield areas. It's that pre, it's the old urban boundary. Right and the planning framework that was put in place in that under the previous policy regime. Thank you. Right. Th uh, through the chair, thanks for clarifying that. I was trying to bring up the pledge, but the slow connectivity today didn't allow me to do that. So thank you. So uh, I guess one option here is it's an opportunity to make another statement 
Uh, saying exactly what Chief Planner Robichaud just said is, of course, we want to provide housing. Yes, we are going to provide housing to the targets that are required, and we're going to do it the way that we had planned to do it prior to Bill 23. So um, I think that's food for thought. I'm kind of torn. I, I, I'm certainly open to the idea here, as has been suggested, that um, we take a stance, and it's another opportunity to take a stance. But if we do decide to to make the pledge, I think that opening statement, as Chief Planner Robichaud said, is there and is a strong statement. So I'm gonna reflect on that. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, so if there's no further first time speakers, I'm gonna put myself on the speakers list. Um, Councillor Wang, take the chair. So just so committee is, is aware, there are two alternatives in the staff report. Alternative one, that we not endorse the pledge. And number two, that we implement uh, some changes uh, to the pledge. So just so committee is aware, those, those are options. Um, nothing is on the table yet. However, I guess my, my first question is that the number that the province has assigned as 47,000 new units, what is that based on? How did the province arrive at that specific number? And Christine, I apologize, I don't expect you to actually answer that question, but. <laughs> we probably can. Okay. Um, uh, I, I believe, and, and, and Steve will correct me if I'm wrong, but it was done through uh, the background work to defining what the 1.5 million houses would, would play out and then assigning it based on um, the, the, basically the progress in terms of the growth in the past 10, 10 12 years um, by the consultant that worked with the province. Okay. Is that correct? And how did the province arrive at the number of 1.5 million houses in 10 years as their specific goal? There is a specific methodology um, using um, data and StatsCan census and um, uh, household formation rates, a specific demographic analysis, but I can, I don't have, a, okay. can't speak to the specific details. It is, a, through you, Mr. Chairman, it is a combination of forecasting plus it, we're looking in the rearview mirror and saying that we, there was an underproduction of housing, and that is what led to some of the housing affordability issues. So the combination of those two is what, result, is what results in the 1.5 million, which is above and beyond what municipalities had been planning for in Ontario based on the growth plan forecasts and their approved official plans. So it's, it uses a rest of Canada housing per, uh, formation rate that excludes Ontario and British Columbia from the calculation. So it's predicated essentially on the Prairie provinces and the Atlantic provinces in determining what the household formation rate should be and applying that average to Ontario, which then results in the 1.5 million households that should have been created going back in time to approximately 2011 and looking at what that gap analysis is. The professional land economists and demographers who normally do the forecasting work take exception to the smart pro Prosperity Institute's methodology because it's not supported by traditional growth planning and forecasting methodology. It's a rather different approach and is very simplistic in saying the reason why your kids are still living in your basement is because they can't afford a home and trying to figure out how many kids are living in the basements because they can't afford homes and adding that to the forecast number essentially is what it boils down to. Thank you. Thank you. So we've excluded in this in this goal 1.5 million houses, 47,000 units. We're excluding, or they, the province, has excluded Ontario and BC from their metrics. Uh, through for the method for calculating for the method what the for household calculus. formation rate should be. Um, but in terms of speaking with the professional land economists, uh, the, the Atlantic provinces have a very unique demographic profile, as well as the prairie provinces and an affordability issue. So the portability of what's happening in, say, Manitoba or Newfoundland to an Ontario context, and in particular a southern Ontario context, doesn't work from a demographic perspective. But that's the methodology that the Smart Prosperity Institute, it's Mike Moffat is the face to that organization, that is the methodology that was uh, they've been out talking about, and that is the methodology that the province used in developing the housing pledge across Ontario and distributing those 1.5 million households to the GTA and uh, GGH, Greater Golden Horseshoe, 
and uh, other fast-growing regions. Thank you. Thank you. And I feel like I'm beating a bit of a dead horse here, but aren't we in Ontario? <laughs> like, um, again, a rhetorical question. Uh, notwithstanding, our actual population growth projection, what we've planned for in our growth plans is 35,600 units uh, to 2031. That That is based on the provincial growth population projections that they have officially given us to plan for. Through the chair, oh, you are the chair. <laughs> That's good. Oh, are you the chair? Oh, of course, so through the, through the chair. Um, that's correct, uh, our, land, uh, our land needs assessment did take uh, the provincial uh, numbers and the background papers uh, that were prepared for that and, and, and looked at and did Hamilton specific analysis to come up with that, but using those provincial uh, numbers. Thank you, and on that, what, what is the risk of planning for growth and housing development that is beyond the population. So essentially what we're being asked to pledge here is an additional 11,400 units that by the province's own numbers, we don't need. So if we are planning and building homes, you know, to a fairly substantial number of homes beyond what the population is actually needs, is there a risk to the municipality? Through the chair to the councillor, um, for clarity, we don't have specific clarity actually on that 47,000 if, that, is a, if that, that delta is above our target or if it's part of it and then we adjust other, you know, the, our growth targets in other ways because of that. Um, or, but if it is about planning beyond our, our horizon, uh, we do want the risk because we are putting in place um, infrastructure to support growth um, and, and planning for a bigger population. And if that doesn't materialize, we've spent all this money and, and, uh, and, and wasted that money. So my understanding, sorry, General Manager Thorne. Yes, and, and, and through the chair, um, you know, where, it, where planning for growth starts to turn into financial commitment is largely through the development charges bylaw and the work being done around the master plan and development charges. That work is still tied to our official plan uh, and our official plan projections. Thank you. And, you know, again, everything is still tied to the official plan projections. However, I'm... You know, when reading this, I, I guess I'll go on to a couple comments here if I, if I have time. Uh, my initial reaction was to tell the province to pound sand because this is 100% purely a political exercise that's being asked of us. Then, then the province is going to take, wave around and say, look at all the municipalities are, have signed on. They, and basically, we're, we'd be validating uh, what are extremely destructive provincial decisions. So I am not on for that at all. I don't want to have any part of that as has been um, articulated earlier. However, I think politically for us as a municipality to not sign a pledge or to not participate also has some, some risks because again, the province will take that, they'll wave it around and say, listen, Hamilton is not committed to building affordable housing and that's why your housing costs are so much and why aren't they willing to, you know, build more for homes faster or whatever. So I guess my proposal would be that if we are going to sign on to a pledge that we specifically sign on to the pledge, which we are already regulated to do, which is the 35,600 homes by 2031, and as was articulated earlier, be specific that that is within the confines of the previous urban boundary, excluding the Greenbelt areas. Um, and that is our pledge, which we've already pledged to. And finally, this council has already essentially made that decision by saying um, officially and being endorsed by council that we don't support uh, urban boundary expansion and uh, or development in the green belt. So that would be my proposal. Um, I will leave that in the hands of the committee. I'll take the chair back. We do have uh, Councillor Alex Wilson on the speakers list. Councillor? 
Yeah, thank you. My other question was asked and answered, but uh, you prompted one, Chair Danko, when asking about some of those numbers that the Prosperity Institute had coming forward, and just a question about those kind of family family size demographic shifts or those expectations, um, just seeking confirmation that co-housing and other types of housing types that are increasingly coming online. I was just in a meeting last night with folks in Ward 13 who are trying to get a co-housing proposal up here in, Dun um, here in Ward 13 in Dundas to support seniors aging in place and living together. No types of shifts like that in terms of the new types of living arrangements would have been included in those reports through you, Chair? Uh, through the chair, um, sorry, is the question about the, that analysis in the, um, uh, sorry, the Martin Prosperities Institute analysis or in our? our uh, originally it was about the Prosperity Institute, but I'll ask both questions now. Okay, I'm not certain about the Martin Prosperity Institute, but in terms of our work, um, we in, in in the land use planning wor world, we we are looking at units, um, the number of units, as opposed to the specific um, uh, arrangements within or their their um, their t their tenure or their um, their management style management uh, systems. So while we don't. In, in the official plan, while we don't really I, identify those and tease those out, um, our housing division and our housing housing strategy work uh, would be looking at, at those types of options too in terms of the need uh, for alternative types of housing. Councilor? For the Chair, I really appreciate the answer to that question. Switching over to just some quick comments, I think. I agree with what everyone else is saying about the political nature of this, but I also think it's worth outlining just how political some of these housing types are, or how political some of these decisions are. I'm a younger person. I think co-housing is something that's been in conversation for my generation for years now in the face of this market. And we also have an aging population, and it's an aging population that's aging at a time when our healthcare system is collapsing, when one in two families in our city, when one in two people in our city requesting home care can get the home care they need. Um, these are shifts that we also have to plan for in our housing. And not only is that not being part of this planning, um, those are political considerations as well. So agree with everyone else's comments on that, but really appreciated um, kind of pulling out these nuances. And I know we're drifting a bit from the topic at hand, but I think it is is quite useful for me to understand. So thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, if there's no further speakers, um, I, I think we need to land somewhere here. So let's uh, receive Let's receive the, the presentation um, and then we'll, we'll get to the report and uh, we'll see if we can land on um, uh, an action. So move on a seconder to receive the staff presentation, moved by Councillor Tattison, second by Councillor Kassar. All in favor or opposed? And that is unanimous, thank you. There is one written submission from Lou Piriano from the Realtors Association. I need a mover and a seconder to receive. Moved by Councillor Wang, seconded by Councillor Spatafora, thank you. Councillor McMeekin on receiving the written submission. And Councillor Alex Wilson, you're able to vote. Uh, carries unanimously, thank you. Now on to the report recommendations. So there's been indication of, uh, you know, perhaps the desire of committee to reject this outright or uh, 
I would propose perhaps a, a referral back to staff to revise the pledge to reflect the city's official um, growth projections. So I, I'm in committee's hands. I don't really have a preference either way. Councillor Crutch? I'll move that we take alternative one and just reject this thing outright. Okay. So alternative seconder? No, I want to move a second motion. <laughs> Okay, do you have a, a seconder just to reject outright, Councillor Alex Wilson? Can I speak to why I want to do this? Yep. I'll be really specific. I, I hear what you're saying about going back and modifying this, but I'm very mindful of what General Manager Thorne said earlier when I asked a, when I asked a question, and I was kind of secretly hoping for the answer, so it was great that it came out. He said he's never seen a request of this nature come forward before in this manner, right, this way. We respond to this, we set a precedent, and that precedent is that we're allowing a minister to send a letter to the city of Hamilton saying, well, I just request that you do this. I'm not gonna go to the body I'm appointed to and ask them to put this in the law. I'm not gonna go through any proper procedure. I'm just gonna try and pressure you politically to respond to what I think, I feel like you should do. And then we're over here doing what? Responding to a bunch of requests to the minister for political theater because we, we think, hey, um, he's nice to sign to a pledge, nah. And I hear what, I hear what uh, Councillor McMeekin said earlier about this being used against us. The same thing that Chair Danko said. It could be used against us. Cool, then we'll also respond in the media when they try and do that. Like, we're all able to do the same things everybody else is. The province could say, oh, they didn't want to sign on the pledge. It means they're not going to do it. And then we're going to do it, and then they're going to be wrong. So like, we're still going to do the, the planning things, right? The planning things will happen. We'll do them. So my view is um, we set a very dangerous precedent by... Um, by going down this road of allowing ministers to just, re at, at their whim, request things without them being required in law. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, on our speaker's list, on the motion that's on the floor, that is alternative one, that council choose to not endorse the municipal housing pledge. Councillor McMeekin. Oh, sorry, Councillor, you're, you're mute. I apologize. Um, I, I, I'm going to support the, that motion. Um, this uh, reminds me of uh, of uh, the kind of water cooler talk that sometimes uh, passes for intelligent conversation in a minister's office, and someone says, "Well, why don't we just get uh, get them to sign a pledge or or do this?" And hey, that's a good idea. That would make us look good. Um, I, I don't buy it. It's it's uh, it's uh, it's it's, ho it's hokey dokey. Um, you know, we've made it clear that um, we're in the, the business of taking housing seriously. We've got the uh, uh, the planning expertise and uh, and the stats to show that we're doing that. I just don't want to. Uh, um, you know, it comes a time when you just got to quit playing games with this stuff, and I think this is uh, this is the time. That's that's all I'll say. I'm I'm going to vote. I'm going to vote in favor of the motion. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Wang? My concern here, Chair, is that when we choose not to endorse this, that it ends up um, biting us in the butt at this point. And so my concern there is that by not, by not um, endorsing this or just choosing alternative one without without going into alternative two, for example, is that we'll end up um, losing out on provincial funding, funding that we know we need because as we have been hearing from staff all through this process is that there's a lot of stacking funds, there's a lot of provincial funds, there's a lot of things that we're actually coming to the province for. Um, and by doing this, this may end up being a significant blow to how we look at our funding mechanisms in the future. And I know it's playing directly into political theater. I just believe that this is the exact challenge that we're dealing with today. And, and I know that we're dependent on these funds in order for us to actually engage in the actual housing plan that we've already established based on our 37,000 existing plan. So. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, on our speakers list, we have Councillor Kassar, followed by Councillor Beatty. Councillor Kassar. Thank you, Chair Danko, and really good input and, and dialogue here around the horseshoe. I, I think we need to step back and, and re restate that this council 
objected to uh, Bill 23 unanimously. Uh, we know that it is not good planning. We know that we are already committed. This council is committed to building housing. The previous council was committed to building housing and a firm urban boundary. We know that the provincial government is not providing funding for affordable housing. In fact, we were looking at that in the last couple of weeks. Uh, their funding is completely dried up and we're working on ways and how we can pick that up and continue to provide the much needed affordable housing that Hamilton requires. So I think, and we know that Hamiltonians want us to stand up to the province because the voices have been very, very loud, very strong that they oppose Bill 23. So many protests and op-eds and, and whatnot. So I, having listened to this, I'm agreeing with Councillor Kretsch and Wilson and McMeegan that we should not be playing into the hands of the province. Uh, it's just playing their game. We are committed to building housing. Uh, we take it seriously. We wanna build vibrant communities, not ones that are sprawling, that are car dependent, that are gonna cost taxpayers more. So this isn't about Hamilton not wanting to participate. This is about Hamilton wanting to actually do it properly in a sustainable way. And so I think we need to make that statement and we're not going to play along with the province in the political theater. So I will support this motion. Thank you, Chair. Councillor, Councillor Beatty. Thank you, Chair, and through you, um, I'm gonna speak slightly differently, um, that if this is political theater, then I want to be the playwright. And I think in re rejecting this altogether, it simply closes the curtains. And what I'd like to do is further to what uh, Councillor Huang is suggesting, to be able to come up with a, a Maiden Hamilton response instead of simply saying nothing or rejecting it altogether. And uh, so I'm, I'm not gonna vote in favor of, of the rejection motion. Um, and I'm very curious to see what uh, my uh, colleague, Councillor Huang, may have uh, uh, ready to uh, proceed with should this fail. Thank you. Uh, no further speakers. I'm just going to make one quick comment. Councillor Wang, if you could take the, the chair. Go ahead. Thank you. My gut reaction uh, was exactly where Councillor Kretsch and Councillor McMeekin and uh, Councillor Wilson have articulated that we should have no part of this, that this is nothing but... I'm not going to use parliamentary language, so I'll leave it at that. Thank you. <laughs> Um, back Taking to Taking the chair back. Uh, so the motion on the floor is that council not endorse the municipal housing pledge. Um, I have a question. So if we vote on this and the motion fails, then it goes back to the original recommendation. Is that correct? Or uh, another alternative okay. can be put right. on the floor. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Moved by Councillor Kretsch, seconded by Councillor Alex Wilson. All in favor or opposed? And just confirm alternative one is not voting in favor of alternative one is voting against the pledge. Just to be super clear. Uh -huh. I'm now confused, Mr. Chairman. Can can um, oh okay, sorry, to not endorse the pledge. So we're voting to not endorse the pledge. Correct. Or or endorse it. Okay. That carries six to four. So council has, or committee anyway, has voted to uh, not endorse the municipal minister's housing pledge. Thank you. Okay. Where are we on the agenda here? That does that item, I think. Okay. Item 11.2, inclusionary zoning housing needs assessment. Uh, so we have a staff presentation from Tiffany Singh and our consultants. Uh, would committee like to see the staff presentation? Yes, absolutely.
Thank you, Chair and Committee. I'm Tiffany Singh, Senior Planner, Community Initiatives. So today's presentation will build on the discussion that we had two weeks ago on January 31st, reviewing some of the draft findings from the Housing Needs Assessment, a required component from the provincial regulations towards investigating um, and implementing an inclusionary zoning um, bylaw in an effort to increase the supply of affordable housing units. <clears throat> so to start things off, I would like to remind everyone about what inclusionary zoning is. Some of this is a repeat, but just in case we have new people watching at home, I, I would like to reiterate some things. So. Um, uh, and what the regulations are in Ontario. So inclusionary zoning is a land use planning policy tool available in many jurisdictions across Canada and the United States and beyond, and it can be used to mandate developers to provide affordable housing units within market rate developments. It is essentially requiring that new market rate developments or redevelopment must include a certain percentage of affordable units. Um, it is just one tool towards increasing affordable unit supply locally, and it is based solely on private sector supplying affordable housing units without any government subsidy. Um, increasing the supply of safe, suitable, and affordable housing for all Hamiltonians is the key objective of the city's Housing and Homelessness Action Plan. Affordable housing is generally understood to mean where a unit is rented or owned and the cost of the unit and other basic needs is less than the household income. Affordable housing is a broad term and it encompasses a wide spectrum that extends from deeply affordable units for households with low incomes to more attainable housing closer to the average market rent or price for middle income households. To achieve the objective of increasing Hamilton's affordable housing across the spectrum, the city must explore all opportunities to generate affordable rental and ownership options to meet the needs of the households um, as the city continues to grow. So we often hear about IZ being used um, in other municipalities like New York and San Francisco, Vancouver, Montreal. Um, in Ontario though, the tool must be in accordance with the Planning Act and Ontario Regulations 232.18. These regulations restrict inclusionary zoning to only be permitted in protected major transit station areas or where a community planning permit system has been ordered by the minister. It can only be applied to developments consisting of 10 or more units um, and policies must be reviewed every five years uh, with a monitoring report required every two years. And most importantly, an assessment report is required that shows um, that the implementation of an inclusionary zoning bylaw or policies uh, would not significantly disrupt the supply of market rate housing. So the city of Hamilton embarked on undertaking the municipal assessment report last August in accordance with Ontario Regulation 232.18. This report evaluates the housing needs and demands as well as evaluating the potential impacts of the tool um, and what it could have on the local market and financial viability of development. In an effort to streamline this process as efficiently as possible, we contacted our municipal partners across other municipalities that are a little bit further along in their inclusionary zoning process um, and tried to learn lessons from them in the process. Um, and so it was decided that we would divide up the assessment report component into two parts um, between two different consultant teams. So we retained SHS Consulting to complete the housing needs assessment um, and Urban Metrics to complete the market feasibility study. And as per the Ontario regulations, um, a written peer review is required on the market feasibility study component. And as per our last planning committee meeting, uh, and Barry Lyons, um, Consultants Limited, has been approved to conduct that work. <coughs> so as uh, discussed last time as well, uh, the province has proposed amendments to the inclusionary zoning regulatory framework. The consultation was posted um, in October and it closed December 9th. Amendments prescribe that the approach to determining the lowest price or rent that can be required for inclusionary zoning units um, set be set at 80% of the average resale purchase price of ownership units or 80% of the average market rent uh, AMR for rental units. Uh, 
It also sets a limited set aside rate at 5% of the total number of units or 5% the total gross floor area um, of the total residential units, not including common areas. And finally, it would also establish that a maximum period of affordability be set to 25 years. So this means the um, unit itself would be held um, at an affordable rate for a maximum of 25 years. To date, the proposed changes have not been implemented, but we do expect that they will be brought forward shortly um, or soon to reflect what was posted in the ERO posting um, in uh, October to December. Um, so as such, staff have directed SHS to provide an addendum to their report reflecting the impacts of these potential regulation changes. And so that addendum uh, is found in Appendix B to the staff report. I'm just gonna go over kind of the process, uh, our general work plan here. So the this image shows, um, it illustrates the steps implementing the inclusionary zoning policy framework. So first off, we have this delineation um, of the protected major transit station areas. This is part of the major trans transit station um, areas project. And as mentioned before, PMTSAs are the only areas in the city um, in which inclusionary zoning can be applied. And this project is uh, underway and currently being done in parallel to this inclusionary zoning project. Next is the municipal assessment report requirements. So we split this work up into two pieces um, and the completion of this assessment report will pave the way for Oh, sorry, and then we have the peer review. Um, and then the completion of the municipal assessment will pave the way for the fourth square in green, um, that the development of our draft policies um, where we would like to present this material to the public and stakeholder groups for consideration and sensitivity testing and what happens to, you know, evaluating what happens to the inclusionary zoning um, feasibility if we were to see an increase in interest rates or a reduction in interest rates or if we were to provide certain incentives like reduced parking requirements or increase in height. So that kind of thing would be done um, during the consultation phase. Oh, sorry. Um, and then once we've completed all of that, uh, we would bring back um, revised uh, a municipal assessment report as well as the draft or the final zoning bylaw um, for inclusionary zoning, as well as the administrative program for how we plan on monitoring uh, these agreements. And then the last piece that can't be forgotten is just ensuring that the enabling policies through the MTSA project um, is approved by the province before the inclusionary zoning framework can actually be applied. Okay, and so now I would like to introduce you to um, our consultant team from SHS Consulting. On the call today, we have Ed Starr, Izana Biglins, and Marwa um, Alwayal. And now I'd like to pass things over to Izana, who will provide an overview of the draft housing needs assessment, as well as their addendum component, um, and all towards this inclusionary zoning project. Hey, Tiffany. As Tiffany mentioned, I'm a manager of housing policy and research with SHS Consulting, and I'll be here today to present some of our key findings from the housing needs assessment report work that we've conducted to date. Next slide, please. So as an overview of the items I'll be presenting today, first I'll provide an overview of the approach to the housing needs assessment report. Um, and then the bulk of our presentation will focus on uh, presenting and validating some of the key findings from the housing needs assessment report that we conducted to date. Then I'll present some of our recommendations for an inclusionary zoning policy for the city of Hamilton, and then we will conclude. So our approach to the housing needs assessment report. Our uh, project timeline will be conducted in three phases and we're currently in phase one moving into phase two. So phase one is the background research phase um, where we've been preparing the draft housing needs assessment report for Hamilton. Some of the items underneath this phase that we have completed to date are uh, producing an assessment of current and projected housing need and supply for the city of Hamilton. 
This report meets several of the requirements of the Planning Act OREG 23218, not including the market feasibility analysis, as Tiffany had mentioned. And uh, the housing needs assessment report includes key housing gaps that can inform a future housing strategy. It also includes a definition of housing affordability uh, for the city of Hamilton. It includes recommendations regarding updates to the city's official plans and some next steps, including how to leverage other funding and incentive programs. Phase two is the consultation phase. And in this phase, a consultation will be conducted with both internal and external stakeholders. So SHS Consulting's role in this phase will be to contribute to the creation of the consultation plan. We will also provide content for the engagement sessions. However, the sessions themselves will be organized by city staff and also will be facilitated um, primarily by city staff and an outside consultant. And we will also uh, participate in any key in-person, key stakeholder engagement sessions throughout that phase. Finally, phase three will be the production of the final report. So this involves uh, completing any addendum to the housing needs assessment report, including a draft consultation summary addendum and any other addendum to the housing needs assessment report that have been identified to be required throughout the process. So our housing needs assessment report incorporates information and data from several different sources. And on this slide here, we can see uh, some of the primary sources that we've used to conduct our work. So most of the data does come from Statistics Canada. Primarily, the community census profiles uh, were used throughout the report. In addition, Statistics Canada topic-based tabulations were also used to collect data and information to inform the report. And the third Statistics Canada source that we incorporated are several of the CANSEM tables. Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation was another of our primary sources for this work. Um, from CMHC, we use several of their reports, as well as the Housing Information Portal and the Rental Market Survey. Um, in addition, data from MLS was incorporated. Uh, information from Canadian Real Estate Association Residential Market Activity Report was also incorporated. Uh, the Home and Community Care Support Services um, informed some of our analysis. And finally, several of the City of Hamilton reports were also incorporated to conduct this analysis. Okay, so um, in this section of the presentation, I'll provide a brief overview of several of the key housing gaps that were identified throughout this work. Um, so just to provide an overview and description of the methodology that we use to identify these housing gaps, we've uh, created this infographic here. So step one to identifying the key housing gaps involves an analysis of housing demand. So to analyze housing demand, uh, we collect information on demographic trends and projections. We look specifically at household trends and projections as well. Um, we identify the economic trends that are occurring in the community, and we also look at trends in household incomes, as all of these data sources help to inform our understanding of housing demand. Following the analysis of housing demand, we conduct an analysis of housing supply. So we look at the trends in existing housing stock, including um, what the supply resembles, what the pricing is throughout the housing stock, as well as other criteria. Um, and we also uh, attempt to uh, conduct an analysis of the expected changes in future housing stock. So to conduct that work, we look at housing completions information, housing starts information, um, building permits information, um, and other information such as that. And then the third step to the process, we'll be looking at data um, associated with the housing affordability in Hamilton. So throughout this work, we did conduct some analysis to define what housing affordability is in the city of Hamilton. And we also analyzed um, information uh, with respect to household spending on shelter as a proportion of income as a metric uh, to understand housing affordability issues in Hamilton. And we also analyzed data, which comes from Statistics Canada, related to core housing need for the city of Hamilton. Once all of those three steps have been uh, completed, we are able to um, identify what the key housing gaps are based on any gaps that we've identified throughout those earlier steps. 
So for this housing needs assessment for the city of Hamilton, we did identify three main key housing gaps based on the information at our disposal. So the first key housing gap is that there's a need to continue to diversify the housing stock in Hamilton. And when we speak to diversifying the housing stock, what we mean is that particularly there is a need to include more smaller dwelling types as well as family and larger size dwelling types. And these units would help to allow seniors or individuals who are aged uh, higher than 65 years to age in appropriate homes in the community, and also to encourage couples with children and larger households to settle in Hamilton. Key housing gap number two is that there is a need to increase the stock of purpose-built rental housing in the primary rental market in Hamilton. And finally, key housing gap three is that there is a need to develop home ownership options that are affordable to households, specifically with moder moderate incomes and that are appropriate for larger household types. So over the next few slides, I'll provide some supporting uh, data and information to help um, us understand how we got to these key housing gaps. So just as a reminder, the first key housing gap was really associated with the diversification of the housing stock in Hamilton. So some of the findings that we identified related to key housing gap one in our analysis was that the majority of dwellings in Hamilton were single detached dwellings in 2021. Um, there were actually 56.2% of all dwelling types uh, in Hamilton that were single detached dwellings in 2021. However, the demographics of households in Hamilton are changing and their needs might not be met by single detached dwellings in the future. Although single detached dwellings may be ideal for some households, they may not be appropriate for others. Single detached dwellings often can be less accessible and require more maintenance than other dwelling types. And these dwellings are the most expensive dwelling type in Hamilton currently. Um, if we look at the figure to the right of this slide, we can see some of the projections of dwelling units uh, by structural type for the city of Hamilton until the year 2051. And although single detached dwellings are projected to be the prevailing dwelling type in Hamilton in 2051, the anticipated new housing supply will be denser and more diverse. So from 2021 to 2051, the growth in the supply of row and townhouses is expected to outpace all other dwelling types, increasing by 94%. This is followed by the growth in accessory dwelling units, uh, dwellings in apartments, and then finally single and semi-detached dwellings, which will increase by only 41.4%. Next one. So from 2016 to 2021, households <coughs> with primary maintainers aged 45 to 64 years in Hamilton decreased um, by a very minor amount, but still it's notable. Uh, indicating these households are likely having challenges to find affordable or suitable housing in Hamilton. In contrast, the number of households led by seniors or individuals aged 65 years or higher was the fastest growing age group. So our key housing gap number two was that there is a need to increase the stock of purpose-built rental housing in the primary rental market in Hamilton. So from 2016 to 2021, the supply of units in the, rent, in the primary rental market specifically increased by 5.5%, while the number of renters increased at a significantly faster pace of 11.5%. In addition, the number of owners only increased by 2.3% over that period. Uh, there's therefore a high demand for rental housing in Hamilton, as we can see uh, these increases to renter households being much greater than to owners. Renters in Hamilton were significantly more likely to be in core housing need compared to owners. So a household is in core housing need when their housing is unaffordable, not suitable, or not adequate, and they are not able to find a suitable and affordable alternative in the community. So as we can see from the figure to the right here, renter households in core, in core need in Hamilton in 2020 was 27.6%. While um, when we look at the owner households in Hamilton, only 5.5% were in core housing need in Hamilton in 2020. So there is quite a discrepancy there. In 2021, most newly completed dwellings were ownership dwellings, so approximately 70%, and very few were rental housing in the primary rental market specifically. So this could be um, contributing to the higher proportion of renter households who are facing housing affordability issues in Hamilton as the supply is not meeting the demand. 
And finally, key housing gap number three is that there's a need to develop ownership options that are affordable to households with moderate incomes and that are appropriate for larger household types. So since 2019, the average house price of a home in Hamilton increased by approximately 44%. From 2019 to 2022, the rate of inflation was only 12.1% in contrast. So this really illustrates how significantly house prices in Hamilton have been increasing over recent years. In 2022, even the average condominium apartment price would not be affordable to most households with moderate incomes, as we can see from the figure to the right here. Uh, while these smaller condominium apartment dwellings might be appropriate to some households, couples with children or some larger, um, other larger household types uh, might not be met by these smaller apartment uh, dwellings. Um, and they would therefore need to turn to these uh, larger dwelling types, which are more expensive. So as I mentioned previously, throughout this analysis, we also conducted um, some extensive research on all of the definitions of affordability that the city of Hamilton currently has in its different uh, reports. However, um, as Tiffany had mentioned recently, um, OREG 23218 um, had some changes being proposed to it, which would impact the definition of affordable housing for an inclusionary zoning policy. And although these changes have not been approved as of yet, we do expect them to be implemented. So according to those changes, uh, the definition of affordable housing for an inclusionary zoning policy for ownership housing is that affordability is housing, um, which is priced at the purchase price of 80% of the average resale purchase price of an owned unit or lower. And when we look at rental housing, it defines affordability as a unit for which the rent is at or below 80% of the average market rent of a unit. So on the right-hand side of the slide here, we just illustrate what that would actually translate into in dollar figures. So for the ownership housing, the maximum affordable house price, according to this definition, would be approximately $740,000 in 2022. And for rental housing, the maximum affordable monthly rent would be approximately $1,000 in 2022. And based on the analysis that we conducted in the housing uh, needs assessment, we did identify some recommendations for an inclusionary zoning policy for the city of Hamilton. So um, as the city develops an inclusionary zoning policy, it should keep some of these considerations in mind. So there is the need to explore opportunities <clears throat> to generate affordable rental and ownership options to meet the needs of households with moderate incomes. There should also be a focus on smaller households while also creating some opportunities for larger affordable units. Um, an inclusionary zoning policy should facilitate a steady flow of purpose-built rental housing units to accommodate the growing number of renters in Hamilton. There's also an opportunity for inclusionary zoning to provide rental units affordable to households with lower incomes if combined with financial incentives or rent supplements. And finally, ensuring a proportion of the affordable rental units created through an inclusionary zoning policy are suitable to individuals with support needs um, could be a key consideration as well. Thank you. Thank you, Izana. Sorry, I'm not sure if everyone can see you um, on the WebEx because I have the presentation open fully. Um, okay, so I would like to go over kind of what the next steps are for this project. Um, so the should you approve um, I guess the recommendations in front of you today which is to receive the draft HNA report as well as the addendum um, we would then like to go out for consultation um, on this draft report and provide it um, using the engage Hamilton um, platform for feedback from the general public and stakeholders um, and then staff are currently reviewing the internal feedback that we've received from the technical advisory committee um, and making amendments to the market feasibility study accordingly. 
And then we are currently underway on that peer review of the market feasibility study. We have our kickoff meeting actually later this week with uh, Urban Metrics and NBLC. And then we expect that peer review to take approximately six weeks to complete. And we hope to present the draft market feasibility study, the written peer review, the draft policy framework, and a broad consultation plan um, for April. And then following an approval of that April report, hopefully, um, we will then conduct the broad stakeholder consultation on all the project components um, and report back to planning committee in July with the kind of final municipal assessment report. So any addendums that may be required to either component of that study um, and then the policy framework. <clears throat> So in summary, uh, the HNA does not specifically examine the merits of utilizing inclusionary zoning as a land use planning tool to increase housing affordability. Instead, it confirms the need for both deeply affordable and moderately affordable rental and ownership options and for housing units of all size. Uh, the next report regarding the market feasibility component will assess the inclusionary zoning tool um, in the Hamilton market. Um, IZ is a promising tool that leverages private sector development to increase the amount of affordable housing near transit, but it is unlikely to yield enough units to address all of the city's needs. So in summary, this tool is not a silver bullet. Trade-offs and incentives may be required to increase its effectiveness. Most importantly, um, that must be stressed, uh, is that additional tools are required in order to achieve the adequate supply and range of needed affordable housing. So um, now we're happy to answer any questions that the committee may have. Thank you, Tiffany. And uh, you can take down the, the presentation so I can see everybody. We do have a, a speaker's list with questions. I'm having issues exiting out, sorry. It's a sticky mouse. <laughs> Thank you. So first on our speakers list is Councillor Wang. Thank you, through you, Chair. Thank you, Senior Planner Singh, and especially for all of your leadership on all of this and, and taking a lot of this time to actually share with us all that we, all the questions. Um, so I have a couple of questions to SHS, if that's okay, mm -hmm. Chair. Um, I saw through your research that a lot of that was secondary research. Was there any primary research that was done at all? Zana, if you're able to. Yes, hi there, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Um, no, there was not any primary research conducted. Okay, um, also through you, Chair, to SHS. Uh, when I saw slide 10, I was interested in understanding a little bit more. Um, have you, in your research, have you talked about multi-generational homes or how build how we can build new stock as it relates to how our demographics are changing? Did that factor in it any, in any way? Yes, yeah, so Statistics Canada does report information on multi-generational housing, so that is incorporated in our research. Um, it is a new data point that they've incorporated in their more recent uh, census. So um, to do a more fulsome analysis of that information, it would require a custom data order, although that analysis can be completed. It was just not completed in this version of the report, aside from what is publicly available on their website. Um, aside from any of the analysis related to the inclusionary zoning policy, we did not conduct any further research to suggest any recommendations for strategies to create other housing units. Um, a housing strategy might be a recommendation, though, that we would put forward for future work in the city of Hamilton if that was of interest. Okay, thank you for that answer. Um, through you, Chair. Uh, when I saw slide 18, I was also questioning what were some of the other ownership options? So had, in your research, had you um, explored alternative models for ownership models in other municipalities or other countries? Because I know that that is a hot topic these days. So um, in your research, is that something that you had identified at all? 
Yeah, at, that was actually out of the scope of this project. So we have not conducted anything specific to the city of Hamilton with, um, with regards to that. Okay, thank you. I have rapid fire questions. So there's, <laughs> there's a bunch of them. Oh. Um, again, through you chair, when I was looking at slide 21 and we were talking about financial viability, um, where that slide actually talked about market rates. It actually talked about 80% of um, what market rates were, but where later on you talked about the affordability, uh, sorry, then you talked about moderate income. So I think I got a little bit confused because what was the sort of standard? Are we going by 80% of market rate or are we talking about moderate income? Because in your recommendation, you talked about moderate income. So what's, where does that go? Thank you for that question as well. Yes, so initially when we uh, began this project, we were tasked with conducting a full analysis of um, any possible definition that the city of Hamilton uses to define affordable housing. Um, and throughout that analysis, the uh, we've identified several definitions that could look at income as um, the source to define affordability. However, recently with the changes uh, to OREG 232 18, which have been proposed, they've specified that uh, for an inclusionary zoning policy specifically, we would need to use this definition from slide 21 with the 80% uh, of the result price of a home as the definition for that policy specifically. Um, I believe their understanding is that that would be appropriate for a household with moderate incomes. Um, however, there is no real connection um, that we we can make at the moment uh, related to that. It's, it's simply what the regulations are proposing. So that is what we're referencing on this slide 21. Um, yeah. Okay. Thank you for that answer. Um, Chair, I'm just mindful that moderate income in the city of Hamilton is very different from the $742,000 house that is listed in slide 21. So I'm a little bit confused there as to how that metric actually applies a, in a Hamilton sense. So that might be something that I'd like to flag. Um, to Planner Singh, through you, Chair, I see that there's the next steps are public consultation and it's going to engage.hamilton.ca. As a ward counselor, I am extremely mindful that not everybody in my ward is online. So is there an opportunity to look at some sort of public engagement beyond engage because the website option is a no-go for a lot of the people that are in ward four. And I'm also mindful that inclusionary zoning ought to have public consultation with people that are going to be accessing inclusionary zoning. So, so through you. Yeah, through the chair to Councillor Huang. Can I actually just add something to the earlier discussion that Izana was um, trying to answer? So, um, figure 17 in the Appendix A, so mm -hmm. the SHS report, it actually. Um, defines each decile from decile one to decile 10. And so moderate income is, is a range. Um, and so what uh, SHS was trying to describe is the top kind of end, that decile six of the moderate income. Um, so that range of moderate income is roughly like 77,000 to 115,000. Um, but the approach that staff were taking before the Bill 23 um, massive uh, amount of ERO postings uh, was to take an income-based approach for mm -hmm. ownership, and we were using a market-based approach at 100% AMR um, for rental, and we were kind of following other planning policies that typically use 100%. Our housing services friends, they use 125. Some programs use 175 AMR. So there's quite a range. So the um, there is an appendix to the appendix and SHS's uh, report that kind of goes through that calculation um, using all the various definitions that are floating around and utilized in the corporation, but also from our funding partners um, at both the province and federal government. So there was a full exploration, but the province um, is likely going to move the way of uh, calculating what the 80% average market rate, um, and that would be both applied to ownership options and rental. Uh -huh. 
Thank um, you. And then with regards to your question about consultation, so at this time, um, we're just bringing out the HNA, the Housing Needs Assessment Report, um, and we do intend to do broad public consultation on all the pieces uh, in April. I, my perception is that majority of uh, those in the public as well as stakeholder groups are interested in the market feasibility component. I think what I SHS has presented to us um, is a confirmation of what a lot of us already kind of new and it's kind of all consolidated into a nice report and the definitions analysis is also very helpful. Um, but it's the market feasibility component that I think uh, will strike a chord with, with most groups and uh, it will make, a, I think, a lot more sense if we present all of that information together and we intend on having town halls, so in-person consultation can um, be had as well as we, we've been discussing potentially having some um, poster boards out here just outside of council chambers and then having the Engage Hamilton digital format as well. Thank you for that. And actually, through you, Chair, I'd like to offer, if there's any way that my ward office can help facilitate any of those town halls or public consultations, I'd love that opportunity. I know a lot of my ward residents are asking about this, and it, was, it also came up in campaign time too, especially because we're along the LRT corridor. So those are very important conversations to have, to be had in Ward 4 at least, and I would love that opportunity to work with you on that. My last question is, as a council through you, Chair, we're already hearing a lot of things. We have the Housing Sustainability Investment Roadmap coming forward. We now have this Housing Needs Assessment. How are they all talking to each other? And is that, how is that informing like a greater sort of housing strategy? Because I think that what we keep hearing are all these acronyms and HSIR, HNA, and I, I'm getting, I just wanna make sure that they all talk to each other. Through the chair to Councillor Huang, that is a, a great question. Um, so in the absence of an up-to-date housing strategy, we did expand the scope of work slightly for the HNA, the housing needs assessment, as required by the inclusionary zoning regulations. Um, and this um, was brought forward in advance to having the housing strategy. And at the same time that this project was moving, uh, the HSIR, the Housing Sustainability Investment Roadmap, I always get it wrong, um, project, uh, was endorsed generally by um, the previous council and they started moving forward on that. So the goal has been to engage our housing services friends um, to ensure that they can utilize this information and build upon it. So the housing needs assessment is not a housing strategy. It's identifying the gaps and the purpose is for the inclusionary zoning regulations to meet those regulations and requirements. Um, but it is useful information that can be built upon. Similarly, the market feasibility study, the, that component of this project will also be useful for our friends in economic development who are looking at um, incentive programs and how those incentive programs can maybe be um, improved in any way at all or what's working, maybe what's not. Um, so we, our hope and our dialogue internally has been to ensure efficiency with all of these consultant reports to ensure that they get built upon um, by other departments. I see Jason wants to add. Yes, and so through the chair, I'll just add to that. So both myself and Steve actually then sit on that kind of internal steering group around the roadmap. And uh, there are there are various, various pieces of the puzzle that fall within kind of the mandate of planning and economic development that this is a key one. Um, and so part of this work is figuring out kind of what slice of the problem uh, inclusionary zoning will be able to address and what's kind of the appropriate role for inclusionary zoning to play within the broader framework of all of the things that the city is doing. So through, through Steve and I participating in that group, we kind of bring this piece into that overall very big puzzle that's being worked on. Chair, I think that the key point that I'd like that I liked hearing was that all of these very expensive reports are all being taken into account as we are coming up with our housing strategy. Um, my concern is that we spend a lot of time and money on all of these reports and they don't talk to each other and they don't inform each other. So this is that was very um, I'm glad to hear that that's what's happening today. Those are all my questions. Thank you, Councillor. On our speakers list, we have Councillor Kretsch, followed by Councillor McMeekin. Councillor Kretsch. 
Thanks, and thank you very much for your presentation. My questions are about housing affordability, and I think actually from what I've heard, that's the, that's the item that I expect will get the most attention. Um, there's been a lot of conversations about the 125% model that um, the city adopted in 2016, if I recall correctly, based on the federal legislation. And I'm very concerned about a couple things. So I understand that the Ontario regulation, you know, sets, may set, right? And that's an important thing to say, may set that, that, that rate at 80% for, for um, houses, right? And then it's 80% or below for rentals. And I just wanted to flag that because I saw that both in the slide and in the report, that's at 80% or below. And so it does seem we have quite a bit of flexibility with the 80% or below. And so I'm wondering why we're not taking this opportunity as a city to kind of to signal, hey, uh, this is what we actually, we want to set as affordable housing. And even if we're at the province is saying we have to do this, my question is always gonna be about these kinds of things. Why aren't we also saying this, right? So if, if we're being forced to do one thing, I understand that, and let's be clear about what we're being forced to do. But what are our values or what do we wanna project here? 30% uh, of income is kind of the thing that we often talk about as the goal. Um, I, think, I think there's gotta be a room in all of this to talk to say that, that's like that's what we wanna do here, right? Uh, for forced to do a corner. So I guess I'm putting that to you to say like, where is that conversation happening? Because I think it's a really important conversation. It's one I hear, I think the most thing I hear, single thing I hear most about affordable housing is, is that, kind of, that kind of discussion. Through the chair to Councillor Crutch, um, that is a good point and one that kind of prompted the initial expansion of the scope of work in terms of the HNA report um, and evaluating all the various calculations there are for what affordable housing means across the corporation, but um, also with our federal and provincial partners. Um, I will say that the way that we've um, organized this is that we have the main report. The addendum is just ensuring that we review and analyze what may come down the pipe um, from the province based on their ERO posting. So if that doesn't happen for whatever reason, then we would, we would um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, rely on the initial report and analysis. Uh, staff evaluated the, the various calculations for affordable housing and it was staff's opinion that the uh, approach that SHS suggested, which was an income-based approach for affordable ownership and a rental-based approach at 100% AMR be utilized for the rental. And this is lower than the definition that I guess is, um, I'm trying to think of the correct word here, uh, that is preferred by housing services. Um, so it is following kind of the planning policy framework and that 100% is just gener generally the, the um, percentage that's utilized. So I don't have a perfect answer for your concern um, other than staff could reevaluate the definition work that's from part of that first um, Appendix A report um, and reevaluate the calculations and see, um, you know, based on public opinion through the consultation process, um, you know, if there is um, any reason to kind of sway the direction that we were going before the ERO posting. Thanks, I appreciate that. I understand that you're working in a landscape of other kinds of things that are happening. So there's these provincial numbers and there's federal numbers and there's all these different numbers that the municipalities are using. The question I guess I have is, I'm just reading it and not trying to be too um, colloquial about this. However, I read um, an article in The Spectator recently which said that, look, at $65,000 income, right? 30% of this will, you know, this at this at this kind of level of uh, income will allow someone to get, the, get a, a unit an apartment to rent at around $1,600. This is just from memory, so I'm not, it's not perfectly accurate, but it's pretty close, I think. Memory ends up being usually pretty good. So, you know, that's, if that's what we're dealing with in a reality, and again, that's what I hear every day, how do we get from, right? Because what, what, what I hear is we were at 125, and so now we're at 100, and that's great. Like, I'm, I'm, that's what I'm hearing, right? How do we get to 30? Like, how can we get there? Um, again, keeping the, in mind that the provincial has, province hasn't really said yet, you know, how, do, yeah, how do we get there? Um, 
through the chair to the counselor. Sorry, I may be misunderstanding the question. Um, so 30% of your household income, that's not what we're reviewing here. It's the 80% of what the market condition is. Um, mm -hmm. So it's a slightly different thing. That, mm -hmm. I mean, they're related, but they're different calculations. I think the question is if we wanted to set affordable at 30% of income, how would we get there? I, the, I would start talking in different languages. No, I'm trying to say, no. how, do we get, how do we get closer <laughs> to Through the chair thing, to right? the counselor. I think this is more emphasis on the need for a housing strategy uh, to determine what is the corporate approach. Um, we have a housing spectrum that is uh, obviously, as discussed earlier in the presentation, it is wide ranging. We need more housing supply in all of the categories of that housing continuum. And um, I think that a lot of the conversation is typically dedicated to how do we support the lowest income households, and we maybe don't have enough tools to support that group. Um, and so this, the calculation that we're discussing is more geared towards a moderate household income range than it is to that lowest income bracket. And so that is the discrepancy in itself, that this tool for inclusionary zoning purposes um, has not been designed in a way to meet the lowest income bracket and that it is most effective when providing affordable housing supply for the moderate income households. And this is based on the feasibility analysis and its ability to be implemented without disrupting the regular market supply. So there is a need for an exploration of other tools to target the other areas on the housing spectrum. Um, and that's what we're trying to uh, emphasize here. Um, and that is the need, a great, and I think that relates back to the need for a housing strategy. And I'm not sure if we have any colleagues um, on the call on the WebEx from housing services that could maybe elaborate on the oh, no, HSIR it's okay. or? I don't want to okay. elaborate on HSIR, I appreciate that. Okay. Um, thank you, your answer was very full and I just want to just maybe leave a comment so I don't have to go back on later, um, be brief and just say that I think I think articulating the, f this I think is completely understandable to you and perhaps um, other people, obviously the consultants <laughs> and other people who are doing this work on a regular basis I think, but I think the minute we start talking about affordability, right, I think it's important to frame frame that a little bit. And so I think that even if we're being held to this, or we're just looking at the moderate incomes from 70 to 110, 115,000, um, that when we say that word, um, and when we have the public engagement process, um, that I think will get lost if we don't also then, then contextualize what, what the exercise is really about. I know you have done some of that work. I'm just saying that like, I think there's, there's a piece of this that, that might get lost. That's just my feedback and thoughts about how we can try and say, hey, our values are this, we're being forced to do this. Um, you know, it's important, I think, for this council to state, state clearly where it's headed. Through the chair to the councillor. No, this is, it's great feedback because um, as we suss out the details of our broad consultation plan, um, this will help us shape that um, and the communications plan, really. Uh, what I will say is that um, I think that what you've said just now actually emphasizes the need for bringing the HNA and the market feasibility component out together because that's how you understand the inclusionary zoning tool in particular. Um, and then we can kind of relate it back to the HSIR project and that need for a broader strategy and investigating all other tools that are available to us um, to try and target specific groups within the housing continuum that maybe don't have enough dedicated to assisting with their housing issues in particular. Through Chair Danko, I think you said the thing I think that I'd like to leave it on um, and also echo just Councillor Wang's comments that I'd be happy to be involved in some of these public deliberations and doing things in, in Ward 2. This is a place with just a tremendous amount of rental housing. But when you say the word inclusionary zoning, right, I think the trouble and I think that it's, it's been um, landed in a very affective way for people is it's inclusionary, inclusivity, 
right? That's the problem, I think, or the cognitive dissonance that's occurring for a lot of people when they hear inclusionary zoning, but except not really inclusionary, just like sort of inclusionary for this one band of people. So I think that's the really the thing I guess I was trying to say and didn't say until you said that, which was maybe it's just about having that conversation at the front. This isn't that inclusionary in the end. <laughs> Through <know>? the <laughs> chair to the councillor, there's actually a great Twitter thread about this exact discussion about what exactly. exclusionary zoning means, <laughs> and, and it was just posted yesterday. Amazing. Um, but you're right, there is a lot of confusion just based on the name, unfortunately, of the tool. Um, but no, your comments are good um, in terms of uh, defining our consultation plan and communications plan. Thank you so much for this work. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, next on the speaker's list, we have Councillor McMeekin. Yes, thanks, uh, Chair uh, Danko. Uh, I, I don't think we're looking, uh, hopefully, uh, not looking at uh, in inclus inclusionary zoning that's exclu exclusionary. Um, you know, if a house is worth a million dollars market value, 80% um, of that is uh, is anything but inclusive when you're looking at uh, uh, serving uh, a segment of the population that's uh, upper middle class and up. Uh, when inclus inclusionary zoning was, uh, was established, <clears throat> it was uh, intended uh, essentially to uh, potentially change the formula uh, by and through which uh, uh, builders uh, who, who build uh, housing units? Politicians don't build out housing units. Builders build housing units to to uh, to build in some uh, incentives that could be used to uh, uh, assist uh, not just along transit lines, um, which is now the uh, uh, the uh, exclusive inclusive zoning zone, uh, but to be far more uh, uh, broadly available. Uh, in the context of partnering with uh, with builders, uh, particularly those with a heart who can understand uh, issues like code red and the fact that uh, you know it's worse now than it was ten years ago and getting worse yet. Um, so um, you know this whole issue of market uh, uh, not wanting to disrupt the market, uh, inclusion, inclus inclusionary zoning was intended to disrupt the market, but to do it in a way by way of changing the formula to uh, incent builders and uh, and those who want to actually address uh, uh, the uh, purpose-built rental housing in particular uh, by uh, enhancing uh, the supply. Ultimately, it's a supply and demand issue. We're, we're engaged uh, and have been engaged for a couple months now in uh, a fundamental issue of uh, what gets built and where. And uh, there's not a lot of talk about the Hamilton as home group that uh, inform us that we need 3,000 uh, low income again, rent geared to income units uh, um, as a foundational piece around uh, uh, turning around the code red uh, uh, poverty continuum in our community. So I'm, I'm for anything, if your next report uh, uh, stretches uh, the tool to maybe the point of uh, usefulness, um, that would be uh, really handy. I'm, I'm not particularly interested in, in, uh, in uh, assisting, uh, even though there are difficulties around that, uh, you know, wealthy folk uh, to, uh, to maybe get a slight decline on the housing price at the expense of of folk who uh, who may never have a, an affordable rental unit. Um, that's important, yes. I guess maybe federally that's why we have a minister of the middle class, you know, which is a kind of an interesting uh, uh, phenomenon in and of itself. So um, I'd like to see uh, some advocacy uh, broad-based on the part of the city around uh, trying to get uh, the province and to whatever extent the feds might be involved in uh, helping to develop um, and broaden the tools in the toolbox uh, to include a waiving of development charges and some taxes on uh, units that are, uh, uh, you know, deliberately built to uh, to assist those who, uh, on the 80% uh, continuum, will 
will probably never qualify for anything except uh, future homelessness um, as uh, market conditions dictate. So mar market's always important and builders, builders, uh, builders, uh, you know, they make decisions based on the market. And uh, I guess what I'm saying is if we can find a way to make the market and what they build more affordable for them, well, at the same time, building in a community benefit, that's what I want to see. And I can tell you as one who was there when this inclusive zoning uh, concept uh, uh, finally caught on, uh, that was what it was all about. It wasn't about uh, uh, lowering density levels around transit lines or just limiting inclusive zoning to transit. It was about inviting uh, builders uh, who um, understand the need in their community for uh, more wholesome and uh, more wholesome uh, uh, housing partnerships to to get engaged so I, I i hope you i hope you find a way to do that um you know i i, I don't think we just want to uh, move around the deck chairs on the titanic i think we actually want to solve some problems here so uh with that i, I you know i i want to be hopeful i'm desperate to to be hopeful and uh, i think the only way this is going to work is if we begin to change the formula and change the rules anyhow thanks for that good luck Thank you, Councillor. Um, I'm not sure if there's anything that you want to address, uh, Tiffany. Um, through the chair to Councillor McMeekin, I just wanted to emphasize that um, through the broad consultation phase, that's when we intend on doing some sensitivity testing uh, and ev evaluating kind of trade-offs and incentives. And so what I'm hearing from that dialogue uh, was more about kind of I kind of think about the old Section 37 bonusing framework that existed uh, before it was changed to community benefits um, and how that uh, operated. And I do think that there is, uh, in the planning world at least, broad acknowledgement that inclusionary zoning to be most effective kind of needs to mimic what Section 37 used to be about. And so it's those trade-offs and incentives that are needed to make it most effective. So we need to evaluate as a community what those trade-offs are that we're willing to, to make. I, I appreciate that. I would just put note that when this was uh, um, first brought in and there was a lot of reluctance to embrace it, it took some time to uh, convince people it was the right way to go. Uh, they were convinced it was the right way to go because there was a broad-based consultation about how to do it. Uh, that broad-based consultation has been uh, significantly narrowed, as you know, and uh, I guess I'm just wanting to kind of, um, in, in a hopeful way, stretch that back out so that uh, as we think about inclusive zoning, uh, we can be far more inclusive about who, who, gets, uh, who gets served by it. Anyhow, I, I appreciate your work, and, and I really do wish you all the best. And uh, like some of the other councillors, uh, you can always come out to East Flamborough and talk to my people. Um, uh, they know a lot about uh, what it's like to probably be forever renters. That's like the other the other uh, big trend switch that we've seen in the last 15, 20 years. Anyhow, thanks. Thank you, councillor. I have no further first time speakers, so I'm going to add myself uh, to the list. Go Councilor ahead. Wang. Sorry, Councillor Beattie, did you? Okay. Um, really appreciate the, the discussion today. Um, I, I really found the report by SHS Consulting very well done and very informative, and, and I really appreciated that uh, information. Um, you know, a lot of the questions about what housing we're building, what's missing, what we need, um, questions that I have in the community as well. So I, I, the information before us is, is excellent, uh, and I really appreciate having, um, you know, it helps with fact-based decision-making. I think what you're hearing from committee is a bit of a disconnect, perhaps, about what we mean by inclusionary zoning, and, and if we are specifically designing policy that obligates development 5% or whatever the number is to have this threshold of affordability, if we're gonna go out of our way to have policy that obligates that in development, it's not meeting, I think, what the community would think of when we think of affordable housing or inclusionary zoning. And I, th I think you've heard that very clearly. So a question, I guess, is 
one of the things listening to this discussion that I'm not clear on is what is the point of this policy in the context of Bill 23 and having 80% market value being affordable and DCs being waived? Why, why, would, why do we even need an inclusionary zoning policy? Because it's already being addressed by provincial policy. Um, through the other chair <laughs> um, to the councillor, um, I'm going to try my best to answer this question. Um, I will say that inclusionary zoning, and I, I'm going to sound like a broken record, is just one tool mm -hmm. in the toolbox to address affordability. And affordability is a very broad spectrum. And so to Councillor Crutch's point made earlier, I think parsing out what that spectrum looks like and having some really effective visuals to, to show what that income bracket is that matches each of those um, categories is necessary for public communication purposes. Um, and then emphasizing how this tool works, the existing limitations and not considering the ERO posting and potential changes coming down the pipe. Um, those existing limitations are what creates a tool that can really only tackle affordability issues in the moderate income bracket, which is that um, fourth to sixth decile generally. Um, and so if we want to make it a tool that is going to create units for another bracket on the spectrum, then we need to provide more incentives based on the feasibility analysis. So um, even though the market feasibility study is still being amended based on internal TAC review comments, uh, I will say that it is showing something that we have seen in other communities where inclusionary zoning is most effective, where the markets are the strongest, and where the market is the weakest, inclusionary zoning is going to need some trade-off or incentives in order to work. Thank you, I uh, really appreciate that. Um, and just, uh, I guess, like a final comment for me. Um, it, it seems like, you know, talking about the tools available, the, the fact that at 80% you're already DC exempt, so that tool for that bracket is already there from the province. So if we're gonna, you know, I, I'm kind of repeating what I said earlier. If, if we're gonna go out of our way to introduce a new tool, I think the matching affordability to market is at this point of the real estate market when we are riding a massive bubble is somewhat meaningless because for Hamilton residents, if we're gonna go out and do consultation and suggest to Hamilton residents that a $739,000 home is affordable, um, I mean, that's a home that I couldn't afford. And the same thing with, with the rents. So, you know, looking at the recommendations from SHS uh, Consulting, you know, their ownership is quite a bit different, what their recommendation was, and then, you know, the opposite with, with the rentals. But I, I, I think, you know, understanding that we're working within the provincial regulations, I think that has to be really clear in our, in our consultations. Otherwise, um, I think the feedback that we're going to get is, you know, similar to what, what you've heard today at, at committee that, well, this isn't affordable, so why are, we, why are we doing this? So with that, I'll take back the chair. If there's no further discussion. Nope, okay. So I need a mover and a seconder to receive the staff presentation, moved by Councillor Kretsch and seconded by Councillor Wang. Thank you. All in favor or opposed? Thank you, that is unanimous, 9-0. And then there are the recommendations in the report. So I do need a mover and a seconder to approve the report recommendations. Moved by Councillor Wang, seconded by Councillor Spatafora. All 
In favour or opposed? That carries nine to nothing. Thank you, it's unanimous. So moving on to motions and notices of motion. So I know there is one notice of motion on the agenda. I believe Councillor Kassar may have a notice of motion and Councillor Kretsch may have a notice of motion. Yes, sorry. Okay, I guess technically it's not wrong, but I, was going, I had suggested that it go under other business and general business. Notices a motion, like a Councillor Huang, Huang's today is staying as a notice. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know, I, I feel it would go under other business because it's coming up during the meeting. That would be my preference. And we've had similar conversations with clerks about that recently. Okay, um, so maybe I'm just gonna do a little informal here just to understand what is coming forward so we can figure out where it's gotta go. So. Councillor Kretsch, your motion is on, just, just go ahead and this will simplify if we just all. Remembering, um, <laughs> just a moment, back in time. Do you want me to read it? I have it. I also do have it. Uh, just one second. There's so many thoughts ago. Um, <laughs> so many, so many thoughts ago. Oh yeah, it's about having a staff report come back with respect to the planning committee approval and uh, consent applications. So um, I've gone back and forth with GM Thorne and we have wording for that. So that could come forward um, whenever. But it's a motion in relation to a previous thing that happened at this meeting so, today. Okay, so can I suggest that we put that on the agenda as a notice of motion, leave it as a notice, and then move it at the next planning committee meeting? Because I, I don't think it's time sensitive. and. Technically, it's not directly related to one of the items. It's policy. Well, I love a notice of motion. Yeah, it's great. Fine with me. Yep, happy to do that. Excellent. Yep. And then Councillor Casares, I believe, is related to the Committee of Adjustment. And if you wanted to move that today, you could put it on as a notice of motion and then waive the rules. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, this is a motion that became apparent to me during this meeting through dialogue offline. Uh, and it is time sensitive, so it is something I want to put forward asking staff to um, start an appeal process, and it is time sensitive. Okay, that is helpful. Thank you, committee. Um, so I'm gonna to go to Councillor Wang first to introduce her notice of motion, and I'm gonna to go to Councillor Kretsch, and then finally, Councillor Kassar. Yes, thank you. Um, my notice of motion, um, as you can see, it says the proactive bylaw team. Um, I don't think I want to read it because I want to be mindful of time. The gist of this is that I'm asking our planning and economic team, including, I do have to read it. Okay. Uh, it's moved by myself and it's actually seconded by Councillor Kassar. If you're notice. leaving as a notice of motion, yes. there's no no seconder. You I just have to, to read it out. Oh, I see. Okay. So then the next meeting I would have a seconder. That's right. Yes. Okay. Thank you. The establishment of a proactive bylaw team to work with industrial and commercial partners, whereas Section 128 of the Municipal Act 2001 authorizes the city to prohibit and regulate with respect to public nuisances, including matters that, in the opinion of council, are or could be public nuisances. Whereas certain kinds of noise are or could become public nuisances. Whereas section eight, nine, and 10 of the Municipal Act 2001 authorizes the city to pass bylaws necessary or desirable for municipal purposes, including bylaws respecting the economic, social, and environmental well being of the municipality, the health, safety, and well being of the persons. Whereas council deems it desirable to establish standards for the maintenance and occupancy of certain properties so that owners of the occupants provide minimum standards for persons who may live at, attend, or otherwise be affected by the condition of the properties. Whereas council receives numerous complaints from residents about the air and noise pollution coming from some of the industrial and commercial industries and Whereas council considers it in the public interest to enforce these bylaws, amend the bylaws and draft new bylaws. 
Therefore, be resolved that A, that licensing and bylaw services staff be directed to report back to the planning committee by quarter four, Q4 2023, in advance of the 2024 budget deliberations on the scope, budget, and resourcing for a 2024 pilot project that would review existing and potential new bylaws relating to the impacts of commercial and industrial operations in the industrial and commercial areas of Hamilton and establish a proactive bylaw team. Thank you, Councillor Wang. So that uh, will be left as a notice today and they'll be brought forward as a motion Perfect. at our following meeting. Thank you. Um, Councillor Kretsch, if you want to introduce your notice of motion. Sure, sure thing. It's one second here. Could you put it up on the screen, um, Legislative Coordinator Kelsey? I know you have a copy of it. Because that wasn't provided in advance. That way other people can read along. So I'll read it out, but it'll be up there so you could you could follow along. Um, it's a rather short motion. There's no whereas clauses at this point. It's just a notice that staff report back in Q1 of 2024 with options and considerations with respect to consolidating applications for consents for consents with applications for zoning amendments before the planning committee, where the applications are dealing with the same lands. And very, very late terms, the idea is that if we're here at the planning committee and there's a zoning amendment for the planning committee and there's some kind of correlative minor adjustment needs that could be done at the committee of adjustment that we use those things here. That's kind of a basic understanding of that. Um, and I'll be bringing forward that as a motion at the next planning committee meeting, whenever that might be. Excellent. March 21. Okay, that's fine. This isn't due to come back anyways till Q1 of 2024, so it's not urgent. So totally fine with that. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Councillor Kassar. Thank you. So if, just before you introduce this, I, I think your intention is to move this today. Correct. So in which case, uh, first we need a motion to, is it waive notice? Waive the rules to allow for the introduction of the motion. To, to waive the rules to allow for the introduction of the motion. So why don't you put that on the floor first and then we'll go to the motion. Okay. Moved by Councilor Kassar, seconded by Councilor Beatty. This is a two thirds. Sorry, just give me one second. <laughs> and uh, reason of why you need to waive the rules. Yeah, this, this is regarding an appeal which has a 20 day window to submit such appeal. And the clock started ticking February 2nd. Um, so it's very time sensitive. Okay. So there's no time to wait to the next planning committee meeting. Which is not until March, the end, 21st. March 21. Okay, thank you. And this does require two thirds majority. Councillor McMeekin, are you able to vote? or indicate? Yes, sir. Yes. Yes, you're in support. Okay, thank you. Sure. That is unanimous, thank you. Councillor Kassar, please introduce your motion and uh, just your seconder as well. Yep, uh, my seconder is Councillor Beatty. Uh, whereas staff rejected the requested variance for a reduced setback revariation variance application ANA 221864 64 Lovers Lane. And whereas on September 9th, 2021, the Committee of Adjustment approved the requested variance. Whereas neighborhood residents appealed the COA decision to the OLT who upheld the appeal denying the variance. Whereas the requested variance was submitted to the Committee of Adjustment on February 2nd, 2023 and was approved. Whereas there is a 20 day time limit to file appeal, be it resolved that staff be directed to uh, file a placeholder appeal and provide a report to the next available planning committee meeting to consider whether to proceed with the appeal. Thank you, Councillor. Um, perhaps I could just go to legal to see if there's any discussion that's required in camera. We do have in camera items, so we could do that if that's needed. Otherwise, if you're clear with, with the direction, 
Um, through the chair, I think uh, the clerk would have to confirm whether we could go in camera um, based on how the motion came forward. But I think in any event, the content of the motion contemplates a future report back in camera in any event. So um, it may be a moot point. Yes, the, the direction is simply to, uh, to hold the appeal position. Uh, through the chair, yeah, my understanding is that's correct. So uh, if this is uh, ratified by council, an appeal would be filed. Um, and a report will be brought forward um, to confirm, or sorry, rather to seek specific direction on whether to proceed with the appeal, at which right. point it could be followed or withdrawn. Okay, thank you. Is discussion, Councilor Crutch? Yeah, I'm concerned about the 20 day timeline because it's 20 days, not business days. So February 2nd was when the committee of adjustments and February 22nd would be the council meeting. Would we be getting this in by the filing deadline considering that council, uh, the day will wear on is my point. Um, I'm sure you understand my point. Um, through the chair, um, I think in terms of timing, that's something we could perhaps take offline um, and work to figure out. I'm, I mean, I think uh, in any event, we, that's the next available council meeting. So um, for the purposes of right now, I think we'll just have to, sorry, I suppose I'm not really answering the question, but um, I suppose, yeah, I, I hear you. I think perhaps we'll take that offline to consider timing. Thanks. I say that just because I feel like we're, we're continuing to put ourselves, I want to flag this for everybody, right? We're continuing to put ourselves in these weird situations. We were in one again where we had a, a committee of adjustment meeting on December the 8th and the last council meeting of the year on December the 7th last time, which actually prevented any possible appeal. We put ourselves in that situation. Mm -hmm. So I'm saying this, I guess, legislative staff and everybody else when we're scheduling committee of adjustment meetings, keeping the timing in line with those 20 days is super, super important um, because if we miss that appeal window, um, we can certainly beg the forgiveness of others and say, hey, could you let us just spin it slightly late? But they could just be like, nah, right? And that's it. So I'm very, very concerned that we keep having a scheduling thing which puts us in um, an impossible situation. Thanks. So in this instance, uh, you will have direction from committee, perhaps not council, um, but there's no instruction. So take that offline with Councilor Kassar to see what the uh, action may be. Yeah. One more small comment, sorry. Just that I noticed that we have a general issues committee budget meeting um, on the 21st. I know that we have a special council meeting following our um, tomorrow, right? And I know that the special council meetings can only be called for the issue they're for, so we can't be adding this onto that agenda, it's not allowed. I would say in the context of that discussion while the mayor's in the room, maybe a chance to have a conversation about saying, hey, can we just tack this on, this one item on as a special council meeting on, for instance, the 21st right after general issues committee? Because I would feel really like, if, because again, council can wear on. <laughs> Suddenly we don't approve this until way late in the day on the 22nd and it's not possible to file it. That would put us in, in jeopardy. So I was flagging that all at the public saying, hey, maybe that's, maybe that's a remedy here. I'll leave it to those who do remedies to do the thing. Thanks. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, so the motion is on the floor. It's been moved and seconded. All in favor or opposed? Councillor McMeekin is in favor. I can't see Councillor Francis at the moment, but Councillor Francis, if you could indicate or vote. And that carries eight to nothing, thank you. Just flipping a couple pages here, we are on to item 14. General information and other business. Um, I don't believe there is any, so I need a mover and a seconder to approve the changes to the outstanding business list. Moved by Councillor Kretsch, seconded by Councillor Kassar. Is there any discussion on the OBL? Seeing none, all in favor or opposed? Thank you, that is approved seven to nothing. And uh, clerk is just reminding me that we are at bare quorum. 
for a committee that has almost all of council on it. That's a little surprising. Councillor Francis, did you have something to? Yeah, I tried voting there. I don't know. I don't know what happened. I'm, I am here though. Okay, thank you. Are we able to add Councillor Francis's vote or do we need to re-vote? We'll add it. Are you sure? I mean, the poor guy just has appendix out. <laughs> Good thing you run on the International Space Station. I'm recovering on a beach now, it's okay. <laughs> so we're just re-voting on the uh, outstanding business, thank you. Nine nothing, thank you. Item 14.2, the general manager's update. No update, thank you, GM Thorne. We need a mover and a seconder to, oh no, there's nothing. Never mind. you had an update. Uh, private and confidential, item 15.1 is a closed session minutes. I need to move in a seconder that the closed session minutes dated January 31st, 2023 be approved and remain confidential. <laughs> Moved by Councillor Beattie, seconded by Councillor Wang. No discussion on the minutes. That is approved, nine nothing. Um, we do have three in-camera items, 15.2, 15.3, and 15.4. Does committee wish to go in camera? We don't have to. It is up to committee. There are some important direction in the, yes, okay, thank you. So I need a mover and a seconder to move it into closed session for items 15.2, 15.3, 15.4. Uh, moved by Councillor Spatafora, seconded by Councillor Beatty. Um, pursuant to section 9.3, subsections E, F, and K of the city's procedural bylaw 21-021 as amended and section 2392, subsections E, F, and K of the Ontario Municipal Act 2001 as amended, as the subject matter pertains to litigation or potential litigation, including matters before administrative tribunals affecting the municipality or local board, advice that is subject to solicitor client privilege, including communications necessary for the purpose and a position plan procedure criteria or instruction to be applied to any negotiations carried on or to be carried on on behalf of the municipality or local board. To move in camera, all in favor or opposed? That is approved, nine nothing, thank you. Members of the public, the meeting will continue following the closed session. When you see the members of the committee rejoin the meeting, the committee will wait up to five minutes upon reconvening an open session. <coughs> before proceeding with the meeting to provide members of the public and the media time to return. So we are going into closed session.
There's white noise. There. Yeah, it's like. It's like the annoying noise you play to keep babies sleeping. <laughs> Okay. We're back live. Okay. Back in open session. Uh, item 15.2, appeal to the Ontario Land Tribunal for lack of decision on Urban Hamilton official plan amendment application 22-009 and zoning bylaw amendment application ZAC 22-18 for lands located at 651 Queenston Road in Hamilton in Ward 5. Moved by Councillor Francis, uh, seconded by Councillor Wang that the direction to staff in closed session respecting report LS23001 slash PED 22184A be released to the public and be released to the public following approval by council and B that the balance of re the report aforementioned remain confidential. All in favor or opposed? Thank you, that is unanimous, nine to zero. Item 15.3, appeal to the OLT on the City of Hamilton's approval of official plan amendment OPA 102 and zoning bylaw amendment 18-114, being the updated downtown Hamilton secondary plan and implementing zoning bylaws for the lands located at 215 to 231 Main Street West, 62 and 64 Hess Street South, and 67 to 69 Queen Street South in Ward 2. Uh, mover and a seconder to approve, moved by Councillor Kretsch, seconded by Councillor Spatafora, that closed session recommendations A, B, C, and D to report LS 19037A slash PED 19198A and appendices B, C, and D here too be approved and remain confidential until made public coinc... coinc Patrick, help me out. Coincident. I had it coincided with the staff's presentation of the city's position before the Ontario Land Tribunal and B that the balance of a report aforementioned including appendices E and F remain confidential. All in favor or opposed. That is unanimous, nine to zero, thank you. Item 15.4, appeal to the Ontario Land Tribunal for refusal of zoning bylaw amendment application ZAR 18-057 for lands located at 130 Wellington Street South in Ward 2, moved by Councillor Kretsch, seconded by Councillor Beattie, that A, the closed session recommendations A, B, C, and D to report LS23, 005 and appendices A and B here too be approved and remain confidential until made public coincident with staff's presentation of the city's position before the OLT and B that the balance of report LS23005 including appendix C here too remain confidential. All in favor or opposed? That is carried nine to nothing. Thank you. Motion to adjourn, moved by Councillor Spatafora, seconded by Councillor McMeekin. All in favor or opposed? Thank you for sharing in the joys of planning committee. That is approved, nine nothing. Thanks everybody.
See you in March.